we're live. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Boston School Committee. I'm Chairperson Jerry Robinson. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, yeah. one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Because this is a remote meeting, I will ask Ms. Sullivan to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair. Dr. Alkins? Present. Mr. Cardet Hernandez? Present. Thank you. Ms. Lopera? Present. Ms. Mercer? Ms. Polanco Garcia? Present. Mr. Tran? Present. Mr. O'Neill? Present. Ms. Robinson? Present. All members are present with the exception of Ms. Mercer. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. Tonight's session is being shared live on Zoom. It will be rebroadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the school committee's webpage and on YouTube. Tonight's meeting documents are posted on the committee's webpage, Boston Public Schools front slash school committee under the January 26th meeting link. The agendas, presentations, and equity impact statements have been translated in all of the major BPS languages. Any translations that are not ready prior to the start of the meeting will be posted as soon as they are finalized. The committee is pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Cabo Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and American Sign Language. After the interpreters finish introducing themselves and providing Zoom instructions, we will activate, activate the interpretation icon, the globe, at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference. Will our Spanish interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Espanol. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, distinguished guests, school committee members. <clears throat> My name is Juan Bernal. I am the consecutive Spanish interpreter whom will be providing consecutive interpretation for Spanish speaking, Rafaela Polanco Garcia. Muy buenas noches para todos. Mi nombre es Juan Bernal. Soy uno de los intérpretes asignados para la reunión de hoy en español. Para poder acceder al icono de la interpretación, por favor busquen el globo redondo que aparece en la parte baja derecha de sus pantallas y seleccionen español como su idioma de preferencia. De igual manera, aquellas personas que se estén conectando de un iPad, de una tableta, un teléfono celular, buscan los tres puntos que aparecen en la parte superior de su pantalla, donde dice Language Interpretation, seleccionen español como su idioma de preferencia. Bienvenidos, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. The next mm -hmm. interpreter may proceed. Hello, good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school committee. Buenas noches, damas y caballeros. Mi nombre es Randolph Domínguez. Voy a ser su intérprete, uno de los intérpretes simultáneos de la noche de hoy. Voy a estar trabajando en conjunto con mi colega Luz y que pasen buenas noches y nos vemos del otro lado. Good evening. My name is Luz Barreto. We will be working uh, together. Uh, with Randolph and buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Luz Barreto y seré su intérprete de español. Así que buenas noches. Thank you. Will, will our Haitian Creole interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Haitian Creole. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergio Santillo, Haitian Creole interpreter. 
Uh, nous dit bonjour à tout le monde, bon après-midi, capitaine de séance ça et moi-même c'est Sergio et c'est moi Anadez qui a assuré l'interprétation pour l'après-midi. C'est un plaisir encore pour nous, pour nous faire et nous demandons pour suivre avec attention et puis pas hésiter. Si vous avez besoin d'entrer dans la conversation, vous pouvez cliquer dans le globe là qui est en bas écran là, vous pouvez entrer dans la conversation, poser toutes questions que vous voulez et demander toute intervention que vous avez fait. Et nous, moi-même, ma m'a peu fini, m'a commencé lié, puis m'a pas font camper à 7 heures. N'a déjà pris à 7 heures, l'a fini à 9h30. M'a tourné encore à 9h30, et puis m'a fini, m'a clôturé séance là. Nous souhaitons bonne écoute et au printemps de Nadej tout de suite. Merci beaucoup. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Madame Chair. Bonsoir tout le monde. Nom c'est Nadej. C'est un plaisir pour moi là avec nous à soin. Moi, espérer que nous va porter un service impeccable pour nous à soin. Et comme si je bande toute directive, suivez-vous. Si nous avons des questions, pas oublier, mettez-vous dans le chat là. Merci et bonne écoute. Thank you. Will our Cabo Verdiano interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Cabo Verdiano. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jose. I'm going to be with my partner, Armando, for Cabo Verde Creole Interpreter. Boa noite. Meu nome é José. No Selimico, meu companheiro Armando, para hoje noite, para reunião de comitê. Desculpa. Portanto, hoje, naquela reunião ali, para nós acessar, se nós temos a tablet, nós está carca naquele três pontinhos que nós temos lá, onde que terá nós acesso naquela parte onde que nós está escolhido, parte nós que avaliam crioulo, lá que nós está acessa para nós fazer, para nós acessa para nós língua crioulo. Onde os senhores têm a habitação para o computador, tem aquela parte do globo, não onde que nós está também seleta naquela parte do globo que terá nós acesso à língua. Obviamente, nós temos que fazer calca naquele ponto onde que está para cabo verde crioulo online. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Armando Monteiro. Uh, me and my uh, uh, friend Rose, who is going to do the Cavardian uh, Creole interpretation. Boa noite. Uh, a minha nome é Armando Monteiro. Me e meu companheiro José, no Sabem Serbo Intérprete de Crioulo Cabo Verdeano. Obrigado. Boa noite. Go ahead, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Will our Cantonese interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Cantonese. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna. I'll be your Cantonese interpreter for the meeting tonight. Like all my Anna, what I come on and gong the wa tongue for funny good. You can get the oka de kelly gum Cantonese gong the wa. So we sing gum to the jaw, what they get funny pandola. Yan yan kin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Terry. I'll be the other uh, Cantonese interpreter. 大家好，我系我哋另外一个广东话嘅翻译，咁我会同 Anna 今日同你提供广东话翻译，一阵见啦。Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will our Mandarin interpreters please introduce yourselves and give some instructions in Mandarin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening. My name is Tina Wei, and I will provide Mandarin interpretation tonight. 大家好，我是同传翻译 Tina。李伟和我会为您翻译。那么一会儿他们打开翻译的功能之后，如果你是用电脑上线的，你会看到一个地球仪。那请你点击中文频道。呃，如果您是用平板、iPad 或者是手机上线，请你点击三个点，然后选项我们的普通话翻译。一会儿见呢，祝您今天晚上过得愉快。Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Wei. I will be your Mandarin interpreter with Tina. Hey, 大家好，我是呃韦啊，我跟 Tina 今天晚上我们轮流啊，每三十分钟翻译。好，祝大家今天晚上都顺利。Okay, thank you. Thank you. Will our Vietnamese interpreters please introduce yourselves and give Zoom instructions in Vietnamese? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Yuyin. I'm Vietnamese for the meeting tonight. The Vietnamese interpreter. Uh, xin chào quý vị, uh, Duyên và Vi sẽ là thông dịch viên cung cấp liên tục thông dịch cho các anh chị. Uh, xin bấm vào quả cầu và chọn ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt. Uh, chúng tôi sẽ cung cấp thông dịch liên tục cho anh chị nha. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vi. I will be your Vietnamese interpreter for this meeting tonight. Xin chào quý vị, tôi và chị Duyên sẽ liên tục uh, cung cấp thông dịch cho quý vị. Cảm ơn quý vị nhiều. Thank you. Thank you. 
Will our American Sign Language interpreters please introduce yourselves? You're muted. Hello. Thank you. We have three ASL interpreters, myself, Sharon Mendes, you, we have Yolanta and Travis. We will be interpreting in the main room, letting you know when we have slides, we will be spotlit, but if not, we will be in the general room and folks can pin us if they need to look at the interpreter in the gallery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for assisting us this evening. Thank you to all of the BPS staff behind the scenes who also provide support for our virtual meetings to run smoothly. We will now activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to remind everyone to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Thank you to everyone who signed up for public comment. Sign up for both public comment periods closed today at 4.30 p.m. Please make sure that you are signed into Zoom under the same name you use to sign up for public comment. You can use the Zoom tools to rename yourself so that the committee staff will be able to recognize you when it comes time to call on you. Thank you all for your cooperation. I'm delighted to introduce the newest member of the Boston School Committee, Brandon Cardet Hernandez. Mr. Cardet Hernandez is currently the executive director of the Ivy Street School a residential and day school in Brookline that helps neurodiverse students transition into adulthood. He has devoted his career to advancing equity and access for young people. A lifelong educator, Carlet Hernandez has worked as a community organizer, college and career counselor, and special education teacher. Most recently, he served as the senior education advisor to former New York Mayor Bill de Blasio overseeing key initiatives, including the nation's largest expansion of early childhood education, the design and launch of a citywide restorative justice and social emotional learning program, and key elements of the mayor's signature equity and excellence agenda. Notably, he handled the COVID-19 emergency response in New York City public schools. He lives in South Boston with his husband and his four-year-old son. Welcome, Mr. Cadet Hernandez. Would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much, Madam Chair. It's nice to meet everyone. I am looking forward to the day, just like all of you, when we are in person and we can see each other uh, in the ways that we used to. I am honored to serve the school committee. I am excited to be part of this group, to listen and to learn and to figure out the best ways together that we can continue to support our students, our families, and our educators. Um, I have been doing this work my whole life, and it's excited to get to do it from this seat in partnership with all of you, um, in partnership with our families, in partnership with the educators who do the hard work every day and show up for our kids. So thank you so much for welcoming me. I'm excited to be a learner tonight, but also a learner every day moving forward. Um, and I will just uh, caveat that I, I was rushed to tonight's meeting. And so I'm gonna have to depart for just a little bit, but then I'll be back. Um, and I am excited to hear the public comment and get to hear what Bostonians are thinking and feeling right now. Thank you. I'd like to invite my fellow members to offer remarks. Just raise your hands in Zoom, I can see you. Ms. LaPera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just want to say bienvenido, um, Brendan. Really excited to have you join uh, this group uh, and really excited to be working with you, to learn from you, um, and to continue to put equity and all of our children and our communities at the forefront of this work. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Dr. Alkins. Alkins, sorry. I'll send your name uh, I just want to uh, to welcome you um, as uh, I guess I'm no longer the newbie anymore. So uh, <laughs> you've now taking that role. So uh, I, I want to welcome you with um, open arms. And, and of course, it's a it's great to be able to work alongside people who are 
uh, like-minded in the in the um, the battle for uh, equity um, within education, and um, who have such a passion for it and a and a history, and certainly your commitment to it uh, like drives deep, and it'll be something that guides this committee's work for a long time. Um, so we are excited to have you, and I'm excited to to learn from you and um, and to work with you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Uh, th uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think the uh, welcomes, uh, Señor Branda, como puede ver la que habla español. Estoy muy eh, contenta de decirle que muy bienvenido a este equipo. Mr. Branda, you're welcome. As you can tell, I'm the only person speaking Spanish here. I am pleased to offer you the welcome to this a great group right here. Me encanta que usted habla mucho de inclusión y me, me encanta a mí yo de manera particular me toca mucho la inclusión porque eso es lo que todos tenemos que procurar que en este equipo de miembros eh, ya estamos completos eh, así que bienvenido y vamos a trabajar a aprender y, y a luchar juntos por mejoras para nuestros niños y nuestras escuelas. I do appreciate I do appreciate the fact that you talk about inclusion. That is a top priority here in our team. I do welcome you. We are going to fight together. We are going to learn together, fight for our kids and fight for our schools. You're very welcome here. Thank you. Ms. Mercer. Um, hello. I'm just happy that we now have a full team and that is another adult ally that's willing to fight alongside and for students on our journey into the education and as we get older. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tran. Um, uh, welcome, Brandon, and uh, thank you for uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with us uh, in facing the, uh, the challenges ahead. Please be prepared. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Cardet Hernandez, welcome. Uh, delighted you have joined us. Uh, I, I love how Mr. Elkins immediately, uh, Dr. Elkins immediately went to, he's no longer the newbie, he's now the grizzled man. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't even know what that makes Ms. Lopera and, and uh, <laughs> Ms. Michael Garcia, but um, um, welcome aboard. I really appreciate your willingness to step up and serve and try to help us all together um, improve educational opportunities for all our students. And you know, based on your experience, you're gonna bring a lot of important voice to us. The, the beauty of this committee is we all come from different backgrounds and experiences and interests, but we learn from each other. And together we strive to help our students. So we are very respectful when it comes to early education. I turn to our chair, just as one example of all the various backgrounds that we each have to, to learn from and get her input. And particularly your emphasis, as Ms. Polenko Garcia pointed out, your emphasis on inclusion, um, our students with disabilities, the work you're doing in your day job for them will be extremely valuable voice to us to hear from. Um, I also, I am thrilled by your past work in our sister city, a couple hundred miles down Route 95, um, because you bring a deep understanding of the difference between policy, which is what this body, body works on, and implementation, which is what the superintendent and her team works on. And, and I know you worked hand, on hand, work, worked hand in hand, not only with the former mayor of New York, who you served directly, but the chancellor of the New York City Schools a uh, mutual good friend, um, uh, Mr. Richard Cardenza, uh, who sends his uh, uh, best wishes and happiness that you were selected for the role. Um, and I know you work closely with him. So I love the fact that you also bring that experience and understand you know, governance and, and um, implementation and how we can work together to help our students. So uh, welcome and look forward to working with you. Great. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. As we said earlier, Mr. Carter Hernandez joins Dr. Stephen Alkins, who was appointed to the committee by Mayor Wu earlier this month. We look forward to working with you both in support of our students and families. So again, welcome. We'll now move on to the approval of minutes. At this time, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the January 12, 2022 school committee as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? 
second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cardet Hernandez? I'll abstain. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Mr. O'Neill, you're muted. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. I apologize, yes. Thank you. Thank Ms. You. Robinson? Yes. Thank you. The minutes are approved with six yeas and one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. We'll now move on to the superintendent's report. I will present to you our superintendent, Dr. Brenda Caselius. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I move on to the updates in the portion of my report, I'd like to also extend another welcome to our newest school committee appointee, Mr. Cardet. Um, I'm excited to get to know you better and hopefully I'll be able to give you a call in the next couple of days to uh, get to know you even more better. Welcome to the school committee. I'm honored to serve alongside you and all of these amazing people in these boxes. Can't wait until we are actually in person again, which would be wonderful. Um, I've heard about you and your great reputation um, from a mutual friend. Uh, and they talked about your expertise in education policy, um, your tremendous um, energy and commitment to children. And I just think that you're gonna be a wonderful member of this team of committed and dedicated individuals that I have been honored to work with. Um, they have a very good reputation of being uh, wonderfully supportive of our students and our families and good listeners. And also um, I look forward to you all holding me accountable um, to the work that we all set out um, in our mission, which is to give kids what they need. So um, we'll work with their heart and their minds. And so thank you so much. I know that you've spent your career as a champion for kids. So I know that you'll extend that here too. And I extend my warmest welcome to you. Um, thank you again, Madam Chair, and thank everyone for joining us, um, both virtually here and those um, on, online. Uh, I want to uh, first talk about the past few weeks, which have been incredibly busy and uh, extremely challenging, as you know. Um, I just want to thank everyone as we together do everything possible to ensure that our kids are served well during what has been, I think, one of the most very difficult times of my career. I also, again, wanna thank our families. Um, I just try to thank them as much as I can because they have been so incredibly helpful and patient with us during this difficult time. They've sacrificed and given much during this time uh, to support their children and to be really good partners to our educators. Um, this evening, I'm going to share a few district updates but as usual, I'll begin with some district highlights. The first highlight will be not accompanied by my usual slideshow. So we are uh, able to spotlight our incredible teachers and educators on camera. And so our interpreters can be seen. And so my slideshow will begin after this section. I'm really pleased to be able to share with you that after an extended review and selection process, we've considered over 400 unique nominations. We're revealing that 12 finalists for the 2021 BPS Educator of the Year Award. The selection process involved a stakeholder committee, including representatives from Boston Public Schools, the Teachers Union, and City Hall. They reviewed 400 unique nominations across the following categories. Teachers, related service providers, our amazing nurses, paraprofessionals, and other support staff. Because the COVID-19 pandemic emergency interrupted this process in 2020, there were no 2020 winners. However, nominations of educators who remained in the same roles in 2021 were included in this year's review. Compelling nominations substantiated with evidence such as student work samples or letters of support and confidential vetting process involving evaluation and conduct history helped us reach this finalist group 
which I'm happy to report is representative of the incredible diversity of our community. Without further ado, I'm so proud to present the 2021 Educators of the Year Award to the following BPS staff. Representing the category of related service provider. I want to send congratulations to Lucinda Mills, a district social worker providing behavioral health services, and Maria Montero, Montero Roby, a guidance counselor at Brighton High School. Representing the category with our nurses, and boy, have our nurses worked so hard this year. Everybody has, but in particular, our nurses. Nurse Marta Bowsemer from Green, uh, Boston Green Academy. Nurse Idalis Enriquez of the Josiah Quincy Upper School. Representing the category of paraprofessional, congratulations to Juan Diaz of Edison K-8 and Amy, excuse me, Amy, Lucid Inesia, Inesian, I have to practice these names, Lucid Inesian of the Philbrick School. I'm sorry if I messed that up, I did practice earlier. Really, really proud of you all. And last, but certainly not least, representing the category of teacher, congratulations to Langston Peace, a history teacher at Excel Academy. Amanda Kachirian, a health teacher at the Edwards M. Kennedy School of Health Sciences. Tatanisha Curry, a K-2 first grade teacher at the Josiah Quincy Elementary School. Kimberly Kule sakaran a special education lead teacher at the Carter School. Constinos, Constant, Constantinos Petismis, Pet, Petmesius, a teacher at the Curley School. Let me say that again. Constantinisos Petmesis at the teacher at the Curley School. And Sherilyn Pincham, a history at the Boston Latin School. Your unwavering dedication and commitment to our students and school communities embodies the characteristics of Boston Public School staff member. I know that the past two years have been especially challenging, but your incredible will to persevere and bring your best to the district every day is admirable. BPS is much better for all of your service. And again, I'm just so BPS proud of you and happy to celebrate all of you. So could we please give our educators of the year a virtual round of applause? I'd like to give Eric Bird, Vice President of BTU, an opportunity to say a few words. Uh, good evening. On behalf of the BTU, myself, uh, BTU President Jessica Tang, I just want to say congratulations to all of you. I have known many, many of you as teachers, as counselors, in one case as the mother of a student in my class and a colleague, and it just, it really brings great pride and joy to, to me to be able to honor all of you for the work you do on behalf of our students. And I think Boston's educators have always been dedicated to our students, but the past two years have shined additional light on the love and devotion that you have for our students and families. And congratulations and thank you so much, all of you, for your hard work and your unwavering commitment to the Boston Public Schools and to your students. Thanks and congratulations. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for your leadership at the BTU and for your partnership and congratulations to this year's Educators of the Year. I'll now begin my slideshow with a final acknowledgement of our Educators of the Year. It's also with great pleasure and pride that we'd like to announce that Dayanara Mendez Santana, a senior at the Jeremiah E. Burke High School in Dorchester has been selected as a Posse Scholar 
and will be attending Center College in the fall of, on a full ride scholarship. Dayanara was selected from over 1,100 high school student leaders. She is one of 10 students to win a full tuition, four-year scholarship to Center College, worth over $200,000. We know how expensive college is right now. I have two in college myself, and this is an incredible opportunity for her and her family. Dayanara is a very active and energetic student who loves sports, math, and science, and considers her faith to be a big part of her life. In addition to being an exemplary student, she works part-time at a pharmacy after school, and she's interested in pursuing a career in medicine. Congratulations to you, Dayanara. You are an example of the bright and brilliant students produced by Boston Public Schools. You make us proud at Center College. I cannot wait to hear about your college experience. The Burke High School also produced a large number of finalists for the Posse Scholarship. I would also like to recognize Ann Doe, a Posse Scholarship finalist and a scholarship semifinalist, Esmarden Sanchez, Connor Lashley, and Kayla Duke Toll. This recognition as finalists is quite an accomplishment. I hope you are as proud as yourselves as I am of you, and I know your families must be too. I too look forward to hearing from you about your college choices, scholarship opportunities, and your plans for the future. I'd also like to acknowledge Burke High School Head of School, Amakar Silva, and Burke Seniors Academy Team Leader, Dr. Petra, for cultivating our students' drive and educational success. I'm very proud of the both of you as well. I will now move on to district updates. Last school committee, uh, we had several testifiers regarding about the Shaw Elementary School. And I know that there are several here tonight as well to speak in support of their school community. My team had a meeting scheduled with the Shaw prior to their testimony that occurred just after the meeting. I also met with the school site council to listen to their schools, uh, their concerns. I shared with them and I was not aware of why they had come to the school committee um, but I was able to um, speak with them uh, formally in last night. They informed me that their enrollment had declined in the third grade and they would be losing one third grade class. Currently, they have two second grade classrooms that have 11 kids each. And next year's third grade would have 22, which is within the class size limits. Historically, we have adjusted classrooms based on enrollment. However, the past several years, Boston Public Schools has had the opportunity to hold schools harmless and provide some soft landings when times typically are pretty challenging when you have to cut classrooms due to enrollment decline. And then the school community also informed me that when they reopened, they were promised to extend their grades to K-5. Another site council member said that Mildred Avenue, which they fed to um, and was a pathway to, was not supposed to expand from four to eight to K08, which it is now, and that Ellison EEC and the Taylor K3 were to be their feeders. Because of the pandemic and because we have had to pause much of Bill PPS planning, this information was new to me and I'm glad that they were able to share it with me. I was unaware of such promises and I will follow up with the team and the school community to sort out the next steps for the Shaw School. As you know, the budget is not final until we have school committee approval and the city sign off. We're very early in the budget process and schools have been given their preliminary budgets and are going through the budget collaboration process right now. The Shaw was scheduled for their budget review just today and that begins their process. The overall budget has also not yet been presented to the school committee, which starts February 2nd, and a series of hearings will follow for schools to weigh in and for the school committee to hear from the public and also our school communities and then make any recommendations. I appreciate the Shaw family's love for their school community and their advocacy. I hope they will be patient with us as we work through the budgeting process and we weigh all 125 schools equi equitably against the dollars that we've been allocated by the city. That way then we're able to ensure that we treat all schools fairly and equitably during this budget process. I have promised the school community that I would stay engaged with them and their school leader. 
I also noticed that there are some testifiers from the Manning School today. I know that they are concerned about our new exam school's admissions policy, in particular for their students with disabilities. I'm in receipt of their concerns, and I've continued to, as we've continued to implement our new policy, I want to assure our families that we are continuing to look at equity and that we are committed to a full evaluation after this first implementation. I want to thank them for continuing to advocate for their children and for um, a more equitable exam school policy. I want to turn to now giving some um, updates on our uh, first few weeks of the year, which presented a great challenge as the Omicron variant took hold in our city and our neighborhoods. Boston citywide positivity rate hit about 33% at its height, and our BPS community logged growing absences amongst teachers, staff, and students. The Boston Public Schools community does what it has always done, which is to rally the support of the entire team and then to get the work done. I'm happy to report that while we still have students and staff who are battling COVID-19, the COVID-19 numbers are beginning to trend in the right direction. Boston Public Health Commission is still reporting a decline in COVID-19 cases and test positivity rates. And we have been able to resume our athletic activities, singing and the use of wind instruments. This week, we reported 886 COVID cases to DESE, which is approximately half the number of cases that were reported two weeks ago. As COVID cases go down, we are also seeing an increase in student and staff attendance. Numbers continue to move in the right direction. As long as they do, we are, hope, we are hopeful that we are going to continue to progress and remove additional sur sur surge mitigations we have um, put in place in order to keep everyone safe. As previously mentioned, the city of Boston has recently enacted a new COVID-19 vaccine requirement on January 15th. The mayor's team announced this past weekend that they were delaying the full implementation by one week. All city employees, including BPS staff, have to show proof of at least the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, or they could be placed on unpaid administrative leave on Monday, January 31st. We remain in negotiations with our union partners regarding the vaccine policy, and we will notify the community should there be any changes. We've done a lot of work to support our employees coming into compliance. Last year, once vaccines became available, we lifted up a vaccine clinic for our BPS employees, vaccinating thousands in just a few weeks. Since then, we've hosted over 80 vaccine clinics at our schools for both staff, students, and their families. We've also hosted dozens of vaccine clinics at our bus yards and recently added more vaccine clinics at some of our administrative buildings. Our central office team has been meeting with school leadership at schools where we anticipate impacts on staffing. They've been developing targeted, collaborative plans to cover any potential staff shortages in schools. And we have been in steady communications with our school leaders. We will continue to deploy substitute teachers, temporary staff and central office team members to cover any staffing shortages in schools. We know that this has the potential to cause difficulty and we are working around the clock to identify solutions. I'm grateful for our central, central office colleagues who have stepped up and supported our school-based teams. With over 11,600 employees, I am thankful to the 94% of our workforce who have received their vaccine. We know that this is an important step to ensuring the health and safety for our students and our staff. We're gonna to continue to work with any employee who needs more information or support in accessing a vaccine and coming into compliance with the new policy. We value our workforce and recognize that for some, there are historical reasons for hesitation and for some who have further questions, we are available to answer those questions. We're also working with our school leaders to communicate any specific updates to their families on the potential impact of staffing challenges on their students' learning teams 
or students who have IEPs. As you are probably aware, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and Elementary Secondary Education, otherwise known as DESE, announced on Tuesday, January 18th, an alternative testing option to the test and stay protocol that school districts can opt into and that Boston Public Schools has been using all year. The state will provide at-home rapid tests for distribution to students and staff who would like to receive them. This testing option would be in lieu of test and stay and would allow staff and students, regardless of their vaccination status, to receive a rapid antigen test for their use at home. This would come to them weekly. Pool and symptomatic testing would still be available through the updated program. BPS staff and students through their legal guardians would be able from the comfort of their homes to take the test and in case of a positive result, stay home and report that result to their schools. It is important to add if this policy is adopted that the state would require staff and parents to sign a new opt-in form in order to receive at-home rapid tests. The consent form that parents previously signed permitting their children to participate in pool testing, test and stay, and symptomatic testing would not count towards the at-home rapid testing option. We have been reviewing this policy closely, weighing what it would mean to shift away from pool testing in schools, seeking better to understand how the district could reliably review results from at-home testing, and strategizing how we would collect those results. We sent questions back to DESE and have engaged with district staff, school staff, SPEDPAC, BSAC, and families to hear feedback about the latest guidance. We are in daily consultation with the Boston Health Commission as we consider all of our options. We have to verify the delivery of these tests and ensure we can rely on the supply on a consistent basis before making any decisions. The safety of our students and our staff is our top priority. We'll share any updates with our entire community if there are any changes once we have gathered all of the information and finalized our approach. During my report at the last school committee, I shared our, our approach at the time to isolation guidance issued by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in late December which under some circumstances reduced the length of isolation for COVID positive people from 10 to five days. We adapted that approach for vaccinated and asymptomatic staff, but continued to follow the Boston Public Health Commission guidance that directed students to still isolate for 10 days if they tested positive. Since then, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health announced an updated guidance on January 21st regarding isolation and quarantine. I want to be clear in this update that isolation is what is expected of individuals who are a confirmed positive with COVID-19 and quarantine is for individuals who are known to have been exposed to a person who is a confirmed positive with COVID-19. We must continue to exercise good judgment to keep our entire community safe. The new CDC guidelines reduce the number of days of isolation from 10 to five, only if the exposed individual does not have symptoms and can properly and consistently wear a mask for the remaining five days. We have adopted this approach with staff, but BPHC, Boston Health Commission, added in the requirement to include a negative antigen test as a required part of coming back after five days if symptoms have stopped or are improving. If symptoms are not improving and the individual still has a fever or the individual cannot mask properly or does not achieve a negative test result, they are still required to observe the full 10 days of isolation. This is regardless of vaccine status. We are continuing to review this new guidance in conjunction with the Boston Health Commission for our students as we closely monitor city and school-based data. But as of today, BPS students must still abide by the 10-day isolation period if they test positive. The health and safety of our students and staff, again, is our top priority. 
for BPS, and we will continue to review public health guidance and provide consistent communication if there are any new changes. As a reminder, sometimes I feel like the chief recruiter of Boston Public Schools, we are hiring. We've had extreme labor shortages, especially during the surge. And so I just wanna to continue to put out there that we are hiring and that we would love for you to be part of our BPS team. So please visit our website at bostonpublicschools.org forward slash jobs for a full list of our available roles and opportunities within the district. We're always working to simplify the application process, write more approachable job descriptions, and promote openings via our social media channels. We certainly could use word of mouth too. So if you know family or friends or neighbors who would like to get a job in BPS, please, please, please have them come check out our website. And additionally, the BPS Office of Recruitment, Cultivation and Diversity programs will participate in the City of Boston Virtual Jobs Fair on Saturday, January 29th this year, well, 2022. The office will be collecting resumes and providing real-time application support to all who attend that are interested in joining BPS as a substitute or a paraprofessional or any other job that's open. A cultivated list of attendings will be shared with our school leaders following the fairs for interviews. As of this morning, the city of Boston informed us that 111 people have registered for the job fair. So please go to boston.gov or Google search city of Boston virtual job fair to sign up. I wanna um, finish my report by setting the table for the next report that you're going to hear later this evening on high school redesign. I wanna highlight a few important points that are critical to our strategy to successfully implement our new academic programs and supports that will lead to increased opportunities for student achievement and ensure every student in every high school graduates ready for career, college and life. We have significant work ahead of us, but we also have made some progress despite the pandemic. While student achievement data reveals persistent achievement gaps, we have seen some movement. And while our graduation rate is up and our dropout rate is down, the underlying data shows us that the urgency of the work ahead is urgent and that we cannot wait to take decisive action to achieve our vision of an excellent and equitable education. Given the tremendous strain that comes with mitigating a global pandemic and the immense challenges we are all coming out of with this surge, we know we have to move and to move boldly for our students to recover fully. Our students and parents wanna see us improve all our high schools and provide the support needed so every graduate is ready to achieve their dreams. Our organization and our partner organizations have produced many reports which have confirmed what we have known for a long time. Boston has not delivered on a promise of a high quality and rigorous education for all students, most especially for our black and brown students as well as for our students with disabilities and our multilingual learners. Today I'm sharing foundational work we have commenced during the past two years and also necessary changes for next year that outline our immediate next steps at system-wide level changes to continue our work and deliver on the promise and commitments we've made to our community. Evidence reminds us that we cannot achieve the goals of focusing solely on structural interventions. Some past interventions that have you know, been here in Boston with small schools, changing grade configurations or making major staffing changes have not worked because they have not been paired with an overall strategy to systemically improve teaching and learning across the secondary level. Without a doubt, structural changes and particularly major facility improvements and new builds and the grade configurations we will discuss tonight must be part of the strategy, but the central component of our work moving going forward must center on good and effective teaching and learning with a specific focus 
honor students from diverse backgrounds, multilingual students, and students with disabilities, and the instructional strategies that meet them where they're at. To achieve that goal, we will focus on increasing academic rigor, academic support, and enrichment opportunities for our students, most especially for students who we have historically not served well. This is why we spent the needed hours on developing, in collaboration with the Boston School Committee, a critical foundation for high school redesign. And that is the Mass Core Common, graduate, common Graduation Requirements, Inclusionary Practices, and Native Language Literacy. If done right, our native language literacy can lead to a seal of biliteracy on our student's diploma. One of the keys to a strong, aligned, and coherent strategy is setting the standards and expectations. I'm grateful to this school committee for passing the Mass Core Common Graduation Requirements. The lack of common graduation requirements has interfered with the work of improvement in our high schools for too many years. This was a huge foundational achievement to our work that is to follow, and I thank you greatly for it. At its core, this policy will work to ensure that all of our students have a well-rounded 21st century academic experience across all schools that prepares them for the demands of college and career. It also requires that all BP PPS students have access to a sequence of courses that would allow for admission into a state university. As a tangible example, next year, Brighton High School will offer additional STEM electives at the school, including a biotech pathway and an entrepreneurship pathway that will begin in grade nine. In the presentation tonight, we will share more details about what this work will look like for our students. Native language literacy instruction and the seal of biliteracy is another opportunity for us to set up our students for success in college and career. The seal encourages students to pursue biliteracy, honors the skills of our students to attain and serves as evidence to skills that are attractive to college and employers. As the district pursues instructional initiatives, which build on the focus of native language instruction and heritage language programs, we will develop systems that allow more students to graduate from our high schools across the city with the seal. Inclusionary practices will provide opportunities for our students with disabilities to have greater access to programming their peers have had for years. And it'll also provide less concentration of special education programming in any one school and more opportunity across the city, making schools more accessible and giving families more choice in their child's educational placement. Students also deserve access to a well rounded education that supports their social emotional well being and development as active members of their school and their home communities. This includes an expansion in the arts and athletics, adding more field trips and expeditionary learning, new and expanded before and after school programs, and civic engagement programs, including debate and student government. The final point that I wanna make is that Boston operates from a position of strength. We have talented educators and school leaders who are eager to lead transformation and create the schools we all want for our children. We have committed families who love their children and rightfully are demanding improvement from our system. We must continue to listen carefully to their voices and leverage the collective strength of their advocacy. There's also significant industry strength in our city, many of whom are poised to provide internships, research and career opportunities for our students. And, and we need to continue to engage with them and our pick partners to design and create even more opportunities for our students. We of course are thankful for the tremendous support of our city, Mayor Wu, the former mayors who have given us the 100 million for our budget, which makes all of this possible and are engaged in supportive city council. All who want to see BPS be successful. The talent and resources are already here and they are endless. Boston is ready and we are stronger together. I've said all along that this will be an all hands on deck effort. Coming out of this recovery, 
and taking on the challenges ahead will surely be worthy work. Our job of the school, at the job of the school committee is to ensure every school gets the resources and attention it needs to make it possible and for you to hold me accountable and my team accountable to executing on our work. We must meet this moment for our students and I hope you will see that the presentation tonight sets that path forward. Thank you and that's my superintendent's report. <clears throat> Thank you superintendent for the report. And again, I wanna add my congratulations to all of our educators of the year. I will now open it up to questions and discussion from the committee. I'd like to remind my colleagues about our agreed upon norm that each, each member has five minutes. That's one to two questions. And I'd like to remind BPS staff to also be brief in your responses. If you have additional questions, I'll come back and do a second round. If you have a question, please raise your hand virtually or put the request in Zoom. Does anyone have a question, comment? Ms. LaPera? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the report and for sharing the information and uh, your continued iteration on the vision for this work. Uh, I have a couple of questions related to the COVID pieces. Um, I actually know one of our um, recent updates and fairly big wins was the um, sharing out of the air quality monitors um, and just the amount of information that is being tracked and transparently available to the community. So thank you for the work on that. I was excited as a parent to go in and look to see what things look like um, across the different school communities. With that said, I do know that I've heard from various community members, um, families and caregivers about what this looks like for spaces, for communal spaces, such as auditoriums, cafeterias or gyms. And so I would like to hear um, whether that we have those in place in those spaces. Um, and if we don't, if there are plans to, to, to put those, um, especially in the areas where students are taking their masks off to, to eat. Thank you, Ms. LaPera. I wonder um, if Deputy DePina is on and can speak to where they're all located. I know we prioritized our classrooms. Um, and I'm, I just don't have uh, yes. all of the answers on all of the cafeterias and gymnasium administrative spaces. That's correct. Um, we, we don't have them in those larger spaces, um, but we can give you the specific rationale for it. But my understanding is that because of the wide range in area and space, it was too hard for the census to monitor. Um, but we can get back to you with more definitive um, 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 rationale as to why. That would be helpful. I know that that's something that's um, absolutely top of mind for community members and something that I continue to hear from people. Uh, I think the other um, is, I also know that in some schools that even do have those community, like communal cafeterias, um, many are also having their lunch in their classroom. And so it would be helpful to understand if there has been guidance given to schools around moving away from using the cafeteria spaces, because I think different schools are doing different pieces and so, um, and how that's being communicated to, to caregivers and families. Yes, early in the years, we um, plan for opening schools um, because we were uncertain about the guidance. We encourage schools to work with our food nutritional services department to spread out in their buildings as much as possible when it came to lunchtime. So some schools develop plans with our food service department to feed in classrooms, other spaces in the building, outside as needed. So there was a, a variety of different approaches that schools were taking. So um, that is in place as well. Thank you for that. Um, and I'm looking at the timer. Okay, still have time. Um, <laughs> so the other piece that I was thinking about is um, the mention around really supporting students and families that have been historically underserved. Um, and when I think about this, my mind goes particularly to English language learners, multilingual learners, as well as multilingual learners with disabilities 
One of the pieces that um, you mentioned, Superintendent, was around the increase around native language literacy. And I, I think that, that that is something that we should absolutely be thinking about. I would like to understand more about what are the staffing needs in order to bring that to fruition? And what are we doing, not only in terms of recruitment and retention, but what are the professional development pieces that we're also engaging with this? And really what's the, what, what could be a realistic timeline for bringing that to fruition at scale um, for our community with so many uh, English language learners? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Eccleston answer that question because I know that the OEL office is timing that out um, for how we would actually get there and how many years it would take. And then uh, the bilingual staff that we would need to hire to be able to do that, the world language courses, the heritage uh, courses that we would put in place. So there is a, a strategic plan for that moving forward and the OEL office is working with, with that. Part of that is uh, ESSER funded to develop some of, the, some of the coursework for that and some of the effort around that with the professional development. Um, and then some of it will be on the operational costs for sustaining and maintaining it. Um, I'm excited that we will have um, through our budget hearing, a, a special hearing on our, our English language learners and our special education learners. Um, to be able to talk about the investments that we're making in that area. Um, but I don't know, Dr. Eccleston, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you for the great question. Um, we would be happy to update the school committee on this specific topic. It's probably a lot longer conversation um, than a short Q&A, but um, it is the central part of the strategic plan uh, that under the leadership of Deputy Chief Academic Officer Farah Ajaraj that the, the team is developing. Uh, we've been working closely with the um, English Learner Task Force on this specific issue. We have three, um, three uh, academic priorities uh, that will serve our multilingual learners our multilingual learners with disabilities, our SIFE students, um, and it really focuses around implementation of native language instruction as the sort of core strategy. Uh, we're, we built out strategic um, priorities, strategic initiatives, as well as action steps. Um, and uh, the superintendent has recently approved a $10 million investment to support that work. Um, and so we'll be continuing to work with our task force, the EL task force on this, and would be super eager to come to a school committee meeting on this specific topic and roll out a really long, um, have, a, have a lengthy discussion on this specific issue because it's a it's a really important one and <clears throat> I acknowledge that it will take um, both a significant central office infrastructure uh, in order to pull this off and we're, we're uh, very committed to ensuring that that happens and it happens right. Appreciate that. I'm looking forward to digging in deeper um, in the coming weeks or months. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Alkins. Oh, I, I believe Ms. Mercer was before me. It's fine. Okay. All right. We'll go, Ms. Mercer. Hello. Thank you for your report. So my first question is: um, Is the reported number of COVID cases taken from the um, stay and test that are given inside of the school buildings? Or are they taken from the COVID reports that parents or families are reporting themselves, or both? Um, I believe, uh, Ms. Mercer, that the tests, the COVID cases that we get are ones that are reported to us or reported by the pool testing that we do. Thank you. So they, we are not capturing um, necessarily the rapid home tests. Okay. Um, so my other question is, um, are B, is BPS going to continue um, their efforts on holding vaccine clinics in schools? Are they gonna like open more or keep the same ones that already have? We're going to continue to expand vaccine opportunities for students. Okay. Um, so about the being able to test at home. So those who decide to test at home, are they obligated to send proof of negative or positive results? Um, Doc, uh, Sam, Deputy DePina, do you know the answer to that question? I know we're still getting to the bottom of the DESE policy around um, how they would operationalize giving us a, a positive or a negative result. Yeah, so um, they're, they're looking at us for a, 
getting us information how we operationalize that ourselves and even some of those um, decisions up to local school districts. But our team is in the process of doing a lot of design thinking or a lot of these logistical operational pieces. We're going to continue to shop and get feedback on those before we finalize it and see what's really possible. Thank you. And then um, on the topic of improving high schools, does that mean physically or systematically, like both, or is it just meaning systematically, meaning um, mass core and um, some other stuff? It means both, um, Ms. Mercer. So really good question. So we will be looking at the facilities of schools. Um, we'll also be looking at the academics and the staffing. And then some of the systemic things around how we support students and how they do their planning for their courses and making sure that we track those and have early warning indicators to make sure they're on track for graduation. Thank you. Along with that, um, with these new pathways in our classes, are they taking away from pre-existing classes in order to make room or is it just room that's already there that's being filled? With, with the mass core, you mean? Not with the mass core, like um, you said there, it's going to be um, you're partnering up with other schools, um, like um, you talked about Brighton High School, how they're going to have the STEM program. Oh, yeah. So is that taking away from pre-existing classes or pathways, or is it just filling in like spaces already there? Um, I'm not sure, particularly at the Brighton, um, if they have stopped any of their programs that they previously did, but these are additional programs. I think that those are school-based decisions that they would make with their school site council and with their educators, and they would decide which programs that they would do. For instance, if you're at a school and they have a, let's say they have a, a program on um, recycling and they decide they don't wanna have that anymore. Instead, they wanna have a high-tech program on um, robotics, they may, decide to make those types of different shifts and what offerings that they have. Thank you, that's all. Thank you. Dr. Alkins. Hi, thank you for the, the report. This question is uh, simply related to the attendance uh, for, for teachers. I know we've, it's been great to see uh, the reduction in absences uh, this week. Um, now with the institution of the mandate uh, by next Monday, do you have any projections on how that's going to affect the numbers of teachers moving forward? Well, it, it just depends on whether they get the vaccine or not and it come into compliance. Um, we do anticipate that many of the educators and staff members and team members who have um, chosen not to get the vaccine um, will most likely um, probably not get it now. I mean, we're still trying to encourage them and give them any information to bring them into compliance. And still every day, we still have more who do come into compliance. Um, but we do anticipate some, some disruption and we're watching those schools really closely. Um, Corey Harris, our chief of schools and um, Dr. Eccleston are both working to together closely with school leaders on vacancies. We've tiered our schools, tier one, two, and three where we're looking at schools. Um, and I don't know where we are today. I don't know if Corey or Drew want to give a quick update um, on where we are. I know that last week we had 25 schools that were in tier three category that we were looking at. And I'm not sure what we're down to now of the number of schools where we think that we're, you know, there could be some staffing uh, disruptions, like, like more than just normal. Yeah, it's definitely a moving target, um, given that more and more folks are coming into compliance each day. Uh, we have about 30 schools uh, that we're currently doing some follow up uh, conversations with to get specific on uh, who the teachers are, what subjects they teach, what grade levels they teach. Um, but it looks a lot better uh, than it did just a week ago. Uh, so we feel pretty confident that we'll be able to plug um, many of the holes until school leaders have an opportunity to um, hire uh, once the, the vacancies actually become available. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carter Hernandez. That I was just listening today, but part of listening is going to be asking a few questions. <laughs> so, so bear with me. And Superintendent, thank you so much for your presentation. I think 
Um, I, can, I speak for myself, but I, I have a feeling I can speak for the whole group when I say uh, we understand how complex the last month has been for you as a system leader and then on the most local level for every single principal across the system managing a workforce that um, has obviously experienced incredible struggle um, after multiple school years now of, of adapting and, and restructuring and and being flexible. So I can feel the exhaustion. And at the same time, like all of us, our eyes are on the prize and that is about setting up the conditions for kids to win. Um, but thank you so much for the presentation. My first question, and I'm and I'm trying to understand sort of the, the looking forward piece um, in your presentation uh, around your instructional priorities. And I'm thinking specifically about the access to, to rigorous coursework. Um, and there is what feels like I what I hear you saying, but I'm not sure if it's true. So I wanted to sort of get some clarity here and then understand your thinking is you're talking about sort of a, a, what I understand is a universal access to advanced placement courses and these sort of college readiness, this college readiness coursework. Um, I'm based on the, the sort of rollout and the implementation. When can a family uh, in Boston expect to see that? sort of access to that rigorous coursework in all of their, in any school that they go to, in any high school that they go to? That's my first question, sort of what's the, the sort of implementation there and what is success for you? Like what is the right amount of, of access, right? Like what would be, is it four, is it six, is it 10? Like what does it really look like for us and what should a family expect as a baseline for what the, the, the courses that their student could be offered if attending a, a Boston public school? And then I'll let you go there and then I can ask my second question. Great. So thank you, um, Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Um, so the first question, I think you'll be happy with the presentation to see that we've already started. Um, we started with pre-advanced placement training for many teachers um, and increasing advanced placement opportunities across the district. Um, also increasing international baccalaureate programming for, um, for our students. I would like to see more fidelity to the international baccalaureate programming. So that requires more additional professional development for our teachers. I'd like to see more um, students with the actual IB diplomas and um, you know our AP uh, capstone awardees. At, you know, I'd like to see more of them. Um, I'd also like to see more of our students earning an associate's degree before they um, get out of high school um, and have more opportunity. Success to me means, you know, students have more opportunity to take advanced uh, coursework. Um, and that's where you get the rigor. Um, that would be, you know, at least two classes before leaving high school um, is really a goal that I personally have and I think would be good and beneficial for our students. Also success is the supportive environment and cultures that we build for children in which they can thrive and where their cultures and their languages are valued. Um, and that's also a really important piece. We've been able to add family liaisons and social workers in our schools. And we're gonna be proposing adding more counseling to our schools and psychologists. And I think that, um, Though that's going to provide additional support and wraparound services to students, especially during this time of recovery. I'm going to ask one just clarifying question here too. Is there a baseline for every high school that you're anticipating? And I'm thinking specifically around AP courses. So we're looking at that now, um, and you know certainly within our um, graduation requirements. You know Massachusetts doesn't have graduation requirements, and it actually leaves it up to school districts to define their graduation requirements. And then if a district doesn't have graduation requirements or baselines, then individual schools make them up. This is the first year that Boston School Committee passed a policy for standards across all schools. So we are working now with Dr. Eccleston and the academic team to implement uh, that mass core policy with all of those baseline standards in them. I think I still have time. So my final question here is, um, 
you know, as you're thinking about, I don't, I don't love the word recovery because we're just, we're in it and the work has to continue. But as we're thinking about what's next, uh, I hear you talking about um, adding additional clinicians to schools and offering supports around mental health. I'm curious in this current moment, you know, we all saw the Surgeon General report and we understand the, the crisis that we're in. How are, what are you seeing on the ground? And are there things, you know, that we should be thinking about um, particularly as we go into budget season? Yeah, so I think that you're gonna see the budget is very reflective of what we're hearing on the ground. Um, and so I've been fortunate to have a good ear of Ms. Mercer and her fellow students, and they have been sharing with us, you know, about the things that really matter to them, um, and that is about their own mental health. Uh, that is a huge priority for them. Um, they want to have more opportunities in school. That all schools, you know, all schools should have similar um, opportunities and access. So you'll see that in the budget, particularly to athletics and co-curriculars partnerships. Um, and those opportunities. So that is, I think, what's, what's coming from the student body. Um, and certainly Ms. Mercer can um, speak also on behalf of the students. Um, and then I think our families have told me what they would like to see is before and after school care. They'd like to see dependable transportation, you know, um, and supportive environments for their students. And then teachers have said that they need help and support in the classroom with, with students who need help. So they've asked for uh, additional support with students with disabilities and students who uh, speak languages other than English to provide the right kind of support to them. So we've had a large effort um, this past fall under Dr. Eccleson's leadership and Corey Harris's leadership to get our schools into compliance around the support for our ELs. Um, and we're doing the same around special education. Thank you. I don't know if Dr. Eccleston wants to add a little bit there on the instructional side at all too. Sorry, I can never find the buttons fast enough. I will, um, if it's okay, I'll reserve my, uh, my time for the presentation tonight. We'll dork out and talk all about this stuff in a few hours. <clears throat> Thank you. Ms. Polanco Garcia. Thank you. Gracias, señora presidenta. Este, yo quiero, me llama mucho la atención cuando, gracias a, um, a, a la superintendente por su informe, y me llama mucho la atención cuando la superintendente mencionaba sobre las dos escuelas, la Taller, la Taller y la Kim. Se so cambia atención when you mention uh, matters, superintendent. You mentioned about two different schools, the Taller and the King. And thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for allowing the report. Y entonces me llama mucho la atención porque tomo en cuenta que estas dos escuelas tienen una alta, una alta población de color y ente, no sé si entendí que ya habían tomado una decisión, que estaban pensando en no eh, tener los grados eh, lo grado seis octavos. Quiero saber si entendí bien y que ella me puede decir. Um, ok, Juan. Bueno. So I just to make, I want to make sure you mentioned about these two different schools. My understanding is that you mentioned that, or it is understood that the schools had a high population of students of color. Is it my understanding that uh, it is not contemplated the addition of the school of the grades six through eight? I just want to make sure that I do that I understood correctly. Is that the case? Pero entender. Y, y, y si ella pudiera decirnos um, cómo, cómo, cómo han hecho este, este análisis, han tomado los padres en cuenta, han tomado la comunidad en cuenta, que, que en base a las visitas, a lo que ellos han eh, eh, analizado, cómo han llegado a, 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 a esto, por qué, well, el por qué y cómo. Based on the analysis and you know, the visitations, I would like to know, I'm very curious about the why and the how. Based on the analysis that has been performed, based on the parents' opinion, based on the community's opinion, uh, what is the information that we have, and how did we come to this conclusion? Is it the case that it is not contemplated that the grade six through eight will be added in these two particular schools that show a high population of students of color? So, um, with the thank you, um, Madam Polenko Garcia, for your question. I, I tell me if I'm not understanding correctly, but we are recommending two schools 
the King School and the Charter School to go from a K-8 um, configuration to a K-6 configuration, a pre-K through grade six con configuration. This is part of the Grove Hall Alliance um, uh, request and um, the Burke High School, the Grove Hall Alliance came to me, I think this was in 2019, and um, we were talking about their grade configurations and how they work together um, around the innovation status of the Burke High School and the Burke High School expanding to grade seven and eight, meaning then the schools would move to a K-6 configuration and then the sixth graders would go to Burke High School in grades seven and eight and that school would become seven through 12. In December, I received an innovation um, extension request from the um, Burke High School. And I think it, I, it was endorsed by the Grove Hall Alliance and heard from the school leaders at both the King and the Trotter in agreement with this move. And so I decided to agree on the, the move to, to this new grade configuration for the Grove Hall Alliance set of schools. Okay. Um, no. Una, una, ahí mismo una pregunta de seguimiento. Entonces, eh, 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 ella, no, ella nos dice que escuchó de los líderes escolares, pero mi pregunta, ¿se hicieron reuniones comunitarias? Ya se tomó una decisión. Eh, quiero entender esto para estar bien clar, clara de esto. You just need to understand that there was a follow-up and meeting regarding this. And as you mentioned, you have heard from the school leaders themselves. So it was it taken in consideration to involve the community or, or the parents at any point in this decision making? I just wanted to have some clarity in this regard. Yes, we we held a school equity roundtable. I think Dr. McIntyre could probably talk about it uh, more than me, and hopefully she's on the call. But they held a school equity roundtable with the community um, about this back in December, and then the uh, plan came to me. Um, and I am giving. I have not met with the school communities. I've met with the teachers. I've met with um, the principals um, about this grade configuration change. And then they had the school equity roundtable through the Burke High School. And yes, Dr. Casilius, I am on the call. And the the Burke High School has been requesting to go seven through eight for several years now, working in conjunction with the other schools in the Grove Hall area through the Grove Hall Alliance. An equity roundtable took place. I want to say a roughly maybe four weeks ago, in which community members were asked to um, share their thinking on whether or not they thought it was a great idea. They did this through the form of a written document. Those documents were then forwarded to the superintendent's office um, in support of creating a reconfiguration for the Burke High School to become a seven through 12. Now, having said that, because all Boston public secondary schools are open enrollment, parents have the ultimate authority to choose the school for their particular child that best meets their familial needs. Okay, Ms. Blanco Garcia, do you have another question? Sí, okay. Yo quiero darle seguimiento porque de verdad algo que me toca, porque nosotros eh, estamos abogando en este comité por la equidad, la justicia social del lenguaje, y también que estas familias no se vean afectadas. Y yo pienso que para, para particularmente para mí, lo que más me, 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 me cuestiona es el hecho de que las familias se le quiten esos grados. Y precisamente son, son familias que ya, ya tienen un historial con estos grados. Entonces, quitarle a ellos estos grados eh, eh, sería um, un poquito. It, it is a top priority for me. It is a top priority for me that these families are not taking away these grades. We have a, a history in this regard. It is a top priority uh, for our school committee for to advocate for it. 
equity, for justice, social justice, inclusion when it comes to language. So it is critical that families are incorporated and that privilege not be removed in this case from the families. So it is a top concern for me. I, I appreciate that. We did have the um, school leaders meet with the students and the families. They have a process. They have a transition coordinator. All families will be given priority um, for their selection and choice of school next year um, as we move to this new grade configuration. And families did receive a letter from me. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to check with Mr. Tron or Mr. O'Neill before I circle back to Ms. LaPera. No? Ms. LaPera? Oh, sorry, excuse me, Mr. O'Neill? I just wanted to strictly um, congratulate the educators and other um, employees of BPS that we honored earlier this evening with the awards that the superintendent named them all and many of them joined us. So appreciate how hard they've been working and it's wonderful that they were recognized. Other than that, my thoughts and comments have been addressed by fellow members. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Ms. LaPera? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to get a point of clarification and also emphasize um, the point of member Polanco Garcia. With the grade configuration um, that we're talking about regarding the Burke, I'm understanding that there has been a community process with the Burke. There has been a community roundtable with the Burke um, and that that community is requesting and excited about their grade expansion. I feel like I understood that part, but I think the part that may be getting missed is with the King and the Trotter schools where we're talking about a grade configuration, but a grade um, shift where current students would not continue their seventh and eighth grade there, but then would transition into a new configuration of the second areas. Have we actively engaged with the students and the families from the King and the Trotter? And are they also asking for this grade configuration where we would be eliminating the seventh and eighth, eighth to add the younger grades? I have not spoken to the families directly myself. I've, um, I, I did um, have the school leaders who said that they would be speaking with the families about this decision. Um, and so they are going to be speaking with the families about this decision. We sent a letter to them as well about this decision and the grade configuration. I know that they've had previous conversations with families about this decision um, for many years. That's what the both school leaders said that they have talked about this with their communities for a long time as part of the Grove Hall Alliance um, great configuration within that innovation plan. And um, maybe Linza can speak to previous conversations, uh, broader conversations with the community about this, but it was both school leaders who said that they had spoken with their communities for a, for a long time about this great configuration change. I think what comes as a surprise is not that there's a change, um, but that it's this year coming this year. Because we've never previously spoken about a concrete timeline. Right. Absolutely. And I will just add that through numerous conversations with um, the school leader at the King School, um, she and her entire school community want to focus on utilizing their resources to effectively engage the K through six model um, and feel as though the seventh and eighth graders have had the same gym teacher since kindergarten um, and have limited access to elective opportunities that would guide them to exploratory career pathways, uh, more rigorous opportunities to engage advanced uh, placement work or pre-AP work and really excited about the idea that they would have that opportunity. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from folks from the community. Just, I think it's really important for us to recognize that 
we can be coming up with the greatest plan in the world. <laughs> but if folks don't aren't a part of it, and if they haven't um, had those conversations, that's not necessarily how it feels for folks. And so I'm not saying that that's what's happened, um, but I want to understand what processes have been taking place at the community level levels, especially for the K through eights, where like there's been so much transition and turmoil in the past couple of years. Um, I, I want to hear from students and families on, on where they're feeling about this potential change. Thank you. So just one more, just one more note about this, and um, is that you know in in our content, in our thinking about this, in the in the programming that's available at these seventh and eighth grade classes. Um, we believed that there would be greater opportunity through this seven through 12 opportunity to transition now for these students um, than to have a point of transition later in order to get them ready for the mass core implementation, obviously the rigor and the ability to recover well with the point of transition now rather than later. That was something that we spoke to also with the school leaders about. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have another question? No. All right. Superintendent, I too just want to say thank you for the um, recognition of the Teachers of the Year. Um, I'm glad that was able to happen. And I got a note that says that there will be some extra special things coming to them over the next um, several weeks. So they should be stay tuned for, for those things that will, they will be receiving. Um, I share the concern or the questions around the shifts from the K to six, from the K to eight to the K to six. And, but um, hope that the kind of explanations that you were sharing about the experiences that um, students are having in some of the K-8s, the need for shifting and refocusing for a better entry into high school, that there will be more opportunity for parent um, engagement and understanding. So it's not just feeling like a vote to move from one school to the other, but understanding the academic and the social emotional implications that of, of how, we're, how we're trying to provide um, another type of um, stronger, positive experience for students making these transitions. Because you've often, and others have often spoken of the fact that not having enough strands for, K to, for the seventh and eighth grades in elementary schools really hurts the overall experience for the students even though parents may like the convenience of having a kid in a K to eight, if the student's preparation is suffering because they cannot have access to the kind of rigor that they even need at the seventh and eighth grade to get ready for high school, um, we've got to both explain and you know, help, help both parents and students understand what is needed and not feel like we're just making a decision based on what is the convenience of some without the total understanding an explanation to others. So that's the only thing that I would like to make sure that we are doing. Since again, this is happening or being proposed to happen sooner than what was expected um, to really make sure that everybody, you know, when we say community, that we also are making sure that community um, includes the actual parents and students that are currently involved, who will be the persons, you know, involved in this transition um, and not just the broader community surrounding the schools. Alrighty. And um, that's the only comment I have. I'll reserve the rest of my comments for when we actually get into the presentation of the um, high school redesign. I do have one other question I just re looked at here, um, which is regarding the shift in the, um, the COVID testing regime. Is this uh, a district-wide decision to go to one model versus the other, or are schools actually able to select which of the two options are best for that community? Operationally, uh, Madam Chair, we would need to implement it district-wide. So it would be really difficult to do it school by school. 
Okay. Because I know I've seen some pushback mm -hmm. um, from advocates around feeling that this may be a heavy lift for some families. And I'm not sure how, again, that's been addressed. You know, as we say, one BPS school is one BPS school. So it's often difficult when we make district wide decisions to understand the impact that it's gonna have on the individual school, so. This is why, uh, Madam Chair, we're taking our time to look at the DESE policy um, and to better understand the requirements and talking to families and talking to students and talking to SPEDPAC. And so um, I think that it's gonna take a, a, a lot of listening um, because people are not socialized around not having pool testing or not having test and stay mm -hmm. or not having mm -hmm. contact tracing. They're used to these mitigation efforts that we've had all year. And I think pulling them away too quickly, uh, particularly in a surge, um, I think is challenging for our families. Mm -hmm. But I do think we need to get to the place where we have basically three different stages that we're mitigating. One is where we're, we're in maintenance, similar to where we were in September, October, November. We made out of 60,000 individuals within our community, we were only seeing about 12 cases a day. And we were still doing all this pool testing. And it was a lot of effort that we were doing. So at some point we should think about, you know, when do you stop doing and, and or coming back a little bit on or changing your strategy like an at-home type of test? but certainly not in surge. <laughs> you know, when you're in surge, you wanna give all your effort, right? Um, so it's really coming at a time, I think it's a little cognitive dissonance for most of us, like we're just gonna send test home now rather than do our, our, our more um, mm -hmm. you know, targeted methods before. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we don't have a decision on that. Um, yeah. Is DESE requiring a particular date by which a decision will be made or is there some flexibility in that? Um, I know that they are looking for us to let them know. Uh, I don't know if Deputy DePina has the exact date because we've been negotiating back and forth with them about their policies. Um, really, we've been doing that all year because we wanted to have opt-out policies. It's also problematic to us that you have to be consented for, the, for these at-home tests um, where we have struggled to get consent just for the pool testing. And to think that, you know, the 30,000 families who have consented to pool testing now, and now we have to go through all that effort over again and get families consented again on a new type of testing protocol is really rather challenging for us um, to just pivot that quickly because it took us quite a while to get the 30,000 students consented. So we're just gonna take more time to understand um, and to listen to our community uh, before we make that decision. The only thing I would add to that sometimes they did uh, a webinar today and give us about a two week window turnaround time for when we first enter into the program to if, when we get tests. So we have to plan for that lead time um, with whatever option we decide to, to go with. So I we do have some flexibility. It's also important that, you know, when you give up an option, it may be hard to secure that vendor again, if we should ever need it again. And so, and then also Desia is only committed to this, I think until April or the end of April. And so what happens then, you know, yeah. they, they said they're going to reevaluate it at the end of April. And so, um, you know, I think our parents want more assurance. So we're just gonna take some more time to, to look at this policy. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a lot to ask in a very short time when things still are not very settled. Yes, thank you very much. Um, if there's no further discussion, I will now entertain a motion to receive the superintendent's report. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? No. Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cardat Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. 
Thank you. The superintendent's report is approved unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to general public com comment. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. The public comment period is an opportunity for parents, students, and other concerned parties to make brief presentations to the school committee on pertinent school issues. Questions on specific policy, excuse me, school matters are not answered at this time, but are referred to the superintendent for a later response. Questions on specific policy matters are not answered at this time, but may be the subject of later discussion by the committee. We have 40 speakers for general public comment. Each person will have two minutes to speak and I'll remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Speakers may not reassign their time to others. Large groups addressing the same topic are encouraged to consolidate their remarks or choose a spokesperson to provide testimony. Written testimony is appreciated and encouraged. Please direct your comments to the chair and refrain from addressing individual school committee members or district staff. When I call your name, please raise your hand virtually in Zoom. Also, please make sure that you're signed into Zoom with the same name you used to sign up for public comments. And that will allow us to identify you when it's your turn to testify. Please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. Please unmute yourself and turn on your camera when it's your turn to testify. Only speakers who turn on their camera will be allowed to testify. Otherwise, speakers can submit their testimony in writing. We'll begin this evening with our students. Please raise your hand. Glasson DeSuto Sanchez, Emerson Weiss, Jemai Sullivan, Skyla Nichols and Andrew Robinson. Please raise your virtual hand. We'll begin with Glasson. Now is you. You can pop here. Yes. Ah. Yes. Say hello. Say hello. And I am a first grade student. Oh wait. Uh, oh. Good evening. I am Boyson, and I am a first grade student at the PA shop. I want my school to go to sixth grade. Don't take away a classroom from my school. Turn it into a fourth grade. Do you know that I can? Please. Uh, oh, please. Do you know that I can add number strings that have nine numbers? I can also make a hexagon with pattern blocks in six different ways. These are the some of the things I've learned at the PA shop. The kids at our school want to stay. We want a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade at our school. And we are going to work together to make it happen so all our kids can keep learning in this community. Thank you. Thank you, Glasson. Our next speaker is Emerson Wise. Okay, Emerson is not signed into the meeting. So let's try Jemai Sullivan.
Hi, my name is Jamai. I am in third grade and my age is nine. I go to school at the P.A. Shaw Elementary School. If you came to the P.A. Shaw, you would see amazing kids. What is special to me in the P.A. Shaw is my teacher because she teaches a lot and she teaches us new strategies. For example, I learned how to act in a play about a freedom fighter named Frederick Douglass. Mommy. We learned we learned that Frederick Douglass spoke out for what he believed in, and now we are doing that too. I think you should put a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade so students can get the same education as we had before. The PA Shaw School deserves more grade levels because kids like me do not want to leave their, leave their friends. Also, my teacher is the best. She, wait. She, she teaches us a lot of important things that all kids need to know. I even think other kids should come to our school because my teacher is the best at teaching. My little sister, Kilani also loves the school and her teacher. Every day after school, she gets good reports. I know this because her teacher tells me. She, al she also practices spelling her name almost every day. Kilani is in K2. 20 seconds. And if there was more grades, we could stay together and still have our friends. Thank you for listening to what I have to say. Thank you, Jemai. Um, I think that Emerson might be signed in with Brenda Ramsey. Can we try Brenda? Hi, we're here. Mimi. Hi, my name is Emerson and I'm a first grader at the PA Shaw. I think you should not shut down one classroom at our school. You should add a fourth and fifth and sixth grade so kids like me can stay at the Shaw. My teachers have helped me learn a lot this year. I'm doing I'm learning geometry and lots of other things that I could not do before, like and like read and write. My school is help is like a family. If you close my school, you will hurt my learning. Please do not do this. I love my teachers. I don't want to leave my school and I want to keep learning at the PA Shaw. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. Our next speaker is Skyla Nichols. Hi, my name is Skyla. I am in the PA Shaw in Dugway. I think the PA Shaw needs to expand yes. it all. I think this because I've been here since I went to school. For example, this school is a great one, and who wants to leave? So I'm here to tell you that this is a pl this is the place to learn, and there are amazing teachers, and the subjects are amazing as well. You have the power to make our dreams come true. What I want to see at the PA Shaw is the school to expand the building and to go up to the end of college. If you have more grade levels, you will make kids very happy that they will have more time in the school. If you make it up to college, the students will miss their friends because they will still be with their friends. And if you don't, you will make friends spread apart. Clearly, friendship needs to stick together. Also, with siblings as well. It's just good to have vacations, but kids will miss their friends. And remember, you have the power to make our dreams come true. And can you add an elevator, please? 
Thank you. Thank you, Skyla. Great job. Our next speaker is Andrew Robinson. Andrew will be followed by Naomi Journal, Amelia Edmond, Tiffany Vassell, Ramona Shea Marcial, and Deb Shea. If you could all please raise your hand virtually. Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew. You probably know me from last school committee. What I need at the PA shot is a fourth grade, a fifth grade, and a sixth grade. And the memory that I had is when I was playing with my friend Adriana in first grade. We played with power pattern blocks. The reason why I picked that memory is because I've known Adriana since going to ABCD together. We've known each other for a long time, and that's why we're best friends. If we don't get to stay at the PA shop, we might not get to be together. If you take that away from us, it will hurt us that we have to leave our school. I believe that we can make this school better by getting a fourth grade, a fifth grade, and a sixth grade. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Our next speaker is Nahimi Journal. Hi, my name is Nahemi. I'm from the PA Shaw. I love this school. One reason why I love this school because, because the teachers and the people are always helping us all the time and helping with mistakes. We don't want to leave. We all have good memories here. One memory that stands out to me is when Jules joined our class community. Other memories that stand out to me is when we got to do our Frederick Douglass play. How would, who would want to leave this school? We love our friends and teachers. We also want fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth grade and on and on. Please let all of us have all the grade levels. Also, the teachers and friends are great. Thank you. Thank you very much. A friendly reminder to all of our speakers to please turn on your camera when it's your turn to testify. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amelia Edmond. Hello, my name is Amelia Edmond. I used to, to be at the Shaw. I graduated last year. The Shaw is a very good school. I learned so much while I was a student there. The teachers and principal are great. The Shaw helped me to become a good student. Since it only goes to third grade, I had to leave. Because of everything I learned at the Shaw, I have been a straight A student at my new school. The Shaw needs to have grades K through six. We can help more students become better if the Shaw is bigger. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Hi everyone. My name is Tiffany Vassell. I'm the mother of Amelia Edmond. The Shaw has been instrumental to my daughter's success. Amelia attended the Shaw from K-1 to third grade. If the Shaw went to the sixth grade, I would have kept her there. The teachers and admin at the school are excellent. They love and care about the students and families. They work hard with families to ensure that students are having the best learning experience. The Shaw has been a great school the entire time Amelia was there. They were especially great at the start of the remote learning when the pandemic began. As a nurse working on the front line during the huge initial COVID surge, one thing I was confident about was that although learning had moved to online, Amelia was learning everything she was supposed to. She was getting the learning support she needed from her teachers, the principals, the administrative staff. 
when she graduated from the Shaw last year, we were, we were extremely sad that we had to find a new school. We weren't interested in the Mildred School and instead opted to go elsewhere. The, the Shaw must stay in our community. It must be made a K through six inclusion school as promised. The Shaw is an asset to our community. We're so grateful for all the learning, the love and the support we've received from the Shaw. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ramona and her mom, Deb. Hi, I'm Ramona and in second grade at the PA show. What I want is for my school to go to sixth grade. It only goes up to third grade right now. One reason is I have so many great teachers and they have taught me so much and they have inspired me so much because I want to be a teacher when I grow up. Also, I've had so many great friends that play with me and I do not want to leave them either. My school has core values and I think that makes my school a unique place. They are respect, integrity, excellence, and perseverance. And I do not want to leave the happy community that with my friends and teachers that my school is. Thank you. Thank you. Deb Shea is our next speaker. Hello. Um, good evening. Thank you to everyone. Um, <laughs> my name is Deb Shea. Um, I live in Dorchester and I'm the proud parent of uh, Ramona, who's a second grader at DH Elementary. I'm so, so proud of all of the students that and um, parents that have presented. Um, we've been at the Shaw since uh, she started in K-1 in the fall of 2018. And from the very start, it's been such a warm, welcoming school community that's deeply committed to the success and well-being of every student and family. Uh, we were disappointed to learn that a plan to expand the school up to fifth grade had been abandoned by the district uh, the previous spring of 2018, disregarding the voices of parents and community members who were calling for expanded grades. This uh, broken promise is still evident on the BPS school directory listing, which says that the Shaw will continue its expansion um, to uh, one grade per year through grade five. We now have the opportunity to fulfill this promise and expand the PA Shaw to a full inclusion K-6 to school in line with the BPS vision for elementary schools. This expansion will minimize disruptive transitions for students and foster even stronger school community ties. Every year since this broken promise, we face declining enrollment and budget shortfalls. Families with multiple children move younger students out of our school so they can be in the same school with their older siblings who are now in a K to eight. We're in this situation not due to any fault of our students, families, or educators, but as a direct result of decisions made without and in opposition to the input of the school community. Instead of the proposed plan to close one of our third grade classrooms next year, we should be adding a fourth grade classroom, then a fifth and sixth grade classroom after that. We held the school-wide parent meeting earlier um, this month with 80 families um, in attendance where we developed and approved this expansion plan. We're asking that you listen to the people who are actually in this community uh, to keep our school family together. Our students have faced countless disruptions and hardships over the past two years. And this is the perfect time to reinvest in the safe, loving, extraordinary community created by Principal Davis and everyone at the PA Shaw. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Our next speakers are Oneida Casado, Lisa Robinson, Fatima Ali Salam, 
and Tracy Curtin. If you could please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Oneida. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Shaw this evening. My name is Oneida Casado and I've been working for BPS for 21 years. I began my career as a substitute teacher and I'm currently working as a proud kindergarten teacher at the Shaw. I have been working at the Shaw since it reopened in 2014, at which time we were promised by BPS that we would go to fifth grade. A promise that, as you now know, was not fulfilled, leading to a lot of frustrated families and staff. We are currently in a situation where we are under enrolled and in danger of losing a third grade classroom. It is frustrating for me because the situation may have been avoided if BPS had kept their original promise. I am proud of the educators and school leaders at the Shaw because of the love and commitment they demonstrate towards the Shaw community. Our community is made up of many families who are underserved in areas such as housing, food, and healthcare. The Shaw community not only offers excellent quality education according to BPS standards, we also strive to meet family social and emotional needs. It is wonderful to have a small community school in Mattapan where families can feel loved and cared for. It is great getting to know our wonderful Shaw families on a personal level and watching with pride as their children grow within our community. I think it is wrong to phase out our small but precious neighborhood school. Instead, a better solution would be to grow the school like we were originally promised by adding a fourth grade classroom like our students and families are asking for. I hope to see BPS work with the Shaw to grow the school so that we may continue to serve our wonderful families in Mattapan and the surrounding communities. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Robinson and Fatima Ali Salam are not signed into the meeting. So we'll move on to Tracy Curtin. Good evening, Dr. Caselius and members of the Boston School Committee. Um, my name is Tracy Curtin, and I'm a teacher at the PA Shaw Elementary School. I want to first thank you for your support of our advocacy thus far. Dr. Caselius, our third graders were thrilled to hear from you via email after our testimonies two weeks ago. We're back because we have a community-driven vision for our school, and we need action to be taken. The Shaw student population is 63% Black, 28% Latinx, 90% high needs, and 85% low income. Five years ago, I was with the huge number of parents who stood in the school library in 2018 when the district announced they would not fulfill their promise to expand the Shaw to a fourth and fifth grade and instead cap us at third grade. Since this decision in 2018, our enrollment has declined by 30%. I want to be very clear that this decline is not due to the quality of our school, but instead the result of district decisions to disinvest in our community. In fact, we have heard from other school leaders, from central office staff, and from our most important stakeholders, our families, that the Shaw is a high quality place to teach and learn. Dr. Caselius, you told us last night at our school site council meeting that the district has lost 7,000 students over the last five years. We at the Shaw know that our families often choose charters or private schools when they learn they can't continue at the Shaw past third grade. In our meeting with the Chief Financial Officer of Boston Public Schools two weeks ago, we heard that our vision to expand the Shaw to a K-6 school might make us too appealing of a school that could cause too many families to choose our school. If our goal is for students and families to want to be in BPS and to choose BPS, isn't this a good problem to have? While we are pursuing our own research on the racial equity of the K-6 expansions in BPS, we know that no school in Mattapan has yet to be chosen for a K-6 expansion. Mattapan students and families deserve a variety of school choices and a preservation of schools that families are excited to send their kids to. Ms. Carton. We're speaking up and um, we deserve to have a fourth grade class next year so our community can stay strong. Thank you. Thank you. I see that Lisa Robinson is signed in under Alyssa Robinson. Um, 
So you'll be our next speaker. A friendly reminder, if everyone could please make sure you're signed into the meeting under the same name that you use to sign up for public comment, that will help us identify you. Thank you. Lisa? Lisa Robinson. Hi, good evening, everyone. I apologize. My name is Alyssa Robinson. I'm a parent from Mattapan S. And good evening, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Alyssa Robinson, and I'm a grandmother and guardian to one small child in the Boston Public School System. He's five and a half and has been enrolled in the Boston Public School Special Education department since he was three years old due to an autism diagnosis. I'm here to speak on behalf of my grandson's former school, the Pauline Shaw uh, Elementary School in Madison, Mass. Currently, a special education class for children at the Shaw starts at K-0 and ends at the completion of K-1. And many of our most vulnerable children are traumatized by the transition from a tiny class at a school which is very small with a warm family atmosphere to large inclusion classes at a large new school. Some do very well, but others digress and require intervention within months due to their trauma, my grandson being one of those children. Um, the Shaw Elementary School and Community is proposing that the school be changed to a full inclusion school for all grades and that the school year 22-23, one fifth grade class be added to the Shaw. Promises have been made to the Shaw in previous years about both becoming a full inclusion school and about adding grades four through six, but have never come to fruition. It's time that our school and community, community members receive what they have been promised for so long. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thank you. We'll now hear testimony from speakers who will be using interpretation services. I will now turn off the interpretation icon. Interpreters and the public will all be in the main room. Interpreters, please stop interpreting and mute yourself for this part of the testimony. School committee member, Ms. Yeah, Blanco Garcia you. will receive Spanish interpretation by phone when testimony is being presented in a language other than English or Spanish. Our next speaker is Bang Wen. I'll ask our Vietnamese interpreter to please support our next speaker. Hello, xin chào. Hello, chị có thể nói chuyện được không? Dạ, tôi tên là Bản Nguyễn. À, tôi sống tại à, dùng West Rockway. À, tôi có một đứa con trai hiện tại và học ở à, trường Manning School. À, con tôi hiện tại giờ đang học lớp à, lớp 5. Dạ. À, tôi hỏi tại sao là tôi không có biết vấn đề là con tôi không có được cô hội được vô bố tự gì trường Manning không có được 10 điểm. À, tôi rất là thất vọng vì à. tôi bị à, cư xử một cách không công bằng và con của tôi giống như được bị chỉ định giống như tất cả học sinh của trường Manning về vấn đề sổ số vô cái trường đó và cũng giống như con của bà mà Seo Gu cũng vô trường nhưng mà con của bà được 10 điểm mà con tôi không được à, yeah. tôi rất là 
à, không được vui lòng dưới tất cả những à, người lãnh đạo của à, thành phố Boston. Tôi cũng người đóng thuế, trả thuế như tất cả mọi người, nhưng mà à, tôi không có được xử một cách công bằng. Cảm ơn à, anh nhiều. Tôi, anh xin ngừng ngại đó giùm em. Dạ, yeah, cảm ơn. Um, my name is Ben Nguyen. I'm from Rock, West Rockbury and I have a son go to men's school. He's in grade five. Here, I want to ask everyone about the 10 extra points so that he graduate from fifth grade and he can continue um, to go to the best school, the exam school, the Boston Latin School, Boston Latin Academy, and Johnny O'Brien. I want to ask everyone here, where is the equality? Um, why my son doesn't have the 10 point? This is not fair. And um, I don't understand about the lottery ticket. Um, why do we have to do that? The um, another person that I know, um, she have a daughter that got accepted into the Boston Latin School. And that person in Michelle Wu, she, her daughter have the 10 point, 10 extra point. I'm asking everyone here, all of you here, I'm a taxpayer just like you and you're treating me unfair. Why can't I have? Because the 10 extra point will help my son, but no one in the men in school have the 10 extra point. And not um, Dan. Tôi, tôi muốn clear là tôi, hiện tại giờ ở thành phố Boston có 7 cái trường là không được được 10 điểm để khi mà tất cả những học sinh thi vô trường exam school. Mm -hmm. Cái vấn đề đó là trong vấn đề đó không nói ra cho tôi tụi tôi hiểu mà Vấn đề là con của tôi được vô trường này này là do chỉ định của uh, thành phố Boston. Tôi 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 đáng lại tôi bị tôi bị xử lý không công bằng thì tôi sống ở West Bakery. Là tôi tôi bị trường đó và con tôi không có cơ hội được được phát triển làm sao tôi tôi nói cho con okay. tôi được. Ok, cảm ơn anh nhiều. Um, okay. So I just want to be clear. I know that there's seven school that didn't receive the 10 point that they can get into the exam school. I want an explanation why this happened. And because where I live, West Brockbury, they don't let us have the 10 point and that's really unfair. Thank you. Our next speaker is Daniel Noemi. And I'll invite our Spanish interpreter to please support Daniel. Daniel Noemi, por favor. Ahí sí. Ahora, a ver. Sí. Eh, hola, buenas noches. Mi nombre es Daniel Noemi. Eh, soy inmigrante latinoamericano en Boston. Y mi hijo y mi hija van a la escuela Manning aquí en JP, en Jamaica Plain. Um, good evening. My name is Daniel Noemi, and I am a Latin American immigrant, and my daughter and my son go here to the school in JP. Al, 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 al Manning School. Uh, uh, Manning School at, in Gracias, Jamaica sí. Plain. Sí. Eh, quiero aprovechar esta ocasión para expresar mi asombro y... Y mi profundo malestar por, por lo que está ocurriendo con, con los puntajes para, para la entrada a las escuelas de examen. Mis hijos están en el Manning como resultado de una lotería. Y yo estoy muy agradecido por esta posibilidad. Es una hermosa escuela y una gran comunidad. Eh, so, sin embargo, ahora me entero que por estar en una escuela a la que fueron asignados por lotería, mis hijos y todos sus amigos y amigas del Manning se verán castigados y no recibirán los 10 puntos que estudiantes en otras escuelas de, de BPS sí recibirán. Un momento, es... por favor. So, yes, um, my son and my daughter are in school because, in the Manning school because of a lottery. Um, 
And right now I am very concerned and very disappointed that because they came into the school and don't get me wrong, I've, I do appreciate it a lot. Um, now I have learned that my children and some of their um, peers will not be able to get um, the 10 points because they're in this type of school. Eh, esto justo, la, la verdad que es que no, no lo entiendo. Hice algo mal. Es decir, BPS nos asignó una escuela y ahora nos castiga por esa asignación. Tengo que jugar de nuevo a la lotería. La, la verdad es que no, no lo entiendo. No, no entiendo tampoco por qué los hijos del alcalde Wu, quien gana más de 200 mil dólares al año, sí reciben los 10 puntos. Y las niñas y los niños del Manning no. Sí, por so, favor, y, y los digo de, de todo corazón, eh, por favor arreglen este problema que por el bien, no, no solo del futuro de, de nuestras hijas e hijos, sino por el, por el futuro de toda esta ciudad, de, todo, de todos nosotros, de, de la comunidad de, de Boston. Muchas gracias. So, yes, and um, for me, I really do not understand and I really want to wrap my, hand around, my head around this, but you know, I, we sent our school, we sent our children to the school that they were assigned by BPS. And what should I do now? Should I play another lottery and win it again? Um, so what I do not understand is how Major Wu's daughters, the, Major Wu makes over $200,000 a year. Why did they get the 10 points? And people from the community, people like me, um, did not get these 10 points. Um, I, I greatly um, encourage BPS to fix this and to hear us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeanette Idolage. Jeanette Idolage. Hello. Good evening. Buenas noches. Sí, ¿Me escuchan? Yes. Sí. 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 Sí, señora, le escuchamos. Ok, muchas gracias por permitirme hablar hoy. Mi nombre es Ginette y yo vivo en West Roxbury. Mi hijo Wasim va a la escuela de Joseph Manning. So, good evening. My name is Ginette and my son Hasim goes to the school in Roxbury, the Manning. Mi hijo fue asignado a, a la Manning desde, desde que estaba en el primer grado. Ahora está en el sexto grado. My son was assigned to the Manning since he was in, in first grade. Now he's in sixth grade. Le quiero decir un poco de donde yo vengo. I would like to tell you a little bit of, uh, for where I'm come from. Yo llegué a los Estados Unidos cuando tenía 18 años. I came to the United States when I was 18. Desafortunadamente no hablaba nada de inglés y se me hizo muy difícil estudiar y progresar. Unfortunately, I did not speak any English and for me it was very hard, it was very hard for me to study and to um, grow. Yo sé que el obstáculo del idioma hizo mi decisión de ir a la universidad muy difícil. I know that, <clears throat> that the language barrier made my decision to go to school very hard. Pero yo seguí persistiendo y en ese entonces iba a la universidad para estudiar inglés y también trabajaba para ayudar a mantener a mi familia. At that time, um, I know that things were going to be hard, but I, per but I kept on going to school and I persisted and I kept on learning English and working to help my, to help support my family. Yo vengo de una familia de muy bajos ingresos y sabía que tenía que ser muy persistente para poder alcanzar mis metas. I come from a very low income family and I knew that I needed to be very persistent in order to achieve my goal. Mi dedicación y mi, mi persistencia me ayudaron a pasar muchos obstáculos. My dedication and my persistence helped me overcome a lot of obstacles. Por eso estoy aquí hoy. 
That is why I'm standing here today. Soy una madre muy orgullosa de mis tres hijos. I am a mother and I'm very proud of my three children. Mis hijos son primera generación americanos. My children are um, first generation American citizens. Mi deseo es que mis hijos logren el sueño americano. My dream is that my children can achieve the American dream. Para mis hijos, yo sueño una vida donde la educación es un derecho, no un privilegio. Uh, in, among my dreams for my children is that education is a right, not a privilege. En los Estados Unidos, una vez me dijo alguien. In the United States. Dale. In the United States, somebody once told me. Puedes hacer todos tus sueños realidad y solo el cielo es el límite. You can make all your dreams come true and only the, the sky is the limit. 30 seconds. 30 segundos. Mi hijo Westin también tiene sus sueños. My son Westin also has his dreams. Él le gusta mucho leer y escribir y quiere ser un escritor muy famoso. He likes to read and write and he wants to be a famous writer. Por favor, rectifiquen. Sé que no tengo mucho tiempo. Por favor, rectifiquen su decisión y denle la oportunidad a mi hijo que él no tuvo culpa que BPS lo haya puesto en la mano desde que tenía seis años. Please, I will ask BPS to rectify their decision and it is not his fault that BPS has placed him since first grade at the Manning. ¿Cómo le digo yo a mi hijo que no va a tener, que no, va, no, no tiene un chance al sueño americano? Por, How por, can por I... Excuse me, I'm afraid you're past your time. If you could please wrap up. Um, yo, the... yo quiero saber. Go, dile, por favor. So how can I tell my son that he cannot achieve his dream because he was placed at the Manning? La BPS entró a Wasim en la misma lotería a que los hijos de la del alcalde Wu están porque a ella, los hijos de ella, sí le tocan los 10 puntos. So, Westland was placed in the same um, lottery than the, uh, that the daughters of uh, uh, Mayor Wu, why they did not get the 10 points. Thank you, Ms. Idolash. Thank you, Pierre. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. 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 Our next speaker is Stephanie Almanzar. Stephanie Almanzar. Muy buenas noches. Mil gracias por darme la oportunidad de estar aquí este día. Well, good evening and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of, of speaking to you tonight. Uh, soy una madre de la Escuela Blaston y esta noche vengo a expresar y decir que nuestros estudiantes siguen afectados por el COVID. Um, I, am a, I am a mother of the Blackstone, and I came here tonight to tell everyone that we are still being affected by COVID. Uh, sé que muchos padres quizá no estén de acuerdo conmigo, pero necesitamos un plan remoto por unos meses. I know that some parents mo will not be in agreement with me, but we need a remote plan for a few months. Sea por un mes o dos meses después de las vacaciones de febrero. It could be for a month or two after February vacations. Uh, tenemos que cuidar la salud de nuestros estudiantes, de los padres y de, la, y de los maestros. We have to care for the health of our students, parents, and teachers. Mi hija fue afectada por COVID en la escuela. Y no solo ella, muchos niños son uh, contagiados en la escuela con el COVID. My daughter got infected with COVID at school. And not only her, a lot of other children have been infected with it at school. Yo quiero que consideren mis palabras. No es por todo el año escolar. Solo pido uno o dos meses de clase remota. 
I would like you to take into consideration what I'm asking for. I am not asking for a full year. I am just asking for a month or two. A todo aquí sabemos que los maestros también se enferman, también sus propios problemas. Eh, eh, actualmente no hay maestro en las escuelas públicas. Um, we all know that teachers also get sick. And right now we know that there is a shortage of teachers at public schools. Y también los paraprofesionales. And also the paraprofessionals. Y la mayoría de los estudiantes no están recibiendo la educación que ellos necesitan en las escuelas. And the majority of students are not receiving the education that they need in schools. Están corto de personal y nuestros hijos están saliendo muy afectados académicamente. And we know that we are, that the schools are short staffed and that our children are being affected academically. Para mí como madre lo más importante es la educación de mi hija. Quiero que reciba la mejor enseñanza que ella necesita. For me, as a parent, the most, the most important thing is my daughter's education, and I would like her to receive the best education possible. También pido que se consideren las clases remotas, pues de las vacaciones de febrero, porque habrá lo mismo que pasó después de las vacaciones de diciembre. And I would also like you to take in consideration um, the remote uh, way of giving classes because most likely it's going to happen just as it happened after the vacations in December. Sabemos que después de diciembre fueron muchos estudiantes que estuvieron eh, positivo del COVID y no quisiéramos que pasara lo mismo ahora en febrero. We know that after December Christmas break, um, there was many students that were positive to COVID and we don't want that to happen again after February. Por eso yo pido que consideren por lo menos un mes después de las vacaciones de febrero de estar en casa con los niños para luego regresar en persona. That's why I'm asking for you to take in consideration that month before we all go back into the classrooms. Thank you, Ms. Almanzar. Muchas gracias, señor Almanzar. Our next speaker, Jan Zhu, is not signed into the meeting. Um, so at this time, I will activate the not the interpretation icon. All interpreters will be sent to your channels and you can begin interpreting again. Thank you. Our next set of speakers are Kanako Ido Wen, Michael Heishman, Victoria Woodward, Nancy Lesson, and Sherry Kelleher. If you could all please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Kanako? Hello, my name is Kanako Ito. I live in West Roxbury. My son goes to Manny School. I requested a Japanese translator, but I was told they were unable to provide one. So please excuse my English. I will do my best to deliver my message. I'm a mother of a Manny fifth grader and a special education teacher. My family believes in the full inclusion model, but thoughtfulness in addition, unthoughtfulness in additional 10 point to all but seven Boston public school discrimination, um, discriminate against students who are on an IEP for emotional impairment and who benefits from full inclusion setting. The seats for full inclusion services for EL are extremely limited. Only two of Boston public elementary schools provide a full inclusion option for students with EL. Those are the JP Manning School and the Mary Lyon. However, if your students attend the JP Manning in order to be in the uh, LRE, they are automatically disqualified from receiving additional 10 points to attend the exam school by virtue of receiving services for their disability. The Mary Lyon does not have enough seats to provide services to all of the students necessary and not no other program exists for the same quality. 
Boston has created the program in a school, J.B. Manning, does not get additional points for admission to exam school, which is in turn limits access to students who must be in the program. The law requires students have access to the general education classroom to the fullest potential. And the BLS, uh, BPS has met the legal requirement with the JP Manning School. Section 504 for business organization and employees from excluding or denying individual from disability with the disabilities an equal opportunity to receive program. Excuse me, oh. Ms. Wen, I'm afraid you're past your time. If you could please wrap up. Okay. Ten additional points must be dismissed so that these students have the same opportunity as their peers who are not in E l and needed full inclusion i entered the same lottery for my children as mayor Wu. why do her kids get the 10 points thank you thank you our next speaker is michael heishman Mike Heishman, Dorchester, Bezier. Thank you, Zara and Tiffany, for representing BSEC on the school committee. Hooray for BSEC for your January 14th action. Thank you for acting to protect your health, the health of your classmates, the health of your families, and the health of your community. Thank you for your advocacy for your education. When Kamani James resigned from the school committee, and we, when he and some student leaders resigned from BSEC, because adult leaders did not listen and respect you, it became difficult to hear students' voices. A strong student voice is essential for the future of our school system. I am thrilled that BSAC is back. Dr. Caselius, thank you for listening and respecting our student leaders and for supporting their recent action. Do you still have a student cabinet? We need to hear about your meetings with our student leaders. Zara and Tiffany, we need to hear reports from BSAC at future school committee meetings. Hooray for families for COVID safety and their action on Monday, January 24th. Hooray for our Boston parents who took our campaign for safe schools and quality education to DESE. Once again, DESE is part of the problem instead of being part of the solution. Thank you for rejecting the proposal to turn Charlestown High into a neighborhood school. This racist proposal would have gentrified that school to benefit the white families of Charlestown. This proposal should have been addressed by the equity roundtable before a decision was made. Seconds, Thank you, Dr. Caselius, for explaining to me that the state required that this decision be made within 30 days. This is another example of a stupid bureaucratic DESE requirement. Once again, DESE has demonstrated that it's part of the problems instead of part of the solution. On January 17th, there was a debate in the Boston Globe over whether the state should put the BPS into receivership. This so-called debate is being orchestrated by hidden forces outside of our city. Mr. Heishman. Is there any way that we could place DESE into receivership? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Victoria Woodward. My name is Victoria Woodward Moore, and I'm a mom to two Manning School students in grades four and six. We live in Brighton. I have concerns about the additional 10 points policy for exam school admission. I understand and support the original intent of the 10 points, but I want to outline two issues. Misinformation presented by the district at the school committee meetings and lack of communication to BPS families about these policy changes. The superintendent's presentation at the December 1st school committee meeting failed to capture all affected schools. The Manning and Mozart schools were not included on the slide listing BPS schools with less than 40% poverty. Notably, these slides were scrubbed from the exam school web website this week, but I have the PDFs. We were only made aware that our schools were affected when the list of disadvantaged schools were, was posted on the BPS website weeks ago. In addition, the district simulations presented to prove that every school will have an opportunity for invites also excluded the Manning and the Mozart. Any school with a grade five must be included in their simulations 
since they're, they're applying the 10 points based on where kids attended grade five, where our schools accidentally or intentionally excluded. How can we trust their data when entire schools are omitted? Alarmingly, there was never communication sent to BPS families about the 10 points. The superintendent's December 21st email regarding updates fails to mention the 10 points. Many of the parents I've spoken with had no idea about the policy, that it impacts their kids, or that the district is awarding this bonus to every student at 91% of schools except for seven, thereby penalizing students for attending the school BPS assigned them two years ago. How will this policy provide equity for children who need it when the 10 points are distributed so broadly? That's I don't nice. believe the impacts of this policy have been carefully considered, nor have the unintended consequences been examined. Many fellow parents are testifying about these tonight. You cannot put equity on the back burner and say you'll investigate in a year. I enter the same lottery for my children as Mayor Wu. Why do her kids get the 10 points? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nancy Lesson. I'm Nancy Lesson, grandmother of four BPS elementary school students, mother of a BPS high school teacher, member of Mascosh Health Technical Committee, and of BPS Families for COVID Safety, FAMCOSA. I'm in Jamaica Plain. FAMCOSA calls for enhanced school COVID protection, such as fixing a very broken pool testing system, guaranteeing good ventilation and filtration, investigating school outbreaks, increasing access to vaccinations and providing high quality masks, N95s and KF94s for staff and KF94s for students. This layered approach is needed to reduce school transmission. While many officials peddle myths about low school transmission, most studies show that if the elements of a layered approach are in place, the risk of school transmission is lowered. During this pandemic, 10.6 million children have gotten COVID in the US, 2 million of them in the last two weeks. In today's Washington Post, an opinion piece written by three of DESE's medical advisors said schools can now safely make masks optional for students and staff. I won't go into their convoluted reasoning. It's not scientific, but it's very troubling. Last fall, several studies compared COVID cases in schools that required masks and those that didn't. One showed COVID cases were three and a half times higher in schools without mask requirements. Another showed pediatric COVID rates lower in counties with school mask requirements. CDC concluded that school mask requirements in combination with other prevention strategies are critical to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in schools. Last week, CDC updated guidance on masks stating that N Fives offer far better protection than cloth masks against the Omicron variant. They recommended wearing the most protective mask that fits well. DESE will be deciding next month on continuing Massachusetts school mask requirement. BPS should get and keep students and staff in high quality masks, regardless of what DESE decides. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sherry Kelleher, followed by Margaret Day. Ruby Reyes, Janet Platt, Elise Petcher, Yamaris Matias, Dacia Morales, and Edith Bazile. If you could please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Yeah, Sherry, to get to know some of them. Sherry Kelleher. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Good evening. My name is Sherry Kelleher and I'm from Charlestown, Massachusetts. We joined the BPS family in the promising times of 2010, excited to land at the Warren Prescott because of its proximity, community, and academic excellence. Before and after school programming helped our working schedules. Community involvement can help raise all the boats as it did at both the Kent and the WP. Flash forward to recent district failures, build BPS, declining enrollment, plummeting MCAS scores, and a long-standing inability to improve schools. Since the pandemic, you've punted on remote learning, failed to address learning loss, not provided standardized curriculums per grade level. These meetings are a litany of how you fail to meet community needs, students and buses, safety, pathways, so many aspects of COVID, and the exam schools with no other quality options. 
Among other things, your bungled pol policy left at least 75 seventh grade seats at the exam schools open this fall. This is important because of the 30 BPS high schools, only these three schools rate a meets or exceeds by the state. Despite your lip service to equity, by your own dated measures, only 6% of high school students attend a tier one school that is not an exam school. You rate only one third of all high schools as tier one or two. How do you sleep at night? We hope you won't materially damage BLS before our older son graduates. You've given me no reason to trust that you can or will do anything to stop the downward spiral towards district wide state receivership. We've made the wrenching decision to pull our younger son from a school community that he has known almost his entire life. You failed him. You failed us. You continue to fail the families of Boston. Enrollment will never mirror city demographics until you provide quality options for our students. It's not entitlement to pay taxes and feel forced to pay for schools out of pocket. It's desperation. In closing, how do you sleep at night? Thank you. A speech. Our next speaker is Margaret Day. I don't know how, do I need to turn my video on? Oh, got it. Hello, my name is Margaret Day. I live in Jamaica Plain. I am the mother of a fifth grader at the Manning and a social worker. The exam school task force met for a year and thoughtfully considered ways to increase accessibility at Boston's exam schools. After much multidisciplinary collaboration, they proposed an eight tier system to help increase the opportunities of all Boston students to enter the exam schools. I support this. But the very last minute and poorly researched 10 points are not in line with the original goals and frankly insulting to the thoughtful work of the task force. When 91% of students receive points, you are not lifting up those in need. They will have to compete with 91%. Instead, you are punishing 8% for no good reason. These economic disadvantage points are calculated by looking at each school as a whole. Therefore, K through five, which the Manning was for the majority of the years, is being directly compared to a K through eight school. This is mathematically flawed. A 10th grade math student can tell you this basic tenet of mathematics. In order for there to be comparison, there must be normalization. In this case of comparison, normalization means looking only at K through five at each school when calculating the economic disadvantage. All the DESI data going back over a decade shows that Boston public elementary schools become incredibly more economically disadvantaged in grades six through eight. The comparison, if the comparison was normalized and this percentage only reflected K through five students, we would be seeing a very different economic disadvantage list with many more than seven schools. The Manning is being inaccurately compared to its peers using faulty math. That lacks the most basic thoughtfulness when seeking comparability. I find it so very concerning that this last minute hustle to add 10 points lacked the clarity and professional approach needed to treat the data appropriately. While I'm asking you to consider the numbers here, I wanna be clear, the damage is more than numbers. These seven schools represent students, students who have worked hard and are being prevented from having equal access based on bad math. I entered the same lottery as for my children as Michelle Wu. Why do her kids get the 10 points? Thank you. Our next speaker is Ruby Reyes. Um, good afternoon, my name is Ruby Reyes and I'm the Executive Director of the Boston Education Justice Alliance and Dorchester resident. BPS needs to adopt a do no harm policy. Beja requests that the school committee commit to no unnecessary disruptions to any student or learning community until there is at least one year of steady learning. No administrator local or at the state level should add to the trauma students are experiencing. This includes school communities having to worry about closing from enrollment decline, school budget cuts because of weighted student funding formulas or empty build BPS promises. As part of this no harm policy, BPS should revisit, revisit the attendance policy to ensure families do not experience unnecessary stress 
from threats of truancy. At Tuesday's DESE board meeting, Commissioner Riley shared that it was up to school districts to determine their attendance policy. Beja would like to encourage the school committee to amend the attendance policy to increase the number of absences due to COVID related issues as a commitment to do no harm. Families need to be included in decision-making around COVID safety so that they are receiving answers to questions rather than being blamed for sending sick kids to school. BPS needs to guarantee adequate ventilation and filtration in every space in which students are eating meals, maintaining and providing portable air cleaners with HERPA filters for schools without HVAC systems, and evaluate the implementation of all COVID mitigation efforts to ensure racial equity using the BPS Racial Equity Planning Toolkit. The Manapee and Dorchester and Roxbury neighborhoods house the most school-aged children. However, schools in the, these neighborhoods specifically are experiencing threats of grade, re, grade reductions, budget cuts, like with still that. no new building in sight. The Trotter and King schools just found out their seventh and eighth grades will be cut. The Trotter has 1% white students and the King has 2.5. The Shaw school recently had a third grade classroom eliminated. They have 1.9 white students. The district had originally promised to expand the Shaw to include grades four and five. Um, Shaw families and students are once again fighting to strengthen their school community rather than having it close. We know that closing Maria, school could please wrap up. disproportionately impacts Black and Latino families and is, no, is not a long-term solution to enrollment decline across the city. Rather than the current teardown model of destroying places of joyful learning for Black and Latino students and families, the solution is to stop closing schools and start building the things that you promised. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janet Platt. Good evening. My name is Janet Platt. I live in Ashland, Mass, and I'm an instructional leader at Boston Day and Evening Academy. I know the vaccine mandate is a difficult and decisive issue, and I want to speak about how it will play out at BDEA. Next week, we stand to lose up to five colleagues. Our school, like all of BPS, strives to have staff that looks like our students. And Monday, we may lose five Black colleagues. All five of the colleagues we would lose are, are educators of color. It's a huge loss to our community. And I cannot imagine how it is equitable. One of my colleagues has made a lifetime of health choices that do not include medication of any kind. It's not a new thing. It's who she has been for decades. I do not understand why there is no path for her. I'm asking you to find that path. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elise Petcher. Elise will be followed by Yamaris Matias, Dacia Morales, Edith Bazil, and Erin Birmingham Anadu. Elise? Yes, hi. Um, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. Thank you. Um, my name is Elise Petcher. I'm a grandmother of two kids in the Boston schools. I live in Jamaica Plain. Um, I'm a member of MassCosh Health Technical Committee and a member of BPS Families for COVID Safety. And I want to talk to you about the importance of measuring and reporting our COVID data accurately. We've been told the schools are safer than the community, comparing the pool testing rate to the rate in the community. And that's a false comparison. In pool testing, you're only testing healthy people, the folks who show up to school well enough with no symptoms to be in school. When you're looking at the community testing, you're looking at people who are sick and getting tested even because they're in the hospital. So that's a false comparison. Second problem is any pool might have more than one positive person. So then the second point is who gets tested? Um, we've heard in the 60,000 member community, maybe half have consented to be tested. And my guess is it's even lower. There are only 4,900 pools, at least in um, the week of January 13th to 19th. If we assume the people in the pool are the same as the people not being tested, we probably have twice as many cases as are being reported. So 
even if we're seeing good news, like the 886 cases, chances are it's twice that many, 1,800 people. 30. And for the most part, in the pool testing, they're in the school for two days before they find out they're positive. Our schools have to be healthy for the folks who are there, which includes ventilation, filtration, masking, and all the other um, issues that the Families for COVID Safety have been asking for. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yamaris Matias. Good evening, you're on mute. Oh, good evening, sorry. No um, good evening to all community members. My name is Imaris Matias. I'm a mother of two children who attend to Ocho Garden School. I also live in South End. The reason they bring me here tonight is to express my concerns about the high rates of positive cases of COVID-19 in BPS. I wanted to keep it in mind that other schools are prepared to offer a safe place for all children is something that worries everyone. The lack of repairs of the buildings has been ignored for years, and it is time to take an action and remodel the schools. They need maintenance as soon as possible. Our children, teachers, and, and all the other uh, school staff should have better ventilation and safe environment. Something else that I would like to add. I think it makes a lot of sense if you take into consideration the lack of the personnel such as the teacher, lunch monitors, school drivers, and bus monitors who are asked and do uh, to being uh, infected with COVID-19. To have an option of remote learning for uh, our children, to give this option to the parents who had the remote learning, especially when the students have been a cl uh, close contact exposure and also positive of COVID. Uh, they miss so much of their classes because what was promised for the students to have the plan to continue their education while they are in quarantine has not happened. Why if it's Esther's funds are there for the students who, need, who really need the support is not being used to provide the remote learning during quarantine? Can you tell me what it, we must do so our voices are heard and have the option of remote learning for those who are going to need it? In my opinion, I think it will be a logical decision because we want what is best for our children. So I want to know, since you have responsibilities of, of making decisions about the school, what is your position as a school community members to enjoy the fight uh, with us parents? So this decision tips in our favor. It's not that I'm only worried about my kids, but also about the, all the children and uh, teachers and also the um, the uh, and all the staff of the BPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matias. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Dacia Morales. Hi, can you hear me? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Would you mind turning on your camera for us, please? Oh, I can't turn it on at this moment. Okay. Is Chair, that okay? Chair, is that okay if she continues with the camera off? Yes, we'll allow it this one time, please. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Dacia Morales. My, um, I'm a parent. Um, of a BPS um, student um, and I'm here because of my concern about the high COVID rates um, being a, a medical professional myself and um, and I said it before and I'll say it again that um, we're living in a public health and emergency and I don't think that you guys are taking these seriously and it's very um, disrespectful to us, the parents, the teachers, and the students especially. Because um, I think that 
remote learning should have been on back on uh, all a long time ago. Um, not that I don't want my child in the environment with the students so that she could be with her teachers and her peers, but health comes first before education. You know, if you don't have health, you don't have anything. So I don't know what any, what you guys are waiting for to do remote learning because um, in the past couple of weeks, I've heard different deaths, like young people passing away from COVID-19. And it's not funny and it's not okay. And that's you, all I gotta say. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Edith Bazil. Good evening. We are all living with COVID stress fatigue. Black communities experience racial stress fatigue on top of that. Build BPS contributes to this racial stress fatigue. I worked at the Pauline A. Shaw School when it was a K-5 setting. The PA Shaw was a stabilizing core support for families with strong school community bond. We would walk across the street, meet with families and engage students. We created a partnership with a local bank where Black bankers conducted power lunches with students. I recall how when on the first day of school, students' eyes lit up with excitement as five Black males dressed in meticulously tailored suits presented to the entire student body. These bankers tutored students in math, which led to building relationships, character, independence, and school success. Good things happen when positive school community and business partners are created. created. The PA Shaw was later closed. There's a police station nearby that has never been at risk for closing. The PA Shaw reopened with limited grades and now has an uncertain future. My point is, in 2022, white policymakers unfamiliar with this history make decisions that destabilize and traumatize black neighborhoods where school where community policing is prioritized over community schools because there's no curiosity about the school's importance to the community. Now on the heels of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, the King and Trotter schools will suffer grade cuts. Decisions made then announced does not constitute parental input. Meanwhile, non-Black communities get new cutting edge state-of-the-art buildings and expansive capital improvement plans does this sound like BP, Build BPS centers racial equity? We all know the answer. Build BPS is failing black students. BPS cannot do this work without cultural insiders who are empowered to build a racial equity infrastructure that has teeth using the racial equity planning tool, not as a checkoff, but as an integral strategy for centering racial equity for black communities. In the meantime, Madam Chair, I suggest a moratorium on school closings and grade reconfigurations to address the ongoing harm Build BPS is inflicting on Black communities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Erin Birmingham Anadu, followed by Nick Neri, Jason Samaha, Judith Baker, Courtney Feely Karp, and Julia Kohler. If you could please raise your hands in Zoom. Erin? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Erin Birmingham Anadu. I have three kids at Manning Elementary. We live in Rossendale. Our oldest, KJ, is in the fifth grade. He was assigned K0 at the Manning when he was just three for full inclusion early intervention. At the Manning, my son has thrived. The child who didn't talk now loves public speaking. A neuropsych evaluation identified KJ as academically gifted. He tested into the AWC program, yet we and many other Manning families chose to stay at the Manning. For our family, the social emotional benefits are invaluable. This fall, KJ was even selected to participate in a BPS middle school science program where they took pictures using NASA satellites. Even though he is just in fifth grade, BPS gave him the opportunity and he did 
great. I'm a very proud mom. So imagine our surprise when I find out the same BPS is now penalizing my son and taking away opportunities. We do not live in walking distance to the Manning. Our home isn't in Moss Hill. My son was assigned to the Manning by BPS, and this is now being used against him. At the Manning, there are kids who have been kicked out of other BPS schools, only to find a fit at the Manning. And now they're being penalized for doing well at a great school. I urge you to reconsider the 10 point penalty. The goal is noble, but the execution is faulty. Why was the Manning left out of simulations? Why was it added onto the list after the initial announcement? It was mentioned in today's superintendent report that you are aware of possible issues relating to students with disabilities and equity. If you are aware of disparate impact, your absolute duty is to address it now, not next year. There's a really lovely family down the street, two blocks from us. They're a Yale educated banker and a Harvard educated lawyer. Their two kids will get the 10 points. That Harvard educated lawyer is Mayor Michelle Wu. How do I explain to KJ? Why do they get the 10 point bonus and we don't? The time is now. Please reconsider. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nick Neri. Hi, can you, can you hear me? Hi. Okay. Yes, I'm here, good. Hi, Hi my name is Nick Neri. Uh, I live in Jamaica Plain. I'm a proud father of two BPS students and have been a Manning parent for the past nine years. Um, over the past nine years, I've had a front seat in witnessing the benefits of full inclusion at the Manning. I've seen my children grow to be em empathetic, patient, understanding, forgiving, and academically thoughtful leaders. And much of this comes from the lessons they learned at the Manning. Over the years at the Manning, it's, I, I've, I've heard you know, the praise that it's had uh, uh, and being recognized for its success and narrowing the achievement gap. And it appeared that BPS really looked at the Manning as a model of inclusion done right. I believe that the cornerstone of this model though and why it has gone right is student cohorting. These students grow up together from early years and they learn to have empathy for one, for one another. They, they work together, they, they bring each other up and it brings confidence and trust and a great learning environment in the classroom. So I'm raising this about the Manning, uh, really specifically about the 10 point gap as I believe it will cause uh, significant harm to the community, which has taken years to build. It would be really specifically damaging to the many EI students that, you know, we heard already in many of the other speakers that were really assigned to the Manning. There was, there was nowhere else to go. There's really not enough inclusion schools in Boston as there is. So all automatically they're gonna be limited, uh, these EI students really in their opportunity to attend exam schools right off the bat. Another is that you know, students who want to attend a, a exam schools, exactly. I believe will essentially elect to leave the Manning uh, probably in the fourth grade uh, so that they don't receive the penalty, if you will. And I do believe then that breaks down the cohort model and will damage the inclusion model that, the, that has made the Manning successful. Finally, I would say that, you know, basically why is the Manning not considered in-, in Mr. Neri, I'm sorry, if you could please wrap up. Finally, why is, why is Mayor Wu get the 10 points and my family does not? Don't understand that, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Samaha. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the school committee. Uh, my name is Jason Maha. Oops. Um, uh, good evening, thank you. Um, my name is Jason Smaha. I am a teacher at Madison Park Technical Vocational High School. Um, yesterday, Dr. Casillas and her team, along with BTU President Jessica Tang and her team, uh, participated in a very open and honest dialogue with the staff at Madison Park. It was communicated to us that an intervention team will be formed with representatives from both uh, BPS uh, and uh, 
Madison Park BTU staff. This team will be reviewing data, meeting with members of the MP community, and finally making recommendations to the superintendent about how to move our school forward. I'd like to thank Dr. Casilius for taking this bold and brave move to ensure that Madison Park, our city's only full uh, career and technical uh, education school, is able to fulfill its potential. As you all know, Madison Park has had a very rough go of it. Ever-changing leadership, turnaround and transformation status, and general inconsistency has plagued us for over 10 years. It seems that Madison just can't catch a break. Plan after plan has been drawn up over the years, but no one has taken a stand and said that the responsibility of Madison Park rests with me. Dr. Casilia said this to us yesterday. When I heard this, I was elated. It seems that finally, after all we've been through, somebody at the highest level of BPS administration is saying, we hear you, Madison Park. We care about you, Madison Park. And we're going to do whatever we can to make Madison Park the shining star it has the potential to be. With this very radical statement of love comes accountability. This process must be public and transparent. There can be no behind closed doors moves. There can be no talk without action. I come here to this very public forum to thank the superintendent and the school committee for putting us on their map and acknowledging the importance of Madison Park. All of the stakeholders in this, central admin, teachers, students, families, partners, neighbors, must hold each other accountable. We must succeed where others have failed. The stakes are way too high. The kids at Madison are our kids. Every day I see, I look at the sea of sophomore faces in my English class and see the talent and promise there. It is nice finally for the district level administrative team to see that talent and promise too and to put real action into making Madison Park Technical Vocational High School the very best it can be. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now it's time to get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Judith Baker. Thank you so much. And thank you all for listening for three hours already and still have a meeting in front of you. Um, I don't know any of the school uh, committee members these days, but let me tell you who I am. I started teaching Jeremiah Burke 50 years ago when racial isolation in Boston was such a horrible problem that when I took my students across the Mystic River Bridge, they were terrified they'd never been there before. The, the, the racial isolation from the job market in Metro Boston is as bad now, almost as bad now as it was then. There has been so little progress that it's un, unbelievable to me. And I talk to my former students all the time who say to me things like, golly, you know, I didn't know I could have been a blank, fill in the blank. I didn't know those things then. We've got to end that. And I, I really appreciate Jason speaking up. I hope you read the report that was done under Mayor Walsh's administration of middle scale jobs forecast for the Metro Boston area. They are among the very best jobs that are going to be available to our students this century. There are at least 75 jobs, most of which our students and their families have never seen, don't know anything about, and therefore can't aspire to. Technical vocational education is not about Madison Park High School alone. It's about the feeder programs, the community awareness, starting in fifth and sixth grade. It's about having seventh grade and eighth grade programs. It's about having hands-on education at very low grade levels so that children, our children, can know about and aspire to and prepare for the jobs in Metro Boston and around the world in the 21st century. We have to improve not only Madison Park, but all of our career prep uh, programs leading up to it. I speak for the Friends of Madison Park and myself as a longtime teacher, parent, and, and, and community activist in the Boston Public Schools. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Our next speaker is Courtney Feely Carr, followed by Julia Kohler, Cheryl Buckman, and Yusuf Idalaj. If you could please raise your hands virtually in Zoom. Courtney.
Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, apologize for the multitasking here. Um, I, and I apologize at three hours and still going for all of you and we're about to have dinner. I signed up to testify tonight around some of the COVID measures and lack thereof, but I did want to take a quick moment of my time to really speak to the folks who've been testifying from the Manning. Um, we are parents to a second grader at the Henderson Inclusion School. And, you know, my sympathies are entirely with you and promotion of the values of your school. And I, and I really try to say this with an inclusive spirit and as a call in and not a call out. But I, I just, I would like to say to all of you that I hear you and you have strong arguments and passion and important things to say. And you're undercutting your own arguments, your own advocacy by bringing Mayor Wu's children into this. Um, it is neither inclusive nor appropriate to be talking about that in service of your greater mission. And I hope those who continue to testify take that to heart. Um, you know, those boys have been through enough. We live in Rosendale. They've had plenty of things going on that's made their lives difficult. Please, um, regardless of your political affiliation, um, continue your advocacy without that kind of unnecessary um, add on. Um, but back to the COVID. I really spoke, signed up tonight to really commend um, Council Member Mercer, who goes to my daughter's school, um, and for her leadership and the leadership of all of her fellow peers in their walkout and their advocacy and their day of action. It was really well done. And I really hope this body takes their demands seriously. Um, there are real issues with implementation of COVID measures and lack thereof. We are in the process of trying to transition our child from the home and hospital program into school, and it is really getting a handle on what is being done and what isn't it's a real challenge. And I appreciate and, and thank the superintendent for taking the time regarding Desi's ill-conceived approach to transition away from test and stay. It's bad enough we don't even know what test and stay does right now. Um, and I would reiterate that having vaccinated people stand out differently from unvaccinated people in these programs when latest data shows that we have 8% breakout cases of what is reported um, and that we need to have better policies to provide parents with clear understanding of what the situation is in their schools. And I would also just, I know my time is up, but just to go back to what Sam DePina had indicated that he would be following up with the school committee regarding sensors and data in large areas like the cafeterias and places where students are aggregating without masks, if that could also be made available on the air quality website for the general public, that is information as parents, we would like to have as well and not have to sit through a three hour school committee meeting to get. So thank you for your time. I hope you're meeting them soon. Thank you. Looks like Julia, Cheryl and Youssef are not signed into the meeting. So therefore chair, that concludes our speakers for general public comments. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. And thank you to those of you who spoke this evening and shared your perspectives. Your testimony is very important to us. Our first action item this evening is grants for approval totaling $741,714. I'll now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. Are there any questions? No? I, I have one. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so, well, first, uh, I, I want to echo the, the the sentiments um, given to uh, Miss Mercer on um, um, co-organizing a a student um, walkout and in protests um, done safely um, and done clearly, um, clearly, um, such that uh, the demands were were laid out, and of course, the dialogue that it created was one that I believe was constructive. Um, and uh, certainly moving forward, um, definitely under consideration and, um, and definitely um, upholding the, uh, the voices of the, the community. And uh, thank you, Ms. Mercer, for empowering the voices of uh, everybody uh, in, in that sense. Um, um, and the question that I have actually is sort of related um, more or less on some details concerning the uh, the kaleidoscope uh, cohort to school funds. If if we have any updates 
regarding sort of the progress of the pilot advisory teams, uh, where like where they are um, in their work at this point? Yes, I know that um, our school superintendent, Tommy Welsh, has been working with uh, DESE to implement that program. It was put on pause for a year and they've just reinitiated it this year to begin the program. Um, I'm not sure if he's on and he, if he's able to give an update on where we're at with that project as of date. I don't think that he is on, but I'd be glad to get you that, um, Dr. Elkins, and for the committee yeah. um, where we are on that data. I just don't have my notes on the project. The project is in the East Boston um, Region 1 schools um, where the focus is, and they're doing professional development and deeper learning is um, project-based learning, authentic assessment, and it's mostly the first year is around training teams and working with teacher teams around that practice uh, within the schools. They also have a, a, a piece of the work around acceleration academies. Um, and we are also doing acceleration academies, uh, similar to the work that DESE is doing in these 15 schools um, throughout all of um, our Boston schools as well over the February break and the April break. Great. I think Tommy is trying to Come on. He's on the audience side right now. Asia. Okay, thank you. Hey, Dr. Uh, Alkins, good to see you again. Uh, Tommy Welch here, Region 1 School Soup, supporting schools in East Boston, North End, Charlestown, elementary and high school. Uh, I think the question was about progress of uh, Kaleidoscope right now. Um, this year was really the first year we kicked it off um, in that grant. You'll see there was a grant approved last week as uh, last school committee, and then there's one up this week. The grant really has two parts to it. The first part, which Dr. Kilselli has started explaining, was the Acceleration Academies. Um, this grant is uh, basically funding one of the 10 regions uh, for the recovery strategy for uh, a February and April academies. Um, during the summer, one of the first meetings I took with Dr. Eccleson, I uh, just wanted to make sure that he knew that this money was coming and I wanted to be as aligned as possible with the district-wide strategy. So think of it as like, you know, funding one-tenth of, of this initiative that's coming up in February. Um, throughout the winter, I collaborated with his team to make sure that we were uh, as closely aligned as possible um, on all the elements of the rollout of this uh, uh, huge investment. Um, uh, last night, as a matter of fact, we had 151 of our teachers in Region 1 uh, in, a, in the first of two PDs uh, getting ready for February. So uh, we're pretty good, firmed up, uh, ready to go. Um, the second bucket of funding, uh, which is the one that's up for tonight, uh, has to do with professional development, professional learning. Uh, this is uh, getting into the deeper learning uh, uh, framework that uh, Dr. Caselli was mentioning. Um, really what we're doing is, is, is taking the 15 school leaders uh, and 140 uh, pilot advisory team members who volunteered to do uh, this initial work of planning uh, for the deeper learning uh, rollout. Uh, and really what it's doing is tying our overall district strategy of equitable literacy um, through this framework, elements of the framework, key tenets of the framework uh, that connects to their own instructional focus at each of their individual schools. So really looking at the overall strategy of the district and what's happening on the ground in each of their 15 unique school communities and kind of using uh, the elements of deeper learning as that glue so when you look at someone like me who's working with 11 school community or 15 school communities, um, it's, it's helping me see that common through line between every single one of our school leaders as we plan to move this work forward. Uh, the, the PD has been uh, going on since uh, uh, August was our first one. We actually took a little pause in uh, February, uh, sorry, uh, January, and we're continuing to pause in, in February because of everything that's happening in our schools. Uh, but we are going to be back on actually in mid-February through the end of the year with our, our regularly scheduled professional development sessions. And the last thing I want to point out, it, like one of the key things is I want to align it to uh, our, our strategic plan. Uh, so in, in some of the documents I have, I could share with you, uh, this work is specifically aligned with 12 of our strategic commitments. Um, so I'd love to share with you uh, at some point. 
Thank you. I hope at some point you'll be able to come back and, and give us a fuller update on what's going on in the network and how it can also help other schools in the district. Thank of you. Course. Of yeah. course. Yeah, Mr. Tran, thank you. Uh, yes. Um, uh, could someone uh, speak about a little bit about the uh, teacher diversification pilot program and the um, the uh, Boston bullying prevention? I, I, I like to know a little bit about those two. Um, you know, I understand it's within the purview of, of of the administration, but you know, just the the the, the synopsis of, uh, of of those two programs. Uh, if Dr. Granson is on, I'm sure he could speak to that. Um, Dr. Granson, are you on? If not, I can take a stab at it. Uh, I'm on, and I was going to actually ask uh, Serendelli to um, speak to it if we can allow her to. <clears throat> but, Superintendent, do you have it? Is Saren on? She is. She just needs to be elevated. Okay, well, I can introduce it. So it's a grant that's um, to support our MTEL program. Uh, as you know, some of our teachers need support with their licensure. And so this provides staff stipends for our MTEL support. We also have an incredible teacher cadet program that reaches down uh, into our high school students um, and, and um, helps to kind of grow our own. Uh, teachers, and that is for staff stipends, speakers, uh, giving college tours, um, internships, also uh, recruitment um, so that we can do hiring bonuses and stipends um, with this grant. And it helps us with um, some of our indirect costs on uh, Saren's team in order to make sure that we're able to promote these programs, provide the support, um, and help, help our educators become um, uh, licensed with their bilingual endorsement, their SEI endorsement. Um, and this is a way for us to be able to retain our teachers, some of those who are on emergency license, as well as uh, recruit uh, current teachers and grow your own. I don't know if Saren wants to add to that. Uh, I she's really I think you did a wonderful job in presenting the work. Um, to, to be clear, this is a way for us to continue our support especially as we are considering the potential staffing shortages, we'll be innovating with our current programming and also collaborating with the Office of English Learners to also support the increase of the ESL and bilingual education. So yes. The uh, bullying program is that, is that is that money going to support any kind of uh, uh, work yeah. within the, the, the <laughs> you know, within the... the um... Also very excited about this grant, uh, Mr. Tron. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, I think I've shared before that my son uh, was severely bullied in grade three, um, and it really has impacted his entire life. Uh, and so this is something that I take really seriously. And um, having this grant works with our Succeed Boston under Do Jody LG's um, leadership. And it's to increase awareness around safe space and bullying prevention. Um, we have a hotline for students and we wanna make sure that they're able to um, you know, uh, have this uh, accessible to them and that they know about this. It also is to evaluate the effectiveness of their Saturdays uh, for Success program that they have, um, which is about helping students around bullying and um, at helping with the dynamics of those who are targets of um, bullying and the impact that it has on bystanders. And then um, also some specific uh, support for LGBTQ students um, and um, making sure that there's awareness around, around uh, the supporting of our students who come from very diverse uh, backgrounds. Thank pretty, you. Pretty soon you'll also be seeing from the Division of Equity, their 24-7 uh, 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 curriculum coming out, um, which is a award-winning curriculum around uh, anti-bullying that we're very proud of. 
Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If there are no further questions, I'll enter a motion to approve to approve the grants as presented. Is there a motion? Oops, excuse me. Dr. Alkins, you have another question? Yeah, sorry. It was just a follow-up to the, the teacher diversification grant. Um, uh, it, within the grant, it said that there were 45 pre-service teachers um, that were that are going to be helped like through this program. Is there a breakdown between like elementary, high school? Um, and of course, that breakdown extends to the, the 28 committed hire, new hires that uh, the grant proposes. Is there a breakdown of like high school versus elementary school or? Yes, it is a breakdown. Um, Dr. Higgins, this particular grant is we grow our own. So we have developed um, individuals that are coming to us either currently as paraprofessionals or moving through the system, um, coming from the outside in, and they're choosing a K-12 experience. So yes, we will be supporting them as they develop their, their professional growth and, in areas of K all the way from elementary, um, I'm sorry, K-0 all the way to 12th grade. I guess I was asking more if there is a intended ratio of like focus on oh. high school versus elementary, like within that. The focus is not so much on the K-12 and um, either elementary or high school. Our mm -hmm. interest is making sure that there's a double certification. So it's more of an ESL or special ed education complement to the K-0, K-3, K-0 to middle school or high school experience. So it's more of a second cert certification versus a directed focus on a particular grade level. Okay. And I would love to share more with you. I know you've worked with a colleague of ours. I'd love to share a lot of the work that we're doing in our pipeline programs. I believe it complements well with your own professional interests. And we're all really excited about the work we'll be doing uh, with our ESSER funding too in the Office of Recruitment and Cultivation and our, our staffing initiative that we're doing right now to try to get more um, folks in the front door, as I said in my uh, opening remarks in the superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Okay, if there are no for if there are no further questions, I will entertain a motion to approve the grants as presented. Sarah, a motion. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Hearing none, Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cardet Hernandez? I'm going to abstain. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. The grants are approved with six yeas and one abstention. Thank you. Our next action item is the revised code of conduct. You will recall that the superintendent first presented this revision to the committee last September, then presented it at our January 12th meeting as part of her Office of Safety Service update. At this time, I'd like to invite the superintendent to offer final comments. Oh, on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I know that several members may have not been here for uh, the presentation. We uh, took a lot of time to revise the code of conduct. Um, our um, wonderful staff had many, many meetings with many stakeholders uh, throughout, uh, I think an 18 month period to revise the code of conduct. And um, we've presented it uh, two times now uh, with some revisions. And um, I look forward to being able to implement this and have the clear expectations in all of our schools so that we can, um, ensure that our schools are safe and that we are focusing on the um, core values that we have around our code, um, which is restorative justice and making sure that we support our students um, as they go through their day. So thank you. 
Thank you. I'll now open it up to the committee for any final questions or comments. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Tran. Yes. Uh, last meeting, I have a couple of questions uh, regarding the the the, uh, the new code of conduct. I I I would like to reiterate those again. Uh, first of all, within the the uh, the uh, presentation last time, the just two basic questions. First of all, how, how are you? uh now where are you standing now regarding diversification of hiring um last time i heard there was no asian at all that's <laughs> given the number of, uh, of 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 students within the 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 the, uh, the, the school uh, the schools uh, how how much progress have you been making in regard to that the second question is um which is more important to me uh is uh the fact that within the the job functions that you listed and the kind of training the uh the employees of that body uh will receive aside from all the essential trainings regarding the the, the job function the job duty I still have concern regarding uh, the lack of any kind of ancillary ancillary uh, training in terms of diversity, in terms of uh, understanding the basic uh, uh, differences between the cultures, dealing with the, the, the you know the the, uh, the, the uh, diversity of students. Those are my two questions. I like I like an update on those. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Tran. I think, were you speaking of the um, diversity hiring? If you were speaking of the diversity yes. hiring, I would be glad to have the staff provide a more detailed um, response to your questions that you've just asked. Okay, yes. Thank you, thank you Mr. Tran. And and the second question, I, I you know the, the the regarding the lack of ancillary training aside from uh, training um, the 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 security specialist for lack of better term, I, I don't remember. Oh, I see. I see. You're asking about the training um, from our safety services side. Right. Okay. I thought you were talking about Miss Daly's um, presentation and our hiring around our recruitment side. Um, I will have um, Chief Copley Grice. Uh, respond to you. I know that when she was speaking last time, she said that one of her focus would be to diversify. And we had 20 uh, safety officers that we have recently um, allocated to her division. Um, she said she was committed to uh, seeking out and, and finding more diverse candidates. I will get you an update on where she's at with that. And the, oh, I see, I see Ms. Coakley Bryce just uh, popped on and um, and the recruitment efforts that she's using in order to increase her diversity and then also the cultural profici proficiency training that her um, officers are getting. Yes, okay. That's that's a little unrelated to the code of conduct, but um, we're, we're happy to provide that information to you. I can just give a quick um, update, uh, Super. Um, we've hired um, about, um, 15 candidates, uh, three candidates um, didn't accept the offer. Um, so I'm onboarding 12 candidates right now. Um, still, unfortunately, I do not have an Asian um, an, a specialist who represents um, for the ethnicity of, of Asian, but we have been um, aggressively recruiting. I've reached out to some of my partners, my community partners throughout um, a number of different community um, organizations. And when we open up our next um, opportunity to hire, because I'm going to be hiring um, hopefully up to 20, um, we will hopefully have a representation um, um, to that. Um, so just understand that we're definitely um, I'm looking to make that a priority. Um, um, for the training, we're um, in the process of putting together 
um, and extensive training modules um, for the specialists um, as soon as the um, uh, February break will be um, have at least 20 specialists involved in the safety care training, um, which is um, the de-escalation training for Boston Public Schools. We will also, also have um, about seven to eight more training um, on the restorative justice um, training for um, the specialists. We will also have about, I believe, three to four um, train the trainers for safety care as well. Um, so we're, we're continuing to build our um, platform for training. Um, my, my officers are specialists. When they were officers, they'd already had, um, all of them are first responders. All of them have had defensive um, hands-off tactics. All of them had had domestic terrorism training, which helps us with our emergency response. All of them have had explicit bias training. All of them have had longevity in law enforcement, which helps deal with mental health and dealing with, which also, um, initiated our best clinician um, with BPD. All of them have also had to respond to paramedics in similar emergencies, and all of them have had legal updates to include juvenile, um, juvenile justice um, um, updates. And we're looking at partnering with um, the Juvenile Justice Center to um, do some, um, some additional training on like Know Your Rights. Um, when I was with BPD, we, used, we did an extensive program with young people out of the YMCA, and I'm hoping on instilling that program again, that training. And if I could, and if I could just add also, um, we are still um, developing our um, training with the uh, safety specialists regarding um, interacting with students with disabilities, our nonverbal students, our signing, um, and we're developing that still, so that's under development also. Absolutely. I was just speaking to some of my specialists the other day, and they were saying that they wanted to do an extensive training um, on sign language. So I'm looking for an opportunity to do that as well. Thank you, Chief Gokley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prang. Mr. Carter, Carter Hernandez. Hello. Am I, I'm not muted. I'm so proud of myself. All right. So my question, uh, Superintendent, I'm curious two things. One, can you walk us through the engagement that you did around this code of conduct? I understand that there is a history here that predates me, but for all of us who are learning, and I'm curious if there were students engaged in this. And second, what um, is your goal around revisions here? So how often do you want to see this updated? Um, as a tool. Great. And uh, Mr. DePina, I don't know if Ms. Campbell's on um, and can speak to the engagement. Um, I know it was extensive or if you want to update. Uh, I can start and I know she's on, but we did extensive engagement. Yes, it did. Yes, it did include students, um, parents, stakeholders, um, school-based staff, school administrators, central office folks. Um, and I'll turn it over to Stacey um, Campbell to continue to further engage with our code of conduct and other members. She need to be brought she into. May, she may need to be elevated, but to answer your question um, briefly, um, we did do extensive engagement over in this code of conduct, um, just for contextual purposes. We started updating the code of conduct on a cycle of every couple of years, um, but because of COVID, it delayed us in um, implementing it sooner, uh, and that gave us time to do more engagement as well. So um, it's been a period of about over maybe two and a half years at this point with this particular code. Um, and um, we're going to continue to work with our partners as we, as soon as we, if this gets passed this evening, the goal is to immediately contact our, our partners and check in with them about our next steps, which, which are centered around uh, developing the training, doing some more translation of materials, preparing, preparing uh, PD materials, and our Code of Conduct Advisory Council is who we rely on real heavily is our main um, um, external partners, who's a group of representative of parents, students, um, advocates, uh, attorneys, and they uh, help us inform us uh, on the work that we do go, like ahead on a regular basis. So we'll be engaging with them throughout the process. I see Dacia is um, promoted now on the panel. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think Mr. DePina answered. I think there was another question. I apologize. The other question was about the goal of the review and 
what we were looking for, which were the, you know, kind of the big chunks that we were looking to change within the code. So the goal in terms of the cadence of review is um, every couple of years. Um, I don't think we have a specific time period. Every year we uh, convene um, stakeholders to engage to see if we want to review. Um, it's been about, I believe the last review was 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so I know that uh, immediately after this, um, proceedings will re-engage COCAC and start uh, working on the two big chunks in terms of uh, restorative justice um, and the, the equity, um, uh, the, uh, the planning tool, and just in terms of how we'll move forward in the future with those two pieces. I know next um, after this uh, proceedings, um, we'll continue to look at um, the, uh, the policy, um, excuse me, the, um, the circular and all the companion pieces that go with it. And if I could just add to more specifically, the goal was to also shorten the code of conduct because the code of conduct was also um, very lengthy in terms of policy and implementation strategies as well. So we simplified it. We also um, made it um, updated and up aligned it to a GBLS agreement that we had that required um, minimal, no suspensions for K-0 to two students, um, restricted the uh, number of reasons why students in grades three through five can be suspended as well, um, increased uh, you know, restorative justice information, uh, updated our um, civil rights violations and turned those to bias-based conduct. So it just basically updated um, the code and shortened it and made it more policy related versus policy and implementation related. That's also helpful. And thank you for that, Deputy Zapina. I, I apologize for that. And also just made it to, uh, more user friendly or more reader friendly as well. Um, we took out a lot of the legal ease. That was a big part of it. Um, and just pared it down and moved, uh, made it, again, uh, Deputy Zapina talked about it's more of a policy document and moved the implementation over to the circular. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. LaPera. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess this is a follow-up for uh, Ms. Campbell. Um, I know that one of the pieces that you mentioned just recently, just now, and also um, when this was presented back in October is the engagement with the Code of Conduct Advisory Council. Um, I know that when they, they testified at that meeting, there were some concerns. And so um, have any of those um, concerns been addressed or are we looking to potentially address those concerns moving into a potential reiteration as you all continue your work with them? I guess just a status update on, on what those conversations have been since that. Since that um, presentation in September, we did re-engage with them a few times. The two outstanding issues were restorative justice and our use of it. And the other piece was the implement, the use of the racial, um, the equity uh, tool, uh, that piece of it. And so we do feel that we have a plan moving forward. Um, we, in terms of uh, working with um, Dr. Uh, Granson's office um, so that we could mutually agree on in the future, how we're to use that tool. I think that was the issue, not so much we didn't use it, we didn't have a, an agreement on how to use it. And so that is the plan moving forward. Um, and just a, a commitment to and a plan um, to expand our use of RJ. Um, we've always been committed to using it. So I think we really, um, when we spoke with that, um, that body, um, it was my understanding that they, they did not have an objection so long as, you know, that we were committed to using both of those. Uh, we were committed to those two actions um, and we're committed to both of those actions. And if I could add, Mr. Pira, um, historically, when we've engaged in this process with COCAC and other members of the community, we always uh, made it a point to listen and hear the feedback from the um, receivers of the code and the users of the code. And um, at times we agree uh, on most, uh, most of the changes philosophically, um, but sometimes how we implement it, there are some disagreements. So for the most part, we tend to agree but we always uh, took the time and care to document where we disagreed and why and continue those conversations based on those notes going forward. So we have a, always have a starting place to move forward. So um, we'll continue to do that. And um, I'm happy to report that we've agreed on a lot of um, items in this code, uh, as you will see, um, but there's always areas where we know we can't have 100% agreement, but we, um, 
we have identified those areas and we'll be working hard to, to work with them on them going forward. Appreciate that context. Thank you very much. Uh, I could just quickly add um, that I've had extensive conversations with members of COCAC uh, about the implementation uh, and use of the race regular planning tool um, for this process. And I think um, a lot of the concern was around um, just the timing um, and the amount of time that we are able to invest in uh, use of the tool and, and creating an equity analysis. And so what I assure them uh, is that as we implement uh, and moving forward, that analysis can continue to be done. Um, but I think a, a part of the concern is um, the depth um, of the analysis. Um, and so I think that's a part of our ongoing work with the, with the COCAC group. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Granson. And thank you, Deputy DePina and Ms. Campbell. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments? Making a comment here. I think okay. this will not hold um, the, the, you know, this doesn't stop anywhere that we're going, but I do think for the public, it is helpful to know the cadence that this is updated. Um, and I hear folks saying every few years, but I think, you know, as a parent, like I just want to know sort of the hard and the short, the long and the short. Um, so I appreciate just, that, I appreciate that uh, Mr. Cardet Hernandez. Um, that is one of the things that um, Ms. Robinson and Mr. O'Neill and I talk about regularly is about our policies and just having our policies up regularly updated, audited, go through the racial equity planning tool, go through our um, OAG task force so that they're reviewing them on a regular review. It's in the policy when it's going to be reviewed. This is work just not just with this one policy, but with all of our policies that need to be done. Um, I was very surprised when I first came here that there's, I wasn't just handed a policy book. Um, I know that our staff is working um, diligently in the, um, the school committee office to index all of the policies that we have along with the superintendent circulars so that they can be transparent and accessible to our families and to the public. Um, and that work is ongoing and looking forward for that to be completed and maybe we could get an update, Madam Chair, on, on where we're headed with that um, for the future. Great, thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Yeah, if I may just say, uh, first of all, thank you, um, Ms. Lopera, for asking the questions about the Code of Conduct Committee, because I was going to go there. I'm not going to follow down that path since you did it, but particularly for our, our newer members, um, this has been an ongoing issue for years, and where the district has evolved on Code of Conduct is like years ahead of where it was, and we have worked very closely with the Code of Conduct Committee, as we do with our um, English language learners task force on English language learning issues, et cetera, with the opportunity achievement gap task force on those issues. Um, so when the code of conduct committee, which is not an official task force of the school committee, it's actually more of a group of the district and, and school committee outside experts, really, really helpful folks. We take very seriously when they speak to this and when they expressed concerns last fall at some of the changes, the school committee did turn back to the district and say, spend more time digging in on this. So hearing Ms. Campbell talk about those meetings and Dr. Granson and Mr. DePina and what their thoughts were and what their concerns were um, is important. And you know, in particular, Ms. Campbell, how you talked about they wanted to make sure there's a commitment to restorative justice. That has worked really well in our schools. And, and I'm sure Ms. Mercer would have some thoughts on that as well. Um, and, and for the newer members, we do have a number of schools that have autonomy, right? The pilot schools, et cetera, the innovation schools, and, and, and in particular, our in-district charters, when they come to us for their renewals, which they have to do um, every couple of years, this body has made a practice the past few years of asking them where they stand on some of the areas that they are allowed to be autonomous. And one of them is particularly the code of conduct. And so just to help you with the historical context on this, several of our in-district charters in particular want to have their own code of conduct. 
and they finally heard loud and clear from this committee that this is as much as we respect autonomy, this was one particular issue we felt we should speak as one district and students should understand. BSAC did so much work putting together an app so students could understand uh, what their rights were under the code of conduct. And um, so this, this will be a subject you will see come up a number of times over the years. It is living and breathing, it does adapt. COCAC will come back to us with additional thoughts. We will learn, particularly as our students are now coming back much more in person after year remote and, and dealing with those implications. Um, I think we'll probably, I would anticipate we'll probably have another update to this in a year or two years as we have learned um, going through this period. But I just wanted to assure you, this is, um, this is uh, a living, breathing document that is really important to our students and to our teachers and school leaders, by the way, as well. Um, and I, I would anticipate this would continue to evolve and adapt. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. I would, I would just add that our school leaders really depend on this um, as a guide for um, equity for how they treat um, incidents that happen at the school and how they um, intervene and support students and um, the tools that they have for working through really sometimes very difficult situations. And when you don't have the expectations, then that's when you risk um, having an equitable approach to how you work through when there's a violation of the code. So I uh, thank you for your support. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Uh, if, if there are no further questions, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the revised code of conduct as presented. Is there a motion? Can I just make a quick comment real quick? Oh, certainly. Go ahead. Yes. I just wanted to say thank you for updating us on the code of conduct and thank you for listening. For, to us, especially the students' voices, because again, this is something that is going to impact us throughout our years of being in school. It reflects on our transcripts, on everything we do, it's going to follow us. And if it's not something that can actually accurately like represent us students and something that is always, what's the word? Something that's always there as a stickler in a way to kind of go against us, it, it feels unfair as if you don't want to be in school, as if you don't think you can actually make it. And as a student that did have a bad report when I was younger, I'm grateful for the re re revision of this um, code of conduct. On behalf of all students, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So again, if there are no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve revised code of conduct as presented. Is I there a motion? Oh, excuse me. Dr. Alkins, do you have a question? Just, an, just another reminder, when okay. would we receive an updated analysis from the racial equity planning tool use again? Um, as we, um, let me, I, I gotta say this before I answer your question. The, once the policy is approved and voted on, the uh, immediate steps that we feel are necessary at this time are to begin to um, start educating people and updating the rest of the attachments that go with the code and updating the policies, the implementation circular that goes with the code and do some training for staff and students and families on the code, the changes, <clears throat> how to utilize the code, et cetera. Um, once we do that, simultaneously, we'll have initial conversation with our partners to map out a timeline and strategy of how we will begin engaging them in the revision. So once we sit down with them, as we balance the training and implementation, um, we'll be able to give you a better update once we have initial conversation and some follow-up conversation, how we will map out the work of the next set of revisions, if that makes sense. Okay. Again, oops, okay. Mr. Carter Hernandez. My final comment. Um, okay. Superintendent, I want to say I know your team took um, what sounded like a, a really valiant effort to to sort of reduce the edu speak 
within the document. And I think it's exemplar. And I'm specifically thinking about the way that the team is describing um, the work with students with disabilities in section 12 around MDRs and the manifestation of disabilities in suspensions. I think it is it would be easy for a parent to understand and also for a young person with a disability to know their rights as well. So I just wanted to make sure that was noted. Thank you. I know that the team worked really hard on it. And it is the most progressive, I said this last time, it's the most progressive policy, code of conduct policy that I've ever worked in within 32 years of my career. Um, you know, you think back in the late 80s or 90s when they were doing zero tolerance policies, um, mm -hmm. you know, and we've come a long way of working with children and their families in um, restorative justice, and therapeutic settings for students and um, different ways to intervene earlier with students to give them the support they need so that they can stay in school. And Daisy, I'm wondering um, if you're still on. Um, yes. I know Zyra was talking about, you know, that discipline is um, follow, follows them and is on their transcript. Um, I don't know the details here in, in Massachusetts, but in Minnesota, we don't we don't uh, have that follow and, and it's not transcripted. That is correct, Superintendent. Okay. We do not release to um, to uh, colleges into military. Okay, great. I wanted to make sure that that's the case. Okay. Are there any other final comments? I only have one more. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and that is that I'm like super proud of the work that we did last summer that doesn't get enough attention around data privacy for, for our students. And that policy was a huge achievement and it's related to the code of conduct and just what we will and will not share about students. And so I just wanna make note to that. Okay. Thank you, Superintendent. Mr. Tron. Oh, just a very quick, quick uh, request. If um, I know we're gonna vote on this today, but um, subsequent to uh, today's vote, I'd like to have some you know, some uh, empirical data on, let's say, you know, within the limit of about three, five years, uh, um, you know, three to five years, uh, last years, about restor uh, about the, 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 su the success of restorative uh, practice within the Boston Public School. If I can like, have that, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. I'll ask the team about that. Okay. One final time. <laughs> there any final, final comments? Okay, if there are no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve the revised code of conduct as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cardet Hernandez? Yes. I'm sorry, that was a yes? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Polanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Thank you. The motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. Our first and only report this evening is a 7 to 12 high school redesign update. I will now turn it over to our superintendent, Brenda Caselius. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think in my superintendent comments, I framed it pretty well. Um, and I'm really excited to have you hear from Corey Harris, our chief of schools, and also Dr. Eccleson, um, deputy of academics. Thank you, superintendent. If it's okay, I'll get started. Um, I think it's always important to begin with telling the audience what your story is going to be about. 
And the story that um, Chief Harris and I will share this evening, I think has three components to it. Um, the first is to share a historical and current analysis of what we've done as a system to prepare ourselves for this day around implementation of seven to 12 high school redesign. It also shares a future look of what we anticipate uh, will happen as a result of the efforts that we're putting in today and beyond um, to describe in really clear ways what should be true for all high school and secondary students across the Boston Public Schools. I think we're trying very clearly to put the stake in the ground, to be clear to our families uh, about what they can expect from the Boston Public Schools, and also uh, in an effort to hold ourselves accountable as a system to ensure that we deliver on those commitments and promises. The second thing that I hope will be clear as a result of this presentation um, is how the district plans to intervene, um, particularly when we identify that we are not meeting the expectations that we've communicated to our community. And that when we intervene, it's essential that we do that in partnership with community rather than to community. The third um, point that I hope becomes clear toward the end of the presentation is the way that the academic strategy and our vision for what teaching and learning ought to look like across the system, how that work drives decisions that we're making relative to facilities and buildings. There is no question to the superintendent's earlier points in her report that structural things like facilities are essential uh, to our work around redesign and improve and, and, and delivering on the promises we've made to this community. But so too is it important that we center teaching and learning in that work. So I wanna begin um, and teen up um, ultimately, um, Chief Harris will present next um, by sharing a little bit about um, some of the quality guarantees uh, that are important to this work. It undergirds everything that we're trying to do. And so on the next slide, uh, it will share some of the key principles on slide three um, that um, underpin the quality guarantees. If you're interested in seeing a more sort of detailed look at this, slides 24 and 25 um, operationalize these sort of key principles that you see on slide three here. But the quality guarantees are trying to communicate in clear ways to our community what every family and every student can expect as it relates to their academic opportunities, particularly high quality, ethnically and culturally responsive curriculum, instruction and career pathways, what they can expect from the perspective of enrichment, what access do students, irrespective of their school, have to things like fine and performing arts, to sports, to student government, and safe places to go for before and after school. That they have high quality opportunities for facilities, including access to 21st century buildings, would, would have to provide access to things like science labs, technology, common learning spaces or libraries, gymnasiums and performance spaces, as well as opportunities to receive additional support and for green spaces at their school. And finally, the last category that you'll see in the quality guarantees is that every, every student and every family should expect that they're going to receive um, supports and resources uh, so that our communities can thrive and access all of the opportunities that should be afforded across the BPS. So to be clear, this quality guaranteed uh, document, and these are the key principles and the slides that sort of go into more detail about that are in the appendix on slides 24 and 25 are really at the center of what we're trying to accomplish uh, across the BPS, but particularly in this context for students across grades seven to 12. Next slide, please. The other foundational um, uh, sort of set of, of, of key practices that we're, that we're implementing and setting the context for are two really important set of practices um, that we that the superintendent sort of teed up I think, quite well in her earlier report. And I'll get into more detail about this in, in a moment. But at its, at its core, we expect that all students have access to universal graduation requirements, 
that this school committee adopted in May of 2021. And the Mass Corps, uh, in partnership with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, lays out the sequence of courses that students should take in order to graduate from the Boston Public Schools or any school in the Commonwealth, college and career ready. And the BPS boldly adopted those as a policy based on the uh, courageous action of the school committee. And beginning with this next year's incoming ninth grade class, this policy will go, to, go into effect. And I'll talk a little bit about the, um, what, what families might be able to expect uh, as a result of this policy. The other sort of undergirding um, practices, set of practices here that, are, that should be um, expected across BPS schools are opportunities for inclusion, as well as to our earlier conversation around native language um, literacy and native, native language instruction. We know that we have significant work to do on both of these fronts, uh, but we have been working to set a foundation to move in that direction. I'll show some data to, to demonstrate that. Um, and also to provide the infrastructure, particularly uh, for both inclusion and for native language instruction uh, for many years to come. And that while those, those things are the core, mass core instructional uh, inclusionary practices and native language instruction, there are also other levers that school communities can push uh, to help um, enrich the opportunities that are available to students beyond those three things. This includes opportunities across the BPS for pre-AP classes in the, in the junior, year, uh, junior high school and middle school year grades, as well as advanced placement opportunities for students in high school. We're continuing to build opportunities uh, for IB options, not only in grades seven to 12, but have plans to build IB programs in the younger years that can feed into our secondary IB schools. Students should have opportunities for early college and dual enrollment in, sec uh, in, in college um, environments that help prepare them for the demands of college. And our schools across the system should provide career and technical programs and pathways and opportunities for them to explore uh, different career options. Um, even if they decide not to pursue those things as, as formal careers, but they should have opportunities, for example, to take classes in culinary arts. And so we wanna make sure that at the core, we're providing access to mass core, inclusionary practices and native language uh, literacy in every school across the BPS and then pulling on some of these four levers above to ensure that we are providing all of our students a world-class education and opportunities um, to prepare them for the demands of college and career. Next slide. Now, this provides an, an outline that has been shared previously with the school committee, but we think in concrete ways, it provides um, a nice visual of what this might look like. Um, and so you'll see uh, in each sort of color code what a sequence of courses might look like for specific content areas. In blue, for example, you see the sequence of courses that a student might take in, in English language arts, beginning in uh, grade seven, all the way up to grade 12. And when students follow this sequence, they have an opportunity in grade 12 to potentially take AP language or AP lit um, in, in potentially their senior year. You also see the sequence of courses in pink, I think that is, um, for mathematics. You can see the sequence of courses and how that leads up to an opportunity for students to take uh, multiple AP classes, including AP calculus, AP stats, AP computer science. Um, but it's really important that students have that fundamental opportunity in grade seven to grade eight to grade nine to ensure that they get on that path toward AP classes. I won't go through all of these content areas, but you can see the sort of sequence of courses. You'll note in our um, mass core policy that it requires access to an ethnic studies class. Right now in that sequence of courses, that would be the 11th grade offering in history and social studies. And there are opportunities for electives for students to pursue um, access to different pathways. 
Many of our schools, for example, have a partnership with Harvard Medical School. Uh, so our students have opportunities to go on campus at Harvard Medical School to extend their, uh, their learning in biomedical science, for example, uh, in real laboratory settings with faculty and students from Harvard Medical School. Uh, but students will choose different pathways, different electives uh, based on what they're interested in. Um, and we believe that this should be part of a well-rounded education for all students across the seven to 12. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this takes a look at where we are and where we've been relative to inclusive opportunities at high school. Um, to be quite honest, uh, we have not been delivering on a promise in the way that we should relative to inclusive practices based on our history. Uh, but as we've been doing work in the primary years to um, offer increased opportunities for inclusion and in decreasing the number of, of students in substantially separate placements, those numbers continue to grow. Next year's cohort will have the largest numbers of grade nine students entering into inclusion seats, and those numbers will continue to increase based on our projections um, over the next few years. Next slide, please. Uh, this takes a look at um, opportunities and um, sort of context that the Office of the English Language Learners have set up to ensure that we're expanding opportunities for our multilingual learners. Uh, we have been continuing to collaborate. Uh, the uh, department has continued to collaborate uh, with our school leaders through the budget collaborative process to ensure that our educators have the appropriate teacher qualifications and staffing for our multilingual learners. It's been very important to me as a superintendent mentioned earlier in her report, as the leader of the academics team, that we're fully following through on the spirit of the Department of Justice uh, a consent decree with the district um, and continuing to take responsibility for the work that we need to do as a system to provide um, the resources and the opportunities that our multilingual learners are entitled to. We're continuing to build our, our infrastructure to ensure that we have educators who are fully endorsed and qualified um, to teach in, in native language um, classes. We piloted um, through the work uh, that Saren Daly was describing earlier. We've piloted a new program that leads to certification the, uh, for bilingual education endorsement. And we have a pathway um, that is currently enrolling 15 educators. There are opportunities as Sarah and Daly mentioned earlier for us to increase and continue to prioritize that work. We have recently um, uh, continued uh, a partnership with our career vocational technical educators um, to ensure that those educators are fully trained in the, um, the retail courses that ensure that they have the knowledge and skills to provide access for our multilingual learners. And we continue to build capacity um, and um, have Im important plans to build off of the, the, the dual language programs that we're offering, the heritage language programs that we're offering to, to prepare many of our students to graduate from the Boston Public Schools um, with the very competitive seal of biliteracy. Um, this, the seal of biliteracy provides um, a sign to both college admissions as well as to, to employers um, that students are coming with a set of knowledge and skills that are valu very valu valuable both at the college space as well as um, in the employment space. And we want to make sure that we leverage the strength and assets that so many of our students bring and that they have an opportunity to reach the seal and to demonstrate that set of knowledge and skills. Next slide. Um, this is the work that we've been doing um, to prepare um, to ensure that we have um, existing partnerships uh, with many of the colleges um, who may um, offer opportunities around early college and dual enrollment. It's a sort of multi-year and multi-phase uh, project um, that includes starting with some foundational year, which is to start to build um, relationships between schools and individual organizations of higher education so that things like um, early college and dual enrollment can be offered and to identify what schools need to understand to fully prepare for the early college principles. Then it takes a year of planning to understand and identify what pathways families and students are really interested in 
in dem and in building out a, a, a partnership with that specific school around a, a, an academic uh, pathway, such as something like biomedical sciences. We have to create a formal plan in partnership with that with that college or university, and then receive um, formal DESE designation as an early college partnership. Um, over the last five years, BPS has expanded and launched more than 15 career pathway programs, and we continue to expand the college and career pathways across 14 BPS secondary schools with 27 unique industry areas represented. So when the superintendent sort of ends her, ended her comments, she talked a lot about, in so many ways, we're operating from a position of strength, and I think that that's true. We have really rich partnerships um, across the city, and it's very important that we leverage those partnerships to ensure that our students are getting access to high quality opportunities that really are, can be game changing for their academic, in, uh, uh, academic credentials and academic career. Um, next slide, please. Um, and it's also important, and I know that we have work to do in this area, but we have to make sure that we respond to the individual needs of all of our students. And so within the context of the portfolio, which I think will always um, have space uh, for um, alternative type schools, um, it's important that we look not only, uh, to, not only that we have within the context of the portfolio, alternative education options for BPS students, but in some ways that we're also thinking about alternative um, ed programs within the context of BPS schools. So there are multiple pathways for students to enroll in these types of programs. Um, and I think we need to continue to use the racial equity planning tool um, and other resources available to us to take a, a, take a really close look in partnership with these communities about how, how we're best serving students who need these types of educational options. Next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, um, Corey Harris, who's gonna uh, talk a little bit about the work we've done over the last few years in phase one um, to begin to build off of some of this sort of contextual work um, to really put some of this in action. Thanks, Drew. Uh, before I jump into phase one, uh, we have a pretty robust presentation. So I wanted to give um, Chairperson Robinson and the superintendent an opportunity to maybe discuss if they want to jump into questions now or if they want to hold for or to this next uh, this next piece of the presentation. No, I recognize too that it's a pretty significant presentation and wanted to make sure that if members had any questions, we could chunk it versus waiting till the very end. So I don't know if anybody has any burning questions they wanna ask right now or whether we should just continue to move on. Lorena? Sorry, Ms. LaPera. <laughs> I, I do the same thing, Chairwoman. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think you've opened up a can of worms. I do have a couple of questions, um, but I will be mindful. Um, so I think for me, the, the one piece that I'm trying to conceptualize is we're talking about a significant shift as we um, get all of our high schools uh, to be in alignment for um, the mass core requirement. Um, have we as a district done an audit to understand where each school currently is in terms of its ability to meet that um, requirement? That's my first question. Yeah, we have. We've done an audit in partnership with Mass Insight across the entire BPS. Um, also, as part of budget collaboratives this year, we had um, a pre-academic collaborative with every uh, secondary high school and members of the academic team to ensure that they were ready um, for uh, implementation of this for incoming ninth graders, walk through their different sort of organizational structure, walk through how they were going to design their school, how they were going to work to ensure um, that we were ready to implement for the incoming ninth grade students. And we feel very confident that we're ready to do that based on that audit and the preparation. The other thing that I will just mention to this is that the superintendent has made a very bold decision to invest in ninth grade counselors for next year. So the moment that students enter and transition into grade nine, um, part of their core work is going to be to ensure that there's an academic plan that begins to work with the individual student and um, 
the student's family, his, her, their sort of teachers and educators um, to ensure that there's a clear pathway toward meeting all of the expectations of Mass Core. Doesn't mean that those changes, that those courses won't change, right? So the way that a student might be thinking about um, his, her, or their sort of pathways from in ninth grade um, in their junior year may change, but um, being very clear around what's going to, what it's going to, to take to ensure that they graduate meeting that, um, meeting that plan. Now, I think there's some work to do, for example, I think um, I had an interview with a, um, or a set of exchanges with a, a Boston Globe reporter around our readiness and ethnic studies. I think there's some still um, significant work to do, but we have time to ensure um, that we do that, but we appear um, quite primed and ready to fully implement next school year. One thing I think that uh, Ms. LaPera that I just wanna clarify is that we are planning a phase in. So it, the mass course starts with this year's ninth graders or next year's ninth graders. And so that gives us the time to continue to prayer, prepare and develop courses and provide the professional development. Also, I think one of the things that eluded the passage of the mass core previously and why there wasn't a lot of support from the high school school leaders um, was because there was never the funding behind it to support and, and this audit that needed to happen. So that was part of the presentation prior to the passage of the policy. We had okay. to commit as, as a school committee that we would have the resources behind it in order to implement the policy well. And so we put together this academic collab process, this academic process with our finance team to look at every um, school individually and what they needed to be able to implement the mass core. And then we've funded it in next year's budget. So um, that's great. And I think incredibly helpful. Um, and I'll go back and um, see if I can find the information on, um, look up the information for that meeting when that vote was taken. We can, uh, get, the, we can get that to you. <laughs> thank you. The other piece that um, is related is, I think that it's a it's an ambitious and really I think a vision we should be working towards as you're talking about like the core four and the mass um, core. Um, it also is a pretty significant shift in terms of investment, and so given where some of our schools are with their enrollment numbers currently, I I'd like to see what what those budget numbers would look like. Um, and perhaps in comparison, do we currently have a school that is close to already being able to be, I guess, uh, fully implementing or as close to fully implementing some of these pieces um, that we're visioning for and what, what the cost structure looks like there and are there already any gaps that we see um, I'm not sure if I'm making myself clear, but I, I want to understand what the financial we, implications are. Yep. Yeah, and we had that, we have that presentation in the first high school presentation for the mass core, okay. showing where those gaps are and how many each, how many, what percentage of um, students are meeting the mass core requirements at each high school. So we do have that data and we can make sure we send that around to you so that everybody has that um, available to them. Perfect. That is what I have for now. Um, I'll, I will stop asking questions for the moment. One more thing is that, um, you know, our recommendation around the counselors is one to 250 for the high school, but at ninth grade, we will be lowering that to one to 150 in our recommendation, because we think that our ninth graders are gonna need a li little extra attention given the recovery. And this is a re was a request of the chair several times about our middle school students are gonna be going in and they're gonna be taking this harder uh, course taking and they're gonna to need to have some uh, support along the way. So this is in response to what the chair was requesting. Does anyone else have a question? I see Mr. O'Neill's hand. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I know when, <clears throat> when we're, um, with the full screen like this, it gets tough to see. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, for my fellow members benefit that one, the move towards Mass Core has been going on for several years and it really started, actually started before Dr. Casilius's time. When this committee looked at some 
independent research that really showed we were failing our students. We were not setting them up for to succeed, particularly in college. And when we saw how our students were doing when they moved on to college, particularly compared to other districts, and then what the reasons were, and we found and and how we could set them up for success. Mass Core was one of them. Um, uh, dual enrollment uh, was another. Um, internships was the third. And those were common areas of success that we were not doing as good a job on. And, and this committee did look at uh, putting Mass Corps in as a requirement, but at the time, as similar to the question Ms. LaPera asked, there was, had not been a full audit done and, and building support among school leaders who were hesitant because they were nervous about the repercussions, particularly, quite frankly, on their graduation rates. And um, needed a lot of encouragement to see why this made sense. It also impacted autonomy for some schools was an issue. And as the superintendent pointed out, obviously the funding was a concern. Um, so I, I just wanna, again, knowing that we have some newer members in there, you're stepping on a moving train a little bit, so to speak, but um, a lot of work was done by Superintendent Casilius who rightfully so from day one in Boston has said, we need Mass Corps, we need Mass Corps. But even then when she first presented it, this committee asked her to step back and spend more time with school leaders. And she did, we have looked at the audit, Ms. LaPera, I'm sure uh, Ms. Costello will be able to dig out or Ms. Sullivan will be able to dig out that and get it to you. So we did look at what the shortfall was. Luckily with many schools, it's actually more around phys ed and things like that. Um, but then also funding um, around language and a few others. So it was a big, it was a, it was a long time to get to the point where this committee agreed with putting Mass Corps in across the entire district. And we really felt that that was the absolute core we needed, no pun intended, to be able to move forward to rightfully so set up our students for success beyond BPS. And that was the core tenet that we were driving at as a committee. Mm -hmm. Helpful. Thank you. My one question at this time is I'm always looking back to figure out how do we get ready. So my question is, what are we doing? What are we, what are we saying, training our elementary school educators about in terms of this is a heavy lift for our kids? You know, we, we need them reading on target, third grade math fourth to sixth grade, what are the messages back to the teachers in the earlier years as we are getting ready for Mass Corps in terms of their understanding of what they need to be doing differently now, as well as you know, the experiences and the opportunities um, that will be coming our kids' way? How are we making sure that they are aware so that they don't get to seventh and eighth grade and you know, be completely overwhelmed by all the possibilities without appropriate earlier preparation. Well, I'll take the just one quick stab at it and I'll ask Dr. Eccleston to talk about his curriculum frameworks and, and the standards and how he's thinking about progression of learning through the grades. But um, from my full experience, you have to have very strong pre-K to grade three programs focused mm -hmm. on literacy and focused on equitable literacy, which we are uh, doing this year and our teachers are getting a lot of a professional development around that. And then once they know how to read, you are then going toward the content um, in those intermediate grades and into your middle years grades where there's a larger focus on mathematics and sciences, and then getting them prepared into the rigors of inquiry and applied learning as they move through um, the higher grades. Um, and then as we think about 10th, 11th grade, 12th grade, we're thinking more about very specific uh, college preparation. Um, I always say that we need to teach our children a lot more about consuming a lot in a short amount of time. I remember as a freshman in college, having to consume a lot of literature and text, and then having to uh, have that come out into uh, a discussion that I had to have or a a paper okay. I had to write or a project I had to do um, in a very short time. And I think that's the kind of skill set that we start working on in the upper grades, as well as work-based opportunities, internships, um, 
and other ways that we can uh, apply their learning. And so I don't know, Drew, if you wanna uh, add anything more on that. Yeah, and I think um, Chair, Chair Robinson, I think we're gonna also explore a little bit of that in our, um, in our retreat coming up, but I think it's really important to us from an academic perspective. And I don't know if it's possible for, for folks that are displaying the screen that maybe we could just take the slide deck down. Um, it'd probably just be easier for the interpreters. Um, I think it's really important um, that we, we ensure that we deliver on a commitment that we've made to this community, which is that we need to offer things like advanced work class for all across the BPS, right? And um, I think, um, I think we've learned a lot of lessons from um, the FA implementation. Uh, and I think there's a lot of promise there around ensuring that our students get access to high quality um, uh, reading materials that are aligned to the science of reading, that those things are paired with STEM uh, opportunities that allow students to apply their learning from content and literacy into the STEM areas, that they're aligned to world language opportunities, um, either heritage languages or other language programs across our elementary schools. That's that's the quality guarantee that I think we have to not only communicate, put the stake in the ground on, but we have to make sure that we deliver it. And when we do that, I think, then we better prepare our students as they're exiting um, K to six schools into seven, 12 schools, having mm -hmm. had the opportunities to prepare them for the type of pathways that we envision uh, our, our school leaders and our educators will continue to grow. Thank you. Mr. Carter Horandis. Curious, are there any um, sort of data tools that you plan on rolling out with this? I'm, I'm just imagining a real shift on a school level and being able to monitor the progress to graduation, but also from the district level to be able to sort of zoom out and see how schools are doing in meeting the standards. So I'm curious if there's any tools that are being rolled out with this. Yeah, we, um, we've adopted a, a, a universal screener in the system, as well as paste interims um, and uh, assessments to look at growth. Um, specifically, we've been using the MAP and WEA, um, but we are currently have an RFP out or working on an RFP. Um, Sarah J uh, is leading that work under the leadership of Monica Hogan. Uh, it involves a significant number of educators and a joint committee of BTU and, and, and management folks who are really thinking through what do we want assessment to look like? We're thinking about creative ideas of looking at performative based assessments um, in, in creative and new ways for us to actually um, assess um, the degree to which the sort of project-based learning approaches that are in, embedded within our e EFA curriculum are actually, our students are able to sort of deliver on those things and to have good information about that. So I think TBD on sort of what that future is going to look like, but um, are doing that in, in close collaboration with our educators across the system. One other thing, uh, Mr. Carter um, Hernandez, that we are working on is a common course catalog so that we understand what courses are being offered at every single school. Uh, Boston has a lot of autonomy um, around um, course taking and curriculum that happens within autonomous schools. Um, but we wanna collect that as a district and look at um, how we are uh, equitably having offerings and access across the district to uh, rigorous courses. So we look at those and the number of students who have advanced placement or international baccalaureate or honors courses or early college courses. We look at that. Um, our ODA department has recently done some um, RFP for data visualization tools. So we anticipate uh, having dashboards around this as well as early warning indicator systems that we can use, um, particularly since we're moving to a 712. Um, uh, grade configuration in many of our comprehensive open enrollment high schools that would then give us the opportunity with those early warning indicators looking um, at early intervention for students and making sure that they stay on track with the counselors that we're putting in place. Yeah, that level of detail given the, the, the it's, it's getting late, I'm fine, I'm losing words. <laughs> that level of detail given the increase in counselors, I think will be really supportive in their work too. So great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you can continue.
All right. So um, what have we been up to um, in the most recent years? Uh, if you'll go to the next slide. From looking at the slide, you can see that uh, in spite of the pandemic and the crisis response that we've been engaged in over the past three school years, we've still been um, extremely busy uh, advancing this work and moving it forward. Um, an important part of high school redesign is how and when we can move more schools to the K6, 7, 12 grade configuration or either to the K8, uh, 9, 12 uh, grade configuration. And part of what we're hoping to accomplish uh, through the K6, 7, 12 or K8, 9, 12 is fewer transitions for our students, um, more predictable pathways for our families, uh, and we want to create more preschool seats. Uh, so as we move uh, seventh and eighth grade students out of our K-8 schools where, where we're doing that, it creates more opportunities uh, to, to create more pre-K seats, uh, which we know the research around pre-K um, is, is phenomenal in terms of how it impacts life outcomes for young people um, and sets them up for success um, across the, the K-12 experience and beyond. Uh, we want to provide our students with more co-curricular and athletic opportunities, which you heard Dr. Eccleson refer to um, earlier, but we want to do that at a much earlier age uh, than we currently do. Uh, as you can see here, there were a number of moves we made in phase one. Uh, we trans transformed over 16 schools from either being K-5 to K-6 or from K-8 to K-6 uh, for the school year 2021. Uh, we made an announcement earlier this fall about 15 additional K-6 expansions, and we have 14 more schools to move uh, to a K-6 model. We added uh, seventh and eighth grade at two of our high schools. We added seventh grade at East Boston last year, and they will grow into eighth grade uh, in the upcoming school year. And we added grades seven and eight to Charlestown this school year. We've also taken, finally, uh, taken some of our middle schools offline uh, to ensure we have one transition uh, for uh, many of our students. There's a lot more work to be done uh, on great configuration, but we continue to move the work forward uh, and we continue to uh, have this to be a priority um, year after year. So in coming year or in coming months, uh, you'll see more proposals on grade reconfiguration um, and you'll also see uh, a little more information about that um, in the upcoming proposal, in this presentation rather. If you go to the next slide, um, you know, the one thing those school committee members who have been around for a while uh, probably know I'm pretty consistent on message. And one of my messages is organizations don't rise to the level of their goals, they rise to the level of their systems. Uh, so with this particular slide, I think about three P's, uh, one P being purpose, the other being process, and the last one being people. And so we're really clear about our purpose. Uh, our purpose is to provide an equitable, world-class, high-quality education to every student. And what that means to me is we educate our students to the level that they can understand what systems do to them, uh, what systems are serving them well, and what systems are not serving them well, and they have the skills to be able to advocate uh, when systems are not serving them well. So that's our purpose. Our process, going back to the, to the quote I just shared about organizations rising to the level of their systems, process is about systems and structures that support effective implementation with fidelity. So in terms of process, uh, we've worked on uh, several pieces of policy uh, that give us the foundation we need to be able to advance this work with fidelity. So as was mentioned, uh, we've passed Common Core graduation requirements, uh, known as Mass Core. We, uh, we've passed Equitable Exam School Admissions Policy. Uh, we've passed Equitable Attendance Policies. We've identified Equitable Grading Practices. Um, and we're working towards a more comprehensive uh, grading policy. We've re revised the code of conduct, which we just spent some time on, and we've passed student data privacy policy. So these are some of the things that we've done on the process side uh, to create the systems and structures necessary uh, to advance this work. On the people side, uh, we've initiated IB applications at eight high schools. 
uh, 44 teachers across our seven high across seven high schools uh, have begun uh, professional learning around pre AP and IB. We've provided in additional instructional facilitators and IB coordinators and um, IB AP directors to make sure that our staff have the support they need in order to uh, advance this uh, academic programming uh, with fidelity. We've provided family liaisons, social workers, and full-time nurses at every school uh, to support the social, emotional, um, and uh, general health and wellness of our students uh, so that the conditions have been created for them to be successful um, in these more rigorous academic experiences uh, that we're providing to them. And we've actually done a good job with collaboration. We've collaborated with uh, some of our career-focused partners uh, such as the PIC, uh, Career Champions Network, Mass Insight, College, College Board, New Skills Boston, Junior Achievement, um, and others. So that's some of the work that we've uh, been up to uh, over the past two years or so uh, during the pandemic. And now I will toss it to, back to Dr. Eccleson uh, to talk about uh, what's on the horizon in phase two. It would help if I came off mute. Thank you, Chief Harris. Um, I think uh, it's important, obviously, to have a sense of um, the conditions that we've been trying to put in place so we could get to this day uh, around rolling out a sort of more robust um, high school redesign plan. Um, so I appreciate you taking that through us, taking us through that um, information. I think it's also important that as a district, we take a look at what, is our, what, is, what are our actions as a central office and as a partner with schools when we don't see the progress that we sort of envision for all of our students? And on the next slide, um, it, it describes, um, I think, multiple um, um, ways that we can think about um, addressing that. Um, and probably the most aggressive and the least democratic of those um, approaches are things like um, the commissioner of education potentially putting a school um, into receivership. Um, and a more democratic uh, option uh, is, a, um, is a tool that the superintendent has at her disposal in the contract called a superintendent school. Uh, that might, uh, based on the authority of the superintendent, she might be able to make decisions like, for example, we're going to think about um, the human capital at a specific school and think about rehiring educators. But the most democratic approach as we see it, and that tool that's available to the superintendent is a clause in the contract called intervention teams. Um, I'm really proud to have led part of that work um, when I was in the district as a network superintendent, um, working with educators in the community at the Mildred Avenue School to think about their turnaround. And we think it can be a really powerful lever uh, for thinking about improvement because it's done in collaboration with community and includes the stakeholders from those schools and from the school community in that process. So let me just give you a little background specifically on this specific tool called the intervention team on the next slide. <clears throat> um, the intervention team, the goal here is to bring multiple stakeholders to the table to amplify their voices and to collaboratively work together to ensure that we're clear on what the root causes are of when students don't get what they need and figure out what we need to, to ensure that they do. And that while we do that, we're trying to do it in a way that not only are, is, is responding to the actual needs of our students, but doing it in a way we hope that is supportive of our educators. And this clause in the contract requires there to be seven appointments of an intervention team. Three of those appointments are made by our colleagues at the Boston Teachers Union. Three appointments are made by the school superintendent of schools. And there's one joint appointment between the BTU and the superintendent of schools for a seven member team. The team would conduct a full assessment of all the programming, academic programming at the school, staffing, um, the leadership, the facilities, the enrichment opportunities, and student support services. They would obviously look at multiple sources of data, they would have focus groups 
with students and with families and with educators. They would make observations in classrooms. They would work over a series of months in the contract. It requires a set of recommendations to the superintendent within four months. And that they're required as part of that contract to engage with multiple stakeholders. And there should be multiple stakeholders on the intervention team um, that represent different interests of the community. Those recommendations need to be proffered to the superintendent for consideration. And the superintendent would review those recommendations and provide uh, any feedback that she felt was warranted as well as um, any additional resources that might be needed to implement those recommendations and report back to the school community about which uh, recommendations she has accepted, which ones she may have amended and which ones she's rejected. Next slide. And so um, the superintendent has met and I think you heard testimony from one or two individuals from this evening on that with the communities and union representation um, from three of our um, secondary schools, specifically Charles, Charlestown High School, Madison Park, and McKinley, and communicated uh, a partnership with the Boston Teachers Union um, around um, the assignment of intervention teams to work directly with those school communities to, um, to work on a set of recommendations to proffer to the superintendent for consideration. In the Charlestown context, we have a, a, an amazing prospectus that has some really strong components that we want to sort of draw from and leverage. There are obviously some concerns in that prospectus and we wanna make sure that with that community, we address those concerns. The Madison Park um, team, as, as has been mentioned in testimony tonight, has been doing some really powerful work. They also have some really clear theories as to what some of those root causes are and are interested in um, leveraging both their strengths and the resources in the city um, to deliver on a promise of high, um, high quality academic programming as well as career technical education. And then um, the McKinley K-12 school, um, you know, we have, um, they've made very clear the importance of having um, experts who have um, knowledge and skills um, for programming for therapeutic day students um, at the McKinley School for their individual context. And we're super committed to ensure that we respond to their feedback as we think about the design of intervention teams that meet the three unique needs of these school communities. I'll turn it over to Corey, uh, Chief Harris, who will talk a little bit about um, what we know about students at each one of these schools. Um, well, here you can see we have um, a very uh, diverse student population at uh, both of these schools. Um, and there's work that we need to do with our student assignment system. Uh, you can see we have a very high concentration of uh, special ed students um, at each of these uh, at each of these schools. We'll go to the next slide. So um, in terms of uh, great reconfigurations that we've done, uh, we've reconfigured, we've combined uh, the McCormick and the BCLA, and uh, we have reconfigured that uh, to, to 712 uh, across two campuses. Uh, we have the upper campus uh, is still at uh, the old Hyde Park High School campus with New Mission. And then we have the uh, lower grades um, seven, eight, and nine uh, at the McCormick building. And as indicated earlier, we added grades seven uh, and eight to Charlestown uh, this year. And then at East Boston, we've uh, added seventh grade this school year and those seventh graders will grow um, into eighth grade next school year. And then uh, next year, the English uh, will be adding grades seven and eight. Uh, Brighton High School will also be adding grades seven and eight. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, uh, the Burke uh, will be adding grades seven and eight. And then the King and the Trotter uh, will be going from K-8 uh, to K-6. And as was indicated, uh, there's, there's more work to be done uh, to engage both the uh, Trotter and the King schools, and there's a plan for that.
Thank you, uh, Chief Harris. So the, the last uh, point we wanna make here is that as we move forward and we continue to implement not only this academic vision, but setting the conditions for high school redesign, um, we just wanna make clear to the community and to the school committee that we understand that um, decisions we make from a facilities perspective need to be inextricably linked to the decisions um, related to um, academic opportunities that we expect for students. And in fact, it's those academic opportunities that need to be the driver of the facility decisions that we're making across the city. And so on the next slide, we just wanted to communicate um, some important things that this community can expect um, over the next year as we engage uh, with our entire community to understand and create a vision for what a K to six education and what a seven to 12 education in school ought to look like across the Boston Public Schools. It's really important to us that we use that feedback from the community as a baseline for what each new building renovation or new build needs to have. And we'll be providing more information on what this engagement will be looking like uh, in the coming weeks. We, we also um, uh, are doing further facilities assessments of our current buildings, which will allow us to rate each building and understand where to prioritize the work ahead, particularly in the, um, in the context of the opportunity index. And um, the final point I wanna make before I turn it over to the superintendent um, is one that I really believe is that excellent buildings alone don't necessarily make excellent schools. We know it's the community and the learning opportunities and the experience that we provide our students coupled with high quality facilities that really make excellent schools. Um, and we have so much more work that we can do um, to provide um, the types of opportunities that our students deserve across the city. And so I'm now gonna turn it over to the superintendent um, who will close out before we watch a short video um, about some upcoming and exciting work at both Brighton High School and Burke High School um, and hear from their school leader. So thank you, Superintendent Casillas. Thank you, Dr. Eccleston, and thank you, Mr. Harris, for this presentation and um, so thoroughly going through where we've been, where we're headed. Um, you know, our school leaders are just amazing and the educators within our schools and the work that they're doing to ensure every single high school is a great high school for our students and many of them already are. Um, I said when I first came here that, you know, the attention that gets spent on our exam schools is, um, you know, a huge amount of attention and our exam schools are great schools. And um, I wouldn't take away that from them, but because there's so much attention to the three exam schools, there is little attention paid to all our other schools. I was at Fenway High School um, just the other day um, getting toured and it was by students and it was an amazing school um, doing amazing things right here in Fenway, just outside Roxbury, not too far from my home. Um, and you're gonna hear from two amazing leaders, uh, one who delivered us a Posse Scholar this year uh, at the Burke High School, uh, so proud. Um, and then uh, at Brighton High School, this December, they published their very first uh, student made newspaper, much of the newspaper written by ELD, ELs one and twos. Um, and so just so proud of our students, they are brilliant um, and they deserve the same level of attention that our exam schools get, the same level of effort and the same level of resources and the same level of attention. And that's what we're trying to do here uh, with rebuilding all of our uh, high schools. So we don't have testifiers who say, you know, I don't have any choices. There's a lot of choices in Boston Public Schools, and I'm very proud of the work that our school leaders are doing to ensure that every kid is going to get what they need. So with that, I'm going to turn over to a quick one minute video, and then uh, you're going to hear from Mr. Andrew Bott and Mr. Amaka Silver, Silva uh, from Burke High School.
I don't think we can hear it. In 2019, Boston Public Schools began a high school redesign plan. In 2020, initial plans were brought forward that outlined BPS's priorities, starting with a few of our large comprehensive high schools. At Brighton High, students are offered a plethora of AP courses, as well as two career pathways in health and business and entrepreneurship. Brighton also offers dual enrollment to all students internship opportunities, an Arabic language program, and robust arts and athletics programs. It's like a family here. I know a lot of people here. I know a lot of staff and teachers. So it's like when I see them, they always ask me questions. How are you doing? First is how I'm doing. Next is how's my classes. So it's like they're pushing me to be better. Burke High School also offers career pathways to students in design and visual communications, biotechnology, and junior ROTC. Burke partners with community organizations such as the 826 Writers Room, City Year, and Becoming a Man, also known as BAM. Burke also offers rigorous academic courses, as well as phenomenal arts programs and athletics teams. Relationships to staff and like how cozy and how of a home they make the Burke feel. Um, I feel like whenever you need the support, it's like right there, you know. We are trying to um, work on those promotional materials and continue to, this is a little sample of the um, materials that we're trying to put together to get the word out about our high schools. Um, I also want to, uh, before we move to uh, Mr. Amakar, Mr. Bot, um, just give a really big shout out and thanks to our high school superintendents, in particular, Dr. Brueggemann and Dr. Um, McIntyre, who worked uh, the past two years on the high school redesign and worked in collaboration with some of our um, open enrollment schools to make sure that they had the training and advanced placement, the career technical ed programming and the pathways. Um, so I wanna just give a quick shout out to the two of them for their work. And then now um, Eugene Roundtree and um, um, I'm losing, I'm tired too. Ted, um, <laughs> I don't know why I'm losing the name of, Drew, help me. I'm losing Lombardi. Ted Lombardi. I'm losing my, my brain right now. Um, Ted Lombardi, and they have just really been a fantastic team uh, working on this stuff. So I'll turn it over to uh, Amakar. Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Madam Chair and uh, members of the school committee, Dr. Caselius, uh, I just want to start to just uh, thank you for acknowledging the work that has been done at the Burke uh, by the staff and also the accomplishment of our students. That speaks up to our, uh, you know, uh, excitement right now in the becoming a school uh, seven to twelve. Uh, for several years, we've been advocating for that, and uh, knowing that. Our, our, our history right now uh, tells us how much we could accomplish if we're able to receive the kids at a younger age and, and at a low grade from seven to 12. So uh, the kids that you uh, introduced today, the, the, the finalists, you know, were what we call homegrown. And when kids are homegrown, that means that, you know, there's some certain stability in uh, developing uh, an environment of trust and relationship where they can thrive. Um, we know that, you know, at the Burke right now, our success depends on the wraparound services that we already have in place. And uh, we focus on uh, providing a holistic approach to ensure that academic and social emotional su success of these students are at the top of our work. Uh, we believe that, uh, you know, redesigning these high schools is certainly going to have an impact. We may not you know, see it immediately, but it's, it's in the immediate future that's gonna have a great impact as students uh, you know, go to these schools at the seventh grade, develop these uh, meaningful relationships with, uh, with adults and, and, uh, and establish the trust and, uh, 
feeling that they're safe in an environment that they can thrive. That's been the history of the Burke High School. So uh, the seven to 12 reconfiguration will provide us also a longer runway and the opportunity to engage them in rigorous academic experience, career pathways and uh, curricular activities that include sports, the arts, music, dance and other clubs. Uh, these are very important for students that attend schools like the Burke High School in a uh, providing you know, experience that will enhance the development of their self-confidence and identity. Because identity for our students is very important. And they start developing it in the, you know, while they're transitioning to high school. If they have that, that stability, you know, they will grow and thrive as we've seen with the experience that we had in Burke High School. So, uh, we are having, you know, creating new pathways that will, get, will help them begin thinking at an early age about their uh, future and think about their careers in life after uh, high school. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bott? Thank you, Dr. Caselius, and uh, thank you to the school committee. Um, I just want to share a few thoughts about Brighton High, and, and, I, and I want to start with, with sort of uh, putting down this marker. Um, so I started as a principal in Boston in 2002, and so um, I've been a principal of, a, of several different schools and, and, and have experience across a number of, of different uh, types of schools. And, and what I can tell you is this. Brighton High is really, it's truly a unique and special place, and, and it's that because Teachers work incredibly hard. The lessons are dynamic, they are engaging, they are rigorous. And there's an expectation that all students will achieve them. And all means all, right? As an open enrollment school, it's all of our students. It's our English learners. It's our students in, in our new SLIFE class um, that Mr. Harris mentioned a few minutes ago. It's students in our special education programs. And so when students are, are um, in a bioscience class doing heart dissections, You'll see English learners doing heart dissections. You'll see students in special education programs. You'll see everyone doing the same work, having the same opportunities, and while taking different pathways there, reaching the same um, outcomes, the same levels, um, levels of achievement. Um, and, and part of that is because the school focuses on the individual need of every student. And so we talk about like the master schedule, and, and sometimes the guidance counselors and I uh, we laugh because we say we don't have a you know, ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th grade schedule. We have 440 individual schedules because they really are designed to meet the, both the, 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 the courses that students want to take, the courses students need to take, um, and, and that push. What's really exciting about the seventh and eighth grade expansion at Brighton is it's going to allow for us to build um, uh, pretty substantially on the work that we've already done over the last two years. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the, the um, Mass Core um, graduation requirements. We've built a master schedule um, and a school schedule and a course catalog that allows us to meet that now for our students. And so we're beginning the process of moving our students now um, through those requirements. We're building two pathways, as mentioned in the video, entrepreneurship um, and a biomedical um, health science pathway. We, the school for years had one world language uh, in Spanish. We've added Arabic as a second language. We've expanded the arts. Um, so we had two visual arts classes and we now have visual arts, we have theater, uh, we have graphic design, we have photography, we have music production. And so I just can go on and on about that expansion. What's brilliant about the seventh and eighth grade coming to Brighton is we can start that work in math in seventh grade. We can begin the process of accelerating um, math instruction in seventh and eighth grade so that all of our seniors are able to take stats, AP stats, calculus, AP calculus. We're able to start world languages in the seventh and eighth grade so we can get to fourth year, fifth year AP level languages by this time students are sophomores and juniors. We also can do, as, as Mr. Silva said, all the things that middle schoolers are looking to do, the clubs, the sports, um, the, the social emotional support, sort of all those activities that are really hard to do at a lot of K to eight schools. Um, the, the, by that age, um, students are really, they're looking for that, that diversity of opportunity. And so for us, this is an incredibly exciting opportunity. Um, it's something that the school has, has been working on before I got there, 
Um, and, and the community is thrilled uh, to be able to welcome seventh and eighth graders. Um, I'll, I'll end with this. Our, our, our um, class president on, and uh, student rep on the school site council um, today, she was most concerned uh, on how, wh where are the seventh and eighth graders going to be in the building? How can we make sure that they're successful? What do the students need to do, the upper class, you know, the juniors and seniors to welcome seventh and eighth graders? She was thinking about that community um, and what, um, what Jathan talked about in the video, sort of how do, we, how do we welcome them into our family? So uh, really an exciting place for us to be as a school community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bott. I am so excited and so proud of these two school leaders. They represent 125 school leaders who are committed and passionate about our kids. And they then represent their entire faculties and staff who are ready and willing to take up the mantle, roll up their sleeves, and do this really hard work of their own personal growth around um, improving instruction and improving opportunities. And then the central team really rallying to support them to ensure that they have the resources and all of the professional development that's needed and, and um, support that's needed to actually get it done. So we will open up to your questions um, now. And uh, Dr. Eccleson, uh, Corey, uh, I think uh, Dr. McIntyre is on the call as well. Um, who can talk a little bit to the history of the Burke as well as uh, the work that she led uh, with Dr. Brueggemann, um, as well as Ted Lombardi and uh, Jean um, Roundtree. So we're, the whole team's here. Happy to take your questions. I think you're on uh, mute, um, Madam Chair. We're all tired here, God, so, so sorry. I want to now open it up to the committee for questions and comments. And I'd like to remind my colleagues about our agreed upon norm that we each have five minutes, one to two questions. Also want to remind the BPS staff to also be brief in your response. And again, if you have additional questions, I'll come back and do a second round. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Dr. Alkins. Uh, yes, I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, so in theory, the the high school redesign is great in thinking about it and as you're launching a cohort, uh, how what are the additional supports that um, are going to exist for students as you're trying to support the learning loss that's happening currently through the pandemic and then after that? So that's my first question. Dr. Eccleston, do you want to take that or should we do a school-based example of what would happen uh, for students who have learning loss? Yeah, you can start with a school-based example and I'd be happy to expand from there. Amakar or um, Andrew, do you want to share what you're doing and thinking at your school around learning loss and then we can pick up centrally how we're supporting that with counselors and um, other tutors and such? Well, I'll, I'll begin with the, with the Burke, you know, what we've been doing is, uh, yes, we, uh, you know, one of the strengths of the Burke is the partnership that we have, partnerships that we have created. We have, uh, you know, over 30 partners and some of them, those that are, you know, um, in, in house provide direct service to the students. For example, we have a CD year. CD year provide, a, you know, they have the bathroom after school. They open after school and they stay with the students, uh, you know, until four o'clock. We have eight to six that, that uh, helps with the, uh, with the writing of, of the students. We have, uh, you know, uh, UMass Boston. We have uh, Freedom House. We have you know, it, it, it's a series of, uh, you know, uh, partners that come in and work with the students directly. And also we have a staff, the, the commitment of the staff and staying at longer, longer hours after school. Uh, one of the things also that uh, we have put in place is, you know, there's no failure right now. It's all, the, the grading is standard based. So students that have uh, missed some, some of their grades or do not receive Fs. What they receive is an incomplete, and that incomplete, you know, changes after uh, teachers assign a standard-based uh, uh, project that where the, the students demonstrate that they have, they have met those standards, 
and then I complete that assignment. So all of these things put in place, you know, and our students are staying. We, you know, at the Burke, we used to say, you know, uh, attendance is a problem. It's not a problem anymore. Attendance right now, what, what, what the, the culture of the school created was, we, we've decided that now we have to throw the students out. You know, they stay. They stay longer as out, and we got to say, no, we're going to hang out. So we provide all these uh, services to them and, um, and the projects that we put in place to make sure that they meet in the standards. The grading system, we changed it completely. You know, it's not about the numbers or, you know, or what the students missed, but it's about what they can accomplish. Standards-based grading, you know, with the systems of support care that help every child. Parental uh, involvement is important on that also. You know, counseling, all that helped them achieve uh, success at this point. Thank you, Amaka. Um, Andrew? Uh, yeah. One example of what we're doing is uh, credit recovery um, with uh, teacher, Brighton High teachers um, uh, running um, sessions and doing courses with students after school or on weekends. Um, we're focused, we have 32 seniors right now who fell behind on credits during COVID. Um, and so they're taking their full course load and their credit recovery. Um, and we think that we can get all 32 of those students um, to successfully complete their courses um, by uh, the end of the year. Um, so we're starting, we're, right now we have those 32 seniors in that. Um, and we surveyed the students. So we set up the time with teachers um, that best serves the students. So summer right after school, summer evenings, summer weekends. Um, we're using the district's Edmentum platform as the base for the curriculum so that we know that we are um, covering the and, and teaching and, and gaining mastery of the standards um, for that course. Uh, we'll be expanding that into our 11th graders who fell behind on credits during COVID um, starting in March um, as we start to wrap up our seniors. And then just finally, and Drew could probably add to this, is, you know, we assessed our students and we asked our high school uh, team to assess students this fall. Um, we had a winter assessment plan, but because of the surge, you know, we've had to delay that winter assessment um, prior, but we have acceleration academies for our students to help catch them up. We have strategic partnerships, as you've heard from both of the school leaders here um, with outside technology support, um, like with uh, Edmentum and online courses and credit recovery, as well as supportive services through counseling, mental health services, um, teachers staying late to school to help, or even shifting of grading practices to give kids more time if they've experienced COVID or had some interruption in their learning this year so that we can be uh, even more supportive. Um, I don't know, Drew, if you want to add anything more there. I'll be, I'll be quick, but just add three, three investments that we've, we've made at the system level to support schools. Um, one, um, we were originally trying to solve a, a specific problem, which is what happens if a student is out, this was like late summer, uh, what happens if a student's out for COVID? Um, what would be the sort of options that might be available to them? And, and we found a resource that, that was help, helped us solve that problem, but also we, we see as sort of a tier one support. So we purchase a license for every student in the entire district that provides them access to 24 seven tutoring. So they have to bring a, if they have, they're, they're struggling with a specific problem um, in math or um, have um, some difficulty with some comprehension questions, they bring that work to the tutor and within seconds they have access to a tutor um, who will spend as much time as, as the student needs uh, working through that problem or set of questions. Um, and we've seen recently as, as school leaders and uh, ed other educators are talking about this, um, and the value of it, we're really seeing skyrocketing participation in the last few weeks and months. We're also offering um, tutoring for our youngest learners, 75 minutes of ELA and math instruction across K-0 to grade two, using ed um, educators and tutors from our system. And um, as the superintendent mentioned earlier, implementing acceleration academies. We've traditionally done this 10, 15 schools, but um, this year we're, uh, I think, in excess of 65 schools across the system. So thousands of students in February will focus on English language arts, complex text at the core of what we're doing, culturally relevant text, 
and the students are making policy recommendations to, to Mayor Wu, they're going through a simulation as if they're on her cabinet and at each grade level studying topics such as racial justice, housing insecurity in the city, and will be making policy recommendations based on their grade level and sort of the text that they have available. Um, and Dr. Um, Mayor Wu has expressed an interest in being a part of that process, so we're excited to welcome, welcome her into that. One other thing just to mention is just summer school as well. So we'll have summer school opportunities when we'll, we'll bring a, a, a more in-depth briefing of that uh, as we get closer to the summer. I don't know if I have to take a moment and just add um, one of the biggest strengths and I, I can elevate my video. So pardon me for not being on screen. Um, but one of the biggest strengths, I believe, around the Burke High School, it is a hub school. Um, not only it is, is it a hub school, it was the first developed full service community school. So all students have access to health care on campus. They have access to free eyewear, eyeglasses on campus, dentistry, um, physicals, as well. Um, in addition to that, there's a mentoring program that exists between the Burke High School and the King and the Frederick, where the eighth grade students for the last seven years, I believe, maybe six, have been spending their summers at the Burke High School onboarding for readiness for the transition to high school, a very successful model. Even during the year, the Burke team goes down to the King School and mentors the seventh and eighth graders um, as part of our hub school commitment. And so the Burke has been getting the runway prepared for the seventh and eighth graders to transition um, into the school for quite some time. In addition, uh, many of the King students have had days where they've come to the Burke campus and spent time in the writer's room uh, doing poetry, um, slams, or playing uh, intramural sport in the gym. And so the community is ready and open to receive the younger scholars and engage them in opportunities that aren't always there for them in their middle schools. Because what tends to happen in the seventh and eighth grade at our K through eights is they empty out after sixth grade when the brightest kids take over, take off and go to our exam schools and the seventh and eighth grades are left somewhat depleted in terms of student numbers, which impacts through the student weighted formula resources, even when considering the opportunity index. And so I would say that the Burke and Brighton both have leaders that are transformational servant leaders. Andrew has turned around Orchard Gardens and Mr. Silva has been in partnership with me transforming the Burke, the only school in the last nine years to exit turnaround status in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I would say that they both didn't sing their praises. They're two of our most amazing leaders and educators. And I am so proud to walk their schools and feel the peace and the calamity that their environments offer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Dr. McIntyre was wonderful how you sang the praises of the two school leaders. It doesn't, didn't surprise me that you did that, but you also deserve a tremendous amount of credit uh, for your leadership of the Burke um, for many years. And when you talk about it coming out of transformation, um, the first high school in the Commonwealth to do so, I believe. Uh, tremendous leadership on your part um, with your full team. Um, so anyway, and also uh, Mr. Bart, yes, welcome back to Boston Public Schools. I, I like to say that to you uh, <laughs> um, when you rejoined us 
from your brief intermission outside of the city of Austin, but yes, the work you did at Orchard Gardens before was transformational as well too. I am intrigued both for the Burke and Brighton. You know, we have had um, two of our high schools expand to include seventh and eighth, the past year as we're on the chart. And Charlestown took both seventh and eighth grade. And part of that was because of the closing of the um, Edwards. Whereas East Boston had I careful how, how I say this, the luxury of doing it a year at a time, starting with seventh grade and then building in. Both did, you know, uh, Mr. Bott, it was interesting that you referenced, um, or head of school Bott, excuse me, it was interesting you referenced your student leader being concerned about where they are, where the seventh and eighth graders are gonna be because in both Charlestown and East Boston, they are able to carve out a separate floor or an area of a floor. So they kind of have their own academy, uh, so to speak, for the for the students. Um, I know Charlestown has a completely separate entrance for the seventh and eighth graders. I'm not sure if East Boston did. I think they do. I'm trying to recall walking along there, but I'm just wondering, um, are you going to have, is it seventh and eighth together or is it just seventh and then building in? And um, any thoughts yet on you know, the physical space, are you gonna be kind of treating seventh and eighth grade as an academy, so to speak, and, and slightly different uh, physical approach, which I know is something that parents are always interested in as well. Yeah, so one, uh, at the Burke, one of the things that, you know, we've been uh, 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 preparing for is to, because we do believe that being, uh, making big, small is the way to go with schools like the Burke. So we are already divided into academies. You know, nine, each academy is, uh, you know, headed had by uh, a team leader. They have their own uh, counselor. They have their own, uh, uh, what we call uh, engagement counselors also. And they have all the wraparound services tied to that academy. So what we want to do is continue to do, do, do the same thing and create an academy, a lower academy for the seventh and eighth grade. And it, they will have their own space also because you know, that's, uh, that sense of identity is very important for, for the students. They all know, you know that they create that, oh, I'm in the ninth grade, I know where I'm, where I'm going. I know who are the people that I have to uh, uh, search for. If, I, I'm, if, I have, if I'm having difficulties, you know, they know exactly who they go to. You know, every child is accounted for. Every child is heard. Mm -hmm every child's need, you know, is taken care of. And uh, the support with the counselors, we, we have a partnership with the, uh, Boston College where we receive many uh, uh, interns for counseling every, every school, school year. You know, we used to have uh, as many as 20 uh, Right now it's less, but, uh, you know, students do ask for that. They see their, their, their peers, you know, talking and doing well and all of that. They come in and they used to say, Dr. Mack, where's, where's mine? Or Ms. Wendell, where's mine? Ms. Silver, where's mine? I want to talk to someone. So we do all that. And uh, just yesterday, you know, the uh, uh, we have a new partnership now with the Franciscan uh, Hospital. You know, they, they're sponsoring a room at the Burke High School right now with a, an intern. And um, they're building it for us. And they, you know, it was like open, open her arms yesterday saying, what do you want to see in this room? And I was just having that conversation with, uh, with uh, some of the team leaders about it. So that's what makes the book unique. And we're going to create that same space, that same safe and welcoming space for the seven and eight graders. Because I'm going to tell you something. The biggest thing about the book right now, and I will say it, anywhere in front of everyone. We were at one of the safest schools in Boston, regardless of where that school is located. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bott, I had a school bot. So, um, so, we, so we have a, a location, Brighton is a sort of a unique building, um, but if you know the building, we're, we're gonna use a, a good portion of the first floor from the library to, to St. Elizabeth's. Um, and there's kind of a, um, there's a great little sort of second hallway off of that, which I think is perfect for um, seventh and eighth grade. Um, you know, I had the benefit of coming into New Mission. Uh, you mentioned when I, when I um, came back to Boston, I was at New Mission for a year and it was two years into their seventh and eighth grade expansion, sort of had the opportunity to sort of see and hear and learn from all the things that 
that the great team at New Mission said went well and the things that they wish they did differently. Um, and so, so I think that will help, uh, certainly help uh, us at Brighton um, in our process. Um, currently our plan is to start with seventh and eighth at the same time, not to phase it in, but to have it as half of the size that it will eventually be. So to start with both grades um, at a smaller size and then build it out over uh, the, the following year or two um, to, to build it up to full size. And part of that has to do with the programming um, and when we, the need for um, SEI classes, some special education classes and sort of how we can, can phase in that growth. So that, that's, that's the approach that we're taking. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I don't want to underestimate since we were talking about the transformation um, at um, the Burrick, let's not underestimate the transformation that happened at Orchard Gardens. As I recall, did that go from a level five to level one? The level one. And it was the first in the Commonwealth to make that happen. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, we all knew it well before the state did because we saw it in choice by parents because word spread and parents wanted their students, their children to be at Orchard Gardens uh, well before the state rated it as a level one. So uh, congratulations on that. And Dr. McIntyre, really thank you for calling out uh, the hub school work at, um, at um, Burke and you are, as you said, the first high school in the district to be doing that. And I know superintendent, that's also a big part of your plans to expand. And, and I actually reflect back on the first part of the um, presentation where you were talking about the quality guarantee and that really impacts kind of the lower pieces as well, right? Because the partnerships kind of being a model of a full service school is, is that kind of built into the guarantee and how are you thinking of hub schools for high schools as you redesign high schools? Yeah, the, the Burke is, that's a great question. The Burke is, um, you know, an exemplar of the hub school model. And we expanded in the Grove Hall um, schools this year. So we have 14 schools that we are expanding as our first cohort of hub schools this year. They're in our, the Grove Hall Alliance of schools, as well as our dual language schools. So we prioritized and used our racial equity planning tool and we did that all right. <laughs> and we decided to prioritize those schools in our uh, expansion. And now we will continue to expand uh, each, each year and add more schools. Okay, but do you see hub schools becoming a key component of high school redesign in the future? Yes, that's or the supportive or... services piece that's in there, absolutely. Okay. And, yeah, if I could just add this one little caveat around the hub schools. The Burke was um, supported through the Lubin Foundation to install the hub school model at the King School in collaboration with Claire, who is now leading our hub school work from the YMCA. And so Claire was on the ground floor working collectively with the Burke staff to install a hub school model so that the needs of the entire family school community could be met. And that included food pantries, um, Katie's closet. Uh, we would have um, vegetable trucks um, come to the community for both the Burke, the pilot, and the king um, and just share in nutritional value, uh, free food with all of our families. And so that work is still living, still ongoing. And it's sometimes hard to see the crack because the throughway is really quite clear. I'm not sure, um, Andrew, if you have hub, hub schools or the beginnings of that at the Brighton just yet. So we have the beginnings of it. We have a, um, a health center um, that's staffed by the Boston Public Health Commission. Um, and uh, the health center and our school nurse are working with different partners to bring in dental services, vision screening. Um, we have, uh, I think, about 30 students who were screened um, right after the December break who are waiting glasses. Um, so, we're, so it's not the full hub model, but we're, we're well on our way. And, and you obviously have the other shining example in the district of the hub school model, the Garden of Pilot Academy, right up the street from you. So yeah. they have been the leader for on the yes. state That's eight right. side of the right. hub school, right? I also, uh, Mr. O'Neill, you mentioned um, the enrollment and sort of the, the demand at Orchard Gardens. It's worth noting that Brighton was projected to be at 343 this year. And typically for the last five years, 
Brighton underperformed enrollment approximately 15% and sort of, you look, sort of look at the decline. Um, so we were projected at 343. Um, we are, uh, as of today, at 443. So we have 100 more students than we were projected for. Um, and so uh, incredible growth and incredible growth in Austin Brighton. Um, we're approaching 50% of our students, um, uh, Austin in particular, a lot of students uh, in our SDI program and SLIFE classes uh, enrolling um, from Austin. So um, uh, beginnings of the same thing that was happening at Orchard Gardens. And now you go speak to the Jackson Man families. I was there, I was there today and I'm going back uh, soon, so. Great. Great. Thank you. Ms. LaPera? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, to both of our principals here today. I haven't had the opportunity to visit your schools any, um, any not anytime soon or recently, but I would love to be there um, and see the, the work on the ground. Um, so thank you again for the work that you're doing. Uh, my questions are not specifically related to um, the Burke nor Brighton, um, but I think one of the pieces that um, has been illuminated for me is that in those particular schools, the facilities already have the capacity to absorb the expansion. Um, and I know that with some of the uh, grade kind of reconfigurations, even with our um, K through sixes that we've talked about expanding for this coming year, we're using temporary space and for even East Boston High School, there's a need for facilities adjustments in order to accommodate the upcoming eighth grade. So I, I think my question is, where are we in terms of a comprehensive facilities plan that really takes into the consideration our um, wanting to reconfigure grades um, mm -hmm in a more permanent uh, basis versus the, the temporary pieces that we're kind of piecing together to make this happen. Thank you for that. This is the exciting question. And this is the question that um, the chair constantly pressures us on. As you know, we've had three separate mayors <laughs> in the past two and a half years um, and three board uh, com school committee chairs. Um, and so with that kind of transition, it has made it hard to, to get the commitments up and going and the and the focus, particularly at the mayoral level, because you need to, you, you need the resources, right? And you need the commitment of resources. And I've been thrilled that Mayor Wu has been speaking to the facilities um, and that that's a priority for her. Um, I've had several meetings already with the mayor and with Dion Irish, who is over um, the public facilities uh, department at, um, the city about the capacity that they would need and the capacity that we have put in place already um, with some of our ESSER funding to really launch a comprehensive study moving forward for our school facilities. The wonderful thing is that we're basing it on the academic needs of the K-6 and the 712s. You heard Dr. Eccleston talk about this earlier. This is a, we released um, an RFP to have um, a vendor come in, an architect come in and walk us through a community engagement process around our quality guarantee in academics. And what, would, what are the standards that would drive any new facility upgrades? And we're hoping to uh, engage in that work starting in the next several months. And on when we have our retreat with the school committee, we plan on talking about that. Um, we're also talking about the um, weighted student funding formula. Um, and that's also a huge piece. And um, what we are going to be doing around reforming the way that we equitably fund our schools. So those two key initiatives will be happening and we will be engaging with our community to marry the academic agenda as the driver of both our budget and our facility upgrades um, at each school. And everybody will be, you know, all schools will be listed, you know, in terms of their, uh, how they, how those school buildings stand up to this quality standard that we want to want every kid to be able to have. And, and then the city has to see this plan and decide how they will fund it. 
I appreciate that. And that is um, incredibly exciting to hear that um, Mayor Wu is interested in, and committed to, to really providing the environments and spaces that our students and our educators deserve to be in every day. Um, I think my follow-up to that is, we know that there are also currently schools that have been in plans of expansion but have still um, reached facilities constraints. Perfect example is the Mar Margarita Muñiz. Um, and so as we're making decisions for expansions for some schools and not others, like what is the determining factor for that? Mm -hmm. um, when we know that there are some incredible schools that have been kind of in the runway for a while. So I'm hoping that in this short while here um, with this study, we will be able to see, um, you know, where we can expand and where facilities need addition, uh, you know, either additions or to campus solutions uh, to schools or, um, you know, full rebuilds um, if necessary. For instance, the EMK is a school that also would like to have 712. Um, we need to temporarily move them to a facility, but we're looking for a permanent home for them, um, as well as the Muniz. I met with their site council this past fall and talked with them. Um, I'm eager for them to be able to have a, a school building um, that fits the needs so that they can expand their growth. We have more dual language in the district. So more kids want to have this as an, op, um, an option to be able to roll up, uh, up into their high school and to do that earlier. Um, so it's really about this assessment that we're going to be doing over the next several months um, that will give us better information about where we can do that where there's real estate, where we can do an addition. Um, so we have so, to get we have to get that study done. I appreciate that. Um, and I'm gonna ask the 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 parent hat question is like, and when can we actually see this happen, right? Like in terms of timeline. I'm um, hoping over the next, I'm hoping over the where we the RFP is open right now. And so PFD will award this to an architect and then we will roll up our sleeves and start working on this with the community um, and asking them what are these standards in K-6, what are what should a high school have, and then we measure up every single high school against that. We also have recently done a, a facilities index and looked at all of the age of our roofing, the age of our, you know, our windows, our buildings, our bathrooms and the condition of those that could, you know, do they have a, a gymnasium, a library? Do they have science labs, um, you know, therapeutic spaces or anything, you know, spaces for counselors, social workers, hub school clinics. Um, and so you have to stand, you have to look at each of the schools against that standard. And then we have to make some decisions as a body about prioritization based on our racial equity planning tool. And I think so, and this will be my last question, um, but as we're thinking about, we're creating some temporary solutions that are we saying that that goes beyond one or two years, example of um, some of the elementary schools that are expanding to include middle grade, middle school grades um, for next year. In we, are, we aren't expanding any elementary schools to include middle grades. Well, some of them are, are absorbing a sixth. So for example, like the Bates. We're moving K-5 to K-6. Right. Because that will be our grade configuration, but we're not creating any new K-8 schools. Correct. But with that six, many of them are doing it with temporary spaces. Yes. Yes. And so what is the timeline to think like, how long are people going to be in temporary spaces? I know you don't know these pieces, but I'm just trying to think through if I were a parent, is this a, a, a one year timeline to, to think about a more permanent uh, position for schools? Is this two years, three years out? Are we 10 years out? Like, I'm just trying to conceptualize what this means. So I anticipate that by fall, we should know where our schools are on the list, but construction projects take in a huge amount of time. Mm -hmm. So it could be multiple years for schools and it could be for some schools 10 to 15 years before they change. We have 125 schools. We literally would need somewhere around $4 billion in order to 
move our projects. And then there's the sheer logistics and operations of that amount of construction projects to get, you know, to get going where every school could be could be remodeled or renovated or an addition put on and just the sheer capacity of the city to be able to manage those projects um, is, is quite a bit and then still do libraries and firehouses and you know housing and all the other things that the city does. So, you know, it's frustrating to me because, you know, I'm dissatisfied with the conditions of our buildings. Mm-hmm. And I and I I want more urgency around that and have I mean if I talk about any topic this is the one I talk about the most um, that keeps me up at night um, and the just the sheer amount of 125 schools and it's not just some of them like almost all of them need major renovations and additions and support like every every single one of them has something that's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I think Dr. Alkins has his hand up. Oh. Uh, Dr. Alkins, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so just shifting back to the, the the slideshow where you mentioned like the guarantee on equitable instruction. And so if if someone could just shed a little bit of light on just what does the rigor of teacher evaluation look like? Um, obviously, uh, the Burke and um, Brighton have offered great models uh, by which to follow, but I'm just kind of curious as to what that, that, that rigor of evaluation looks like, um, particularly with regard to implementing anti-racist practices, culturally relevant pedagogies, doing that efficiently and doing so in a timely fashion. I know the work is tough uh, to, to really get a hold on to implement, um, but it, it is critical that we do this um, pretty quickly. Yeah, our teachers are um, evaluated. I wonder if um, Dr. Eccleston wants to speak to that, um, but I know that it, we probably would need to come back at this hour for a much more thorough presentation on teacher evaluation um, and how we uh, conduct teacher evaluation at our schools. Um, Drew, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit on that. Just I don't think I have it. anything profound to offer. Um, I think maybe Chief Chief Harris might have, uh, if he wants to add, just um, as being the sort of um, the school's division, that they're a little bit more responsible for implementation of evaluations. Um, but I think we have a lot more work to do on that front, particularly around pairing um, that of the evaluation tool with some of the academic priorities and the teacher practice priorities, particularly using the CryOp tool. Um, that's one of our academic priorities. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Corey if he has anything else to add. Yeah, I'd say, um, you know, nothing meaningful that I was going to talk about the cry out, but I think, again, that's another one of those areas where we need to develop more consistency um, across the district. Uh, I think the approach to, um, you know, how we implement and how we give feedback is, is definitely a, a little bit varied and not consistent across the board. But we could certainly uh, pro- provide further information uh, at another meeting on teacher evaluation, if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I have two questions. Um, one, um, I know is in the earlier set of slides, um, we talked about the seal of biliteracy, and I know that we've had that in the district for a while. What do, what kind of data do we have about both? how many students have actually earned it. And then as they have graduated high school and gone on, what has, how have they utilized it as we are, you know, working to increase others desire to take this work on? Yeah, we're um, on on every, any given year, it's somewhere between 130 to 150 students who are graduating with a seal of biliteracy. I may be a little off on my numbers, but that's Showing the sort of range that we're talking about. And uh, I want to thank Julie Calderon, who leads our world language team in collaboration with the Office of English Learners, uh, particularly Farah Azaraj has made this a real important part of her priority. Um, but I don't know that we've had the investments um, until Superintendent Casilius um, has really sort of made clear on what the 
um, quality guarantees need to be. And so I think we're starting to now, to an earlier question from Ms. LaPera, really thinking through what's the strategic plan for the Office of English Learners. And we understand that heritage language programs, world language programs are things that we need to invest in in the early years so that our students are ramped up for opportunities um, to uh, graduate with the seal of biliteracy. So I think the conditions are being put in place to really significantly increase those numbers, but we're not there yet in infrastructure to really realize the numbers that we should be having across the Boston Public Schools. And right now, is it only offered in Spanish or is it offered in other languages as well? Oh, uh, no, multiple languages. I can get the, the breakdown okay. of specific languages. I don't know all of that. Um, there's an assessment you have to go through to demonstrate proficiency in multiple languages, um, but we'd be happy to sort of update um, um, the, the committee in, uh, in a forthcoming presentation on this matter. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. The, the other is more of a philosophical one. It's, you know, we're hearing it as the PA Shaw is trying to increase its size and other schools are going through that. Do we have a vision about what our slate of our group of high school campuses will look like? So for a city of Boston, how many full service high school campuses do we need um, in terms of serving, I don't know, 25 to 30,000 students between grade seven to 12? How many distinct campuses you know, what about schools? We have some, we have a, a, a number of very small high school programs that are freestanding individual schools now. Mm. You know, is there a vision of their coming together in sort of a university model where you've got multiple small programs, you know, under one comprehensive place so that you have a great library and gym and all of those things and not, trying to you know support boutique high schools as well so what is that sort of bigger vision of what high school learning or grade 7 to 12 learning in the city of boston should be evolving to in this oh, next phases that's a really great question uh, ms robinson and you know the vision is that you know students would have a home based school that they go to mm -hmm. that we would have enough anchor high schools in each neighborhood that are high quality that parents could choose that we would then have a portfolio of options of other high schools that are career focused such as the emk or the bga or um, the madison park vocational school and then we have a series of day schools for particular populations who need specialized um, services um, that we would provide like at the Horace Mann School or the Henderson K-12 or the McKinley School. Um, and then you have another bucket of schools that are alternative schools that provide uh, students um, a different type of experience um, through the alternative education because not everybody fits in a box. Um, and so we have to have multiple ways for students to be able to experience uh, high school. Then, like I said earlier, having a common course catalog allows us to then begin to think more creatively as we think about reimagining high school in the future around online courses and distance work um, and the way we use time for students. So, you know, having schools open, um, you know, from like 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. and being able to have p.m. classes for students who might need that type of question. Um, uh, classes and uh, because of their work schedule or other uh, commitments. And then because our students have the MBTA pass, also being able to take a class at your home base school, which might be Brighton High School, and go right across the street and take an environmental class at BGA. Or you might be able to take a Latin class at Boston Latin, and you're not an exam school student but you might be able to take a course there um, online, distance course. Um, so it's a way to think about more opportunity of anytime, anywhere learning. But right now we're trying to just establish the rigor, establish the foundation, get our, our schools all in, um, you know, on a, a similar graduation pathway and have a, a portrait of the graduate, get a common course catalog across all schools, and then we'll start working with um, piloting more of the 
you know, scholar program where students can go from school to school and course to course, either online or um, physically. And then that would also extend to higher education as well. Um, so we could partner with our community colleges and students could take half a day at RCC and go back to Madison Park and take their vocational um, apprenticeship uh, courses. So, you know, that's kind of the vision moving forward is trying to create something that works for all of our students um, and fits their schedules and their lifestyles and their interests. Thank you. Are and there you know, all of our students are one to one now. Yeah. So there's no reason we can't leverage the technology. Sure. Um, and all of our teachers have the streaming um, capabilities. So they all have the cameras uh, in their classrooms to be able to stream okay. courses or to do flipped classrooms and offer courses online. And so we just need to get that infrastructure built. That's and that's kind of in the reimagining. Wonderful. Thank you. For the next phase. OK. Thank you. Are there any final questions? If not, I, I, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank Dr. Eggleston and your team and school leader Silva and school leader Bott and everyone for this amazing work. I mean, I know we're just at the beginning and um, we look forward to continued updates and more conversations as this work continues to develop, thank you. Um, so we are up to move on to public comment on reports. Ms. Sullivan. Thank you, Chair. We have no speakers or public comment on reports. All right, thank you. Is there any new business? All right, that concludes our business for this evening. The next remote School committee meeting will take place next Wednesday, February 2nd at 5 p.m., at which time the superintendent will present her preliminary fiscal year 23 budget recommendation. If there's nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion or objection to the motion? Ms. Sullivan, will you please call the roll? Dr. Alkins? Yes. Mr. Cardet Hernandez? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Yes. Ms. Blanco Garcia? Yes. Mr. Tran? Mr. O'Neill? Yes, good night, everybody. Ms. Robinson? Yes, thank you and good night. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Buenas noches. Thank you. Thank you.